And much more importantly, welcome to Comstock.com. Uh, and then 150 years in the big day. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Kendra Albert. I'm one of the co-organizers of this conference. I'm also the director of the Initiative for Representative First Amendment, IFRA, as we call it for short. Don't pay attention to the letters. Um, is an organization based at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society and the Cyber Law Clinic at Harvard Law School. Um, we imagine, we at IFRA imagine a future where First Amendment law centers the experiences of the most marginalized and everyone speaks more freely. Comstockcon is IFRA's final event <laughs> before our sunset in June. It's an opportunity for us to put everything we've learned over our past four years in practice. And as to how that event came to be focused on Anthony Comstock in particular, I'll let Melissa tell you about that. Thank you, Kendra. Um, hi, everyone. Oh, my God. It, it's strange to have the thing that's just been living in your head happen in front of you. So thank you all for giving us that experience before we barely started. Um, I'm Melissa Drew Grant. I'm a journalist and author, another of the co-organizers of Comstock.com. We have had the strange fortune of planning this conference about the threat of the Comstock Act, which basically everyone had forgotten about, at the exact same time as the Comstock Act has been getting much more political attention than it has in many many decades. It's been a surreal experience, for sure. Uh, over the last almost two years that Kendra and I have been talking about Comstock with each other, we've watched as Comstock, the man and the law, moved out of relative obscurity onto the front pages of the New York Times. And one of Trump's lawyers, an anti-abortion legal troll named Jonathan Mitchell, he got a quote on the front page of the paper saying he hoped that Trump did not talk about the Comstock Act because if people were talking about the Comstock Act, that might ruin their plans to enforce it. It is way too late for that. Then, a little over a month ago, at the Supreme Court, two of the justices seemed to be arguing that the Comstock Act could still be enforced to this day. It is truly disorienting to watch people say this man's name, and not only that, but to say it in the context of who might be the next president, or the no longer so secret plan of the anti-abortion movement that's now out in the open. Here we are. But long before this recent Comstock revival, long before we thought of this conference, we have shared this unnerving feeling that we personally are haunted by Anthony Comstock. <laughs> Some of you might remember in 2018 when sex workers sounded the alarm about a new law that would censor them online. And not only their ads, but also their shared online community spaces. A law meant to extend anti-sex work policing to the internet by pressuring platforms to erase sex workers from them or face possible legal action themselves. That law was known as FOSTA or SESTA. Comstock was there lurking behind FOSTA more than a century after his own death. FOSTA served as a revision of an earlier internet law from the 1990s. And that law happens to have extended the Comstock Act to the internet. Most people have forgotten about it. But all the ways that Comstock, the Comstock Act made it a crime to use the mail for speech and services around abortion, in the 90s, that was extended to the internet. Now it would be a crime to do all those things online. Obviously, this freaked me out <laughs> when I learned about it in 2018. How many abortion funds are raising funds online? We're constantly talking about how to access services. Why are we all in jail? Good question. I asked some digital rights experts about it uh, in 2018. I wanted to know if that could actually be enforced. And I was reassured by them, or they tried to reassure me, don't worry about it because we have Roe. <laughs> I think this was supposed to make me feel better. <laughs> like, the people I spoke to just assumed that Roe was safe. Contrary to basically everyone I know in reproductive justice who knew that Roe's days in 2018 were numbered, and they knew that Roe was not enough in the first place. So since then, since FOSTA, Comstock has just continued to haunt us, lurking around us, 
It's fitting, maybe, given his utter contempt for women who worked as prostitutes before any of us in this room were even born. But just as our prostitute ancestors found ways to survive and thrive and care for one another despite surveillance, vigilantism, and policing, so did sex workers in the early 21st century faced with FOSTA. They found ways to maintain community while navigating criminalization, to share health and harm reduction resources, to raise and to give emergency funds through mutual aid. And what sex workers were doing, what criminalization forced sex workers to do, was about to become the norm for many other communities, for abortion, for gender affirming health care. It's not a coincidence that the policing of sex work abortion and gender affirming health care come at the same time as speech about our own lives is being recast as obscene. The funny thing is that at the same time, from a legal perspective, obscenity is kind of seen as a dead doctrine, something that law students spend one day on in their first amendment class and they never think about again. And that, that combination of all of those things Melissa talked about, that's what brings us to this intervention, to comps.com, which was driven by the desire to connect those who are doing First Amendment work with those who are doing on-the-ground movement works for, work for bodily autonomy. And for both groups, for all the groups that work on these issues, to be in conversation with the histories of these connected fights. Understanding the history, what has happened, and the reality of the present, what is already happening, is not academic, it's not a luxury. It helps those of us who are newer to the work, and I count myself among them, avoid, to avoid wasting time reinventing the wheel. It also prevents newcomers from erasing, perhaps even columbusing, the contributions and expertise that Melissa discussed. As, they have, as sex workers have taught us, the criminalization of abortion is not novel or exceptional. What's remarkable is every, how every day it is. And in the two years since Dobbs, we've seen how much the system for the criminalization of bodily autonomy didn't need to be built fresh. It was there the whole time, and it is just merely being reactivated or expanded. Looking backwards also teaches us something about strategy. In order for our advocacy and our thinking to meet this moment, we must resist the urge to fit our movements within a charmed circle of what can be easiest to argue legally. We cannot trade away the bodily autonomy of some for the false promise of protection for others. That means our work is guided by a broad vision of reproductive justice, where we take into account the reality that this is not just about abortion access, but about the right to decide if, when, and how to create family. That means this space, the space we have opened and we are so grateful to have you all in today and co-create with you is unapologetically pro-abortion, pro-trans lives, pro-sex worker, and pro-bodily autonomy. And that's perhaps why Anthony Comstock has felt like a constant presence. Right, we've all already been in this together the counter to this haunted feeling is solidarity. And we know that those eager, rising, modern-day Comstocks, the Jonathan Mitchells of the world and others, they are in this fight for the long term. We know that they regard so many of us as obscene for who we are, how we are, and how we want to be. And we know that they see their reliance on policing and punishment as a necessary and virtuous act. If those people, those mini day, mini modern day Comstocks, if they see the suppression of all of us as one fight, then that should be a point of solidarity for us. Speaking of solidarity, as we convene an event around bodily autonomy and free speech, there's you know, maybe an elephant in the room or elsewhere on campus. We have to acknowledge that what is going on on Harvard's campus and across the campuses of universities around the world. Students, <laughs> students and their allies have put their bodies and their futures on the line to protest the murder of civilians in Gaza by the Israeli army. Lest these fights seem unrelated, and I suspect to most folks in the room they won't, I remind you that the movement for reproductive justice goes beyond abortion. I said that already. 
There is no reproductive justice in a place where children are killed by bombs, where parents have to watch their children starve or have limbs amputated, where C-sections take place without anesthesia, if they can take place at all. Even before October 7th, almost 100,000 women in Palestine lacked access to sexual and reproductive health services. The problem has gotten worse, unsurprisingly. As Rimsha Sayyid explained in her article, we won't have true reproductive justice until Palestine is free. The only local affiliate of the International Planned Parenthood Federation closed back in the fall after, in, in Gaza after it was hit by an Israeli airstrike. We owe a debt to the Harvard Out of Occupied Palestine Coalition, um, whose continued activism pushes our institutional host to live up to the values it claims to impart. So there's a QR code on screen. Um, and if you're financially able, we would ask that you make a donation to the Operation Olive Branches Perinatal Project, which provides direct on-the-ground support to connect folks in Gaza to essential perinatal care, and feels appropriate given the context of our, our conference. Um, thank you to them and their work, and thank you to all, all of y'all for considering donating. I'll turn it back over to Melissa for some housekeeping. Thanks for that. We'll leave that up for a moment. Uh, before we jump in, just some housekeeping notes. Uh, we'd like to just thank everyone right away for so generously and respectfully participating in our COVID community care guidance. It's very rare, I think most people in this room know that, to have this level of care around COVID. It's enabling many of us, many of our speakers, myself, to be in this space. So thank you for your work and um, joining us in that work. As such, please keep your name tags on throughout the day. That's how we know that you have had a negative COVID result. We'll also be having numerous, excuse me, have numerous breaks throughout the day. Um, so if you need to step out at any time, please feel free. The patio is gonna be open all day. And there's also a break room available that's on the other side of the back wall. There's a door to it out in the hallway. And those will just be quiet spaces if you need to take a moment. Um, we're hoping that uh, everyone's gotten the chance to put stickers on their badges indicating how they feel about photography. So the guidelines are, if someone has a red sticker on their badge, ask before, I'm sorry, if they have a red sticker on their badge, forgive me, do not report, do not post photos of that person. Um, just ignore that. If you have a yellow sticker, you are saying you'd like to be asked first, uh, before being photographed and having anything recorded and posted. Green, we've all given our permission. Photograph, post away. Um, speaking of posting, uh, oh, I'm sorry. There are also some members of the press here today, including myself, though I'm not reporting on this, um, and they've been asked to follow these same guidelines. No photographs, folks with red stickers, ask first with yellow. And given the state of social media, we have not chosen a hashtag or a particular platform to post live updates from the conference, but we do encourage you to share reactions, mind-blowing moments, and any of your own Comstock doodles, you may have put some on your bench, um, on your platform of choice. We are so, so honored that y'all joined us to our, our spectacular speakers. I was saying we kind of just like had everyone say yes, which we did not anticipate. Um, our amazing attendees, I think, who encompass the breadth of like the sort of folks we need in the room to, to be in these conversations, and our appreciated audience on the live stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. And with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa for our first session. All right, we begin. Um, I would like to welcome to the stage, Renee Bracy Sherman. productive justice activist, abortion storyteller, and writer. She's the founder and executive director of We Testify, an organization dedicated to the leadership and representation of people who have abortions and share their stories at the intersection of race, class, and gender identity. She's also an executive producer of Ours to Tell, an award-winning documentary elevating the voices of people who've had abortions. She's the co-host of The A-Finals, A Secret History of Abortion, a podcast from the media and the co-author of the forthcoming book, which I'm so excited about, Liberating Abortion, Our Legacy Stories, and Vision for How We Save Us, coming from Herbert Collins later this year. Renee Racy Sherman. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here. We have a really, really exciting 
day planned for you. Um, but first, I have the honor that I am extremely thrilled about. Um, we made a lot of calls, we made a lot of, did a lot of outreach, and we were able to bring a celebrity here to talk about their work with Comstock. And I am just so, so thrilled because I think you will learn so much about how they see this Comstock legacy and how they really bring it to life. So, from beyond the grave, please welcome Mr. Anthony Comstock. <laughs> Sexual men love that song. <laughs> wow, wow, what an honor to be here at a conference being held in my honor, obviously, with all of my rabid supporters out here, although I have to admit I'm slightly perturbed at the sheer amount of unchaperoned ladies I see here with exposed ankles, but I will ignore it for now. <clears throat> Renee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Comstock, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for being here with us today. We are all deeply aware of your work and at the peak of your career, you had an act in your name, 18, 1873, the Comstock Act, which banned the mailing and receiving of obscene matter and any articles used to produce abortions. But let's take it back to your early years. So when you were 10 years old, you lost your mother. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh. Trying to make me cry already, Renee. <laughs> you are good. They told me you were good, and she is good. <laughs> uh, when I was 10, I, uh, I lost my mother. She, she died doing what she loved, painfully giving birth. <laughs> wow. Um, so from that experience, what did you glean? Because I think most people would think that, you know, pregnancy is dangerous and that we should make sure people are able to do it safely. Is that what you learned from that? No. No, I did not. Uh, smaller, weaker, more weaker-minded men probably would have looked at that and said, oh, uh, maybe nine children would have been okay, but not me, Renee. I had that experience and I said, we should probably force every single person to live just like my mother, which is to exist and die solely for the purpose of churning out more Christian soldiers. All right. Um, so speaking of soldiers, you um, served with the Union Army during the Civil War. Can you tell us um, what you learned from that time? What stuck out for you? Oh, of course. Of course, thank you for the question. I do appreciate it. What stuck out for me from that time, of course, was the horror of that war, which, as we all know, is, of course, the disgusting practice of circulating pornography. It was, it was disgusting in the barracks, men passing these uh, materials back and forth freely, or, uh, filthy cartoons, pamphlets full of raunchy tales of prostitution, daguerreotypes of women in bathing gowns, uh, men indulging in drinks and games of chess. Renee, the debauchery of that time is a stain upon this nation that I shall never forget. That's it. Uh, the, the, the Civil War, mm -hmm. one of our nation's bloodiest wars yes. over slavery, mm -hmm. the shackling of enslavement of black people, that that was the worst thing that you learned about from that war. Or oh, the bugs were bad too. Did I tell you I was stationed in Florida, the epicenter of the fighting? Those bugs, they, they itch. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of that. That was horrific. All right. Well, let's move on. So after you came back from the war, you had worked at a grocery store and you wanted to be a grocer. Mm. Why was that not your path of choice? Oh, you have done your research, Renee. Good job. Um, can you believe, everyone, that I was this close to just becoming a humble grocer? Can you imagine? All this being avoided. Whoop, gives me shivers. No, um, <laughs> God had a higher calling for me. We can all think that one family friend I ran into who suggested I go to New York. Big round of applause for that guy. Um, no, I mean, Renee, can you imagine me just ringing people up at Piggly Wiggly? Just getting dusty cans of peaches in obscurity. No, no, no. I was meant to bust down smut shop doors 
and take no prisoners in the war for purity. Huzzah! Huzzah, indeed. So, this said you on a collision course with a lot of people, and quite literally, when you were arresting someone, you were hit with a, somebody got you with a pocket uh, yes. knife, and you had a scar in your face, and they called you Scarface Tony. Oh, uh, yes, yes, they How do you feel about that? I wear that name with a badge of honor, Renee. Uh, you know, God didn't put me on this earth with these thick mutton chops not to get in the center of the fight. So, yes, please. But you also famously fought with the Woodhull sisters, and they said, they called you an illiterate puppy. <laughs> Do you, what's your response to that? Well, that hurt my feelings. <laughs> For sure, that hurt my feelings. Uh, let me tell you something, the Woodhull sisters were bullies. Okay, they were minions for Satan, spreading free love. Are you illiterate? I mean, that doesn't even make sense. First of all, just because I ban books doesn't mean I can't read them. <laughs> and the puppy part, what, is, what are they talking about? I, are they referring that, I, that I'm excited about purity? <laughs> if that makes me a puppy, then so be it. I'm a puppy. Hey, don't tell Christy no. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We're great friends. We're great friends. Hi, Christy, if you're watching. I'll call you later. Well, you both actually have shot a dog, so you do also have that in common. We have a lot. Yes. But I've also read um, from your diaries that you were an atrocious speller. Is that correct? You tried spelling, let's hear yes. Okay, well, <laughs> speaking of your diaries, um, let's talk about your masturbation. You wrote a lot about um, feeling urges and you struggled with this temptation. Do you think that your life path was driven by self-hatred and, and shame that you experienced growing up from a religion that taught you that sex and masturbation was unnatural and wrong. Renee, your womb must have wandered to your brain because you're talking crazy, okay? I, I, are you referring to my diaries when I say I debase myself, I deplore my weak sinful nature? Okay, sure, sure, I'll, I'll talk about it. Just, I, I will admit that just because, I, I've been tempted by Satan. Yes, we all have. Maybe, maybe once, twice, or thrice, sure, but I don't think that means it was a full-blown preoccupation of an obsession from which I didn't have a moment's peace, Renee! <laughs> okay, so let's move on to your work. You are most known for revolutionizing post office into an agency that crusades against sex, abortion, other vices, right? You and your buddies at the YMCA use the post office to confiscate abortion pills, sex toys, pornographic magazines, all because you felt that they went against your views of the United States being a Christian nation. And in fact, you arrested a lot of immigrants and a, and a high number of Jews because you felt like they were violating your laws. You seem to hate sex and pleasure. And so my, my big question is, why? Why MCA not? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but uh, this is serious. Sex for pleasure threatens the very foundation of this Christian nation. Sex for pleasure erodes the sanctity of marriage. Sex for pleasure disintegrates the moral fabric of our society. The amount of times that you have sex should exactly equal the number of children that you have. Sex should be a very awkward, stilted, short interaction, and you can quote me on that. <laughs> oh, we definitely have. So your work is a hot topic again these days, and I'm wondering, what do you think about those who are carrying your legacy forward, and in particular, who do you think is carrying your legacy forward the most? Thank you for the question. I will um, raise up my brave brethren at the Heritage Foundation and their um, incredible Project 2025 that is trying to lift my law back to its former prom prominence. So hello, uh, if you're watching. And um, I also want to give properties to my protege, Louis DeJoy, postmaster general and another righteous bald man. Uh, he knows what he's doing because he's doing a good job if he's making you all demiserable. Thank you. And Leslie, I, I see that you brought your purity bag, your purity yes. pouch, as you call it. A sack of obscenities. Yes, I carry it with me everywhere. Anything I see that's obscene, I put it in the bag. Okay, well, I, I have a few things oh. I'd, I'd like to go through. Sure, I'm happy to tell you if it's obscene see or not. See what you think here. So oh, God. Renee, uh, what is that? Grabber. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Renee, Renee is obviously, oh, oh. obviously promotes promiscuity okay. somehow with the, it's going in the bag. I've got some, <laughs> some pomegranate oh, juice. Oh, this is disgusting, Renee. This, this could corrupt the, the most youthful white boy's mind. I don't know how, but it, it could, it could. And that's what our law is based on. Hey, we've got a steamer. Dear God, you pervert, what is this? <laughs> Oh my God! This I, I don't I don't know exactly how, but this undermines the sanctity of marriage. Just a, a, again, a toy. Nothing sexual about this. It should be fine. Yes. Nay, I'm going to throw you in jail. I know what this can do. It can go into very small places. Uh, here, a little. Uh, just a little whip. Oh, well, that looks actually kind of fun. Maybe, um, what do you do? It's like a little wig situation? No. no I'm going to no. actually bring this up to Margaret, but my wife. Margaret, coming home soon. And then I, I have a, a dildo here. <laughs> what? Yes. Renee, is this a joke? No, but I, I have so many of these. I know. What the, what the hell is this? What is this? Is this the, is this about coming me out of my order or what? Or am I being pranked? Renee, am I sorry? Mr. Oh my god, I'm getting out of here. You know what? Please you're, all, you're all harlots. I see all of your ankles, and I will promptly be throwing you into a cell right after this panel or whatever you call it. I see, I'm going to talk to your husbands outside. Good day. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Comstock. <laughs> Mr. Anthony Comstock, everyone. Five <laughs> great because we're here with all of you and we're gonna figure out how to make sure he never comes back. Thank you. Thank you. Today. Um, no thank you to that man. Uh, we have somebody else, an incredibly distinguished guest joining us on stage. Uh, literally wrote the book on Comstock, Amy Warbel. Amy Warbel is a professor of the history of art at the State University of New York Fashion Institute of Technology. And for the past 20 years, her research has concentrated on censorship and the intersections of law and culture, and particularly in relation to freedom of artistic and sexual expression. I'm very glad you were not on stage with that man. Her most recent book is Lust on Trial, Censorship and the Rise of American Obscenity in the Age of Anthony Comstock from Columbia University Press. Professor Warble has lectured nationally and internationally on the damaging impact of censorship, not only on artistic expression, but also on pluralism and democracy, more generally, including two appointments as a Fulbright Scholar to China and to the United Kingdom. Please welcome Amy Werbel. Thank you so much, Melissa and Renee and Tony, Scarface Tony. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. With all of you free lusters, you can see it. I covered my ankles, so I feel safe. Um, yeah, that's, it's wild to follow that. Okay, yeah. let's just take a second. <laughs> you know, I think maybe one place to start appropriately is that even in his lifetime, Comstock was considered kind of a joke to some people. Uh, so it's fitting that he could join us and that we could all share in that together. Um, it's also just personally truly fitting for me that my first brush with him was here in the same town where I made my first purchase in violation of the Comstock Act of the 1990s. So thank you for letting me come back here and talk about this. Um, Amy, I wonder if you could take us back a bit and give us a picture of the, the world that Comstock emerged from, the ideology, the theology. What, what shaped the man that was just here? I think it's really important to think in concrete ways about what Christian nationalism means at its most extreme. And that is the world Anthony Comstock comes from. When I was researching New Canaan, Connecticut, and Connecticut in general, if you wanted to make a town, you didn't apply to the state, you applied to form a new parish. And then the parish would become the municipality. And the parish paid a tithing man who would make everyone pay their you know, tithe to the church. And these were um, people who left here to go there because this place got too worldly. And they really wanted to live this life of sort of extreme orthodox um, adherence to a brand of evangelical Christianity within the Congregational Church at that time that believed that God was a very angry uh, figure there was no possibility of redemption 
You sinned once, you would literally burn in hell. Um, and so the role of government in that theocratic system is to police the world. Um, and so it's, a, it's an odd fit with what we think of as a United States that's already you know, formed a separate nation, but it's very Anglo, right? Because church and state being one is the system American law and government comes out of. So he brings that brand of Christian, of Connecticut Christian nationalism forward and he's helped by other sons of Connecticut all the way through. When you look at the really big players in supporting his work, they're pretty much all from Connecticut, all from this kind of very orthodox, evangelical, theocratic background. Renee, I'm wondering if you could let us know, based on this, you know, do you see elements of that worldview in Comstock's followers today? You know, are these modern day Comstock's pushing that same pretty bleak worldview? Do I? <laughs> kind of been up here interviewing Mike Pence. I mean, yeah, there's always going to be people who, I, I think, a mix, of, they, they seek out power and they seek out domination of anyone who is enjoying existing in their body. And I think there's a piece of it that stems from repression um, and racism and white supremacy and all of those things themselves, but also they just only feel happiness, or I don't want to say happiness, they, they only feel comfortable when they're dominating and, and ruining other people's joys and freedoms. And they do it both individually and structurally. Um, I mean, Comstock, with his arrest, I mean, he led Madame Estelle to, to die by suicide. Like, he was vicious in the way that he behaved. And I think there's both this piece in which he was a joke at the time, um, and you know, people may not have, like, didn't take him seriously, but his behaviors and his actions had real consequences on real people's lives. I mean, when we were looking, I was trying to, last minute, we, we were emailing because, you know, in, in writing my book, I was trying to look a bit more on Comstock and find out his views on like his racist views, and I think what's interesting is there hasn't there wasn't a whole lot of writing of it really much, but a that's a piece of it, right? Because he just ignored people of color because he just did not he just they're too far gone because he has these really racist beliefs about black and brown people existing and their sexuality and what they exist for. But then you know you were explaining that he had high rates of arresting immigrants and Jewish people. And so this persecution of, of people based on religion or where they come from, we see that today. All of this, it's the exact same thing. It's just different new, new different people at the top. Um, and I, I think in order for us to move anywhere and to undo it, we actually have to have a real conversation about the role that xenophobia and anti-blackness and um, just whorephobia and, and, I don't know, abortion phobia? I don't know, I'm gonna coin it and say it's a word. Um, how all of that shows up in that their, their obsession with controlling other people's joy and freedom then becomes this larger structural issue in which the people who get policed the most are people of color. And, and I mean police like literally thrown in jail, because that's what he was doing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm deeply concerned, we were reading this morning, you know, Louisiana is looking to, um, is deciding that they want to make abortion pills, you know, controlled substance. And it's interesting, because the Washington Post posted about it on their Instagram, and they were like, well, then they say that people who, you know, are using it themselves wouldn't be, you know, charged. But we know that's not true. People are already being charged for the outcomes of their pregnancies, right? Because the reason that policing exists in general is to control behaviors. And so what he and what Comstock did was figure out, okay, how do we make not only the literal police be able to do that, but all institutions, such something as simple as the post office, be an opportunity in which 
we can stop communication about who we are, healthcare that we need, and, and with one another. Yeah, it's, it's striking re reading your book and sort of like putting that through the ringer of the news of the day and the things that I report on. Like, I kind of feel like Anthony Comstock may have invented the reverse prostitution sting, or if not, per kind of perfected it. Like, one of the things I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that he didn't necessarily get a lot of prosecutions, but he was very effective at policing people, scaring people, having their items seized, making them pariahs, as if that was the punishment itself, as if that was the desired outcome too. Well, there's a real rise and fall narrative, right? And the subtitle of my book is Censorship and the Rise of American Insanity in the Age of Anthony Comstock. Um, that takes a while. That takes decades to kind of unfold where the resistance becomes stronger than his enforcement capabilities. Right at the beginning, uh, there's so much to unpack in what you were talking about. The first thing that came to my mind is just understanding misogyny that's baked into his understanding of humanity on the basis of this very strict reading of uh, Genesis. You know, Eve screws up, right, for all you know, all humanity, right? The kicking out of the Garden of Eden, they recognize their bodily shame. All of that is blamed on a woman. She's condemned to the pain of childbirth, and, uh, and she's weak, right? Women are weak. And that's opportunistic. And when you think about all these things of uh, these hierarchies, right? Uh, I really thought, um, I mean, there's a whole cottage industry of people who psychoanalyze, have psychoanalyze come talk, and I was like, I don't need to get into that. You can just stick to the primary sources, right? Even if you take him at his word that he really believes this stuff, it doesn't diminish the harm. But it is politically opportunistic, and the people that help him rise are gaining political and economic power because of this stuff they may or may not believe, right? But it, just as today, it helps them raise money, it helps them get elected, um, and they're using these kinds of social and cultural wedge issues amongst the people who can vote, who are largely white men. I mean, women don't get half the vote through all of Comstock's life. So his suppression of women is a feature, not a bug, um, of his rise to power. I would say as far as the lampooning goes, absolutely, the people who got thrown in jail, the gay men who did you know, time hard labor, breaking up rocks with pickaxes, they, he was not a joke. And he was not a joke if he was ruining your publishing business by seizing and burning your books, your newspapers. The people who start to lampoon him are the people who control the press, for whom his suppression early on of advertisements for things like gay print photographs from life, marital, you know, oh, you're getting married, order our catalog of uh, you know, things for married people, which would include many kinds of rubbers, early versions of diaphragms, sex toys, uh, tickler, you have sort of the, the tickler thing here. Um, those people start to lampoon him because it's a way of pushing back against him kind of messing with their business model. Um, but the people who really suffer are the people who are powerless already. Um, and I think that's, that's true today as well. So I think it's impossible ever to separate censorship and power hierarchies. Um, but Comstock gives us this um, glimpse of where this starts in American law, really, as he gets started, no one's talking about the first amendment. It's just not discussed. It's not discussed directly, even when defense attorneys are pushing back and saying all these things, like I believe, we believe this violates the liberties of the citizen. They use that language, but all through the course of Comstock's uh, career, the, the rise, along with him, are defense attorneys who need to come to court and figure out how to represent the clients. And so I feel as though both all the things that you're discussing and the resistance, all the things that you're discussing, kind of develop together during the course of his career. So tying that back into to your remarks, Renee, you know, what, or, and also earlier, you know, what Comstock came after the Woodhall Sisters for was their newspaper, right? Which at the time, to have this two woman led newspaper, I mean, it was funded, I think, by a man in the shadows, right? Neil Vanderbilt. Yes. <laughs> No big deal. Uh, yeah, 
and it, that was their sin, that they had this space to speak out. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about sort of a chilling effect that it feels like we're already living under to a degree, not knowing how this law might be revived. We were talking about the books that we're working on. We have no idea if the things that we're writing about are going to be crimes by the time our books are published. So what is, how do you feel that chilling effect, if you do? Um, and how do we push back? Yeah, I mean, it is weird writing a book and then being like, I don't know, is this shit must be banned? Like, <laughs> all this work for, okay. Um, but also at the end of the day, like, at the end of the day, the day's got to end. Um, but I think you have to just keep pushing on. What, like, what, what, what do we do, just like give up? Like, you know, yes, there will always be another construct. There is one now, right? Um, we can continue to test the boundaries for those of us who feel like that is something that we can continue to do. And I think um, it's not going to stop us from talking about it. It's not going to stop us from sending pills. It's not going to stop us from showing up. I think that is our role, is to continue to, this is the white ladies like to say, hashtag resist. Um, but I think at some point, we have to continue to keep pushing because, you know, I, I think there's a piece in which we worry about the right um, using calm stuff. What, and, and I'm deep, I want to be clear, I'm deeply worried about that. What I'm also worried about is um, the moderates and Democrats not actually standing up for us when we do it and actually letting us be the dominoes that fall or the sacrificial lambs um, because, well, what you did, I mean, you did commit a crime. What you did do was a crime. And can you at least just plead it out? It's only a couple of years in jail. It's, I mean, it's not that bad. We'll fix it later. We'll get it expunged later. I don't think they understand what they're asking of, of people and what they're also giving up when they don't fight. And so um, I think, you know, that that white moderate that just, they appease and appease and appease. That is how we got to this point where we're even having a conversation about Comstock coming back because they didn't do anything about it. And even now, they still don't want to talk about it. And who else doesn't want to talk about it? Conservatives. So actually, we need to talk about it. We need to deal with it. We need to actually deal with it this time because if we don't and we continue not to talk about it, we're going to get lost. And those of us who are on the far left, you know, we will continue to do our work and, and, and fight and dole out pills, dole out sex toys, dole out condoms, all the things, right? But I'm, I am deeply concerned that um, we will get eaten up um, as sort of a casualty as we, you know, continue to grow. I also wonder, like, I'm deeply concerned about what does this mean? What, what is an obscenity? I mean, it's like, it's literally anything. I mean, you know, at one point, like, just, just making fun of Comstock become a, a, a problem. Um, you know, I, there's so much in there that I think it's, it's such, it's so, such a big, the point of that term is to be broad and open, and it is to attack all of us. And I, when I've talked to reporters about it, I have to explain to them that, um, you know, they, they'll focus on this being about abortion, but it's not just about abortion. It's literally anything related to sex and reproduction, anything, and maybe even beyond that, um, because it, it could be determined that way. Um, I think lastly, I would say I really hope that um, folks, I know there are some reporters here and folks who are reporting on this, um, really take seriously the, the criminalization risk should Comstock um, come back, or even now, um, understanding that you know when you're working with sources, or you want to report people's abortion stories, particularly people who um, are self-managing their abortions or traveling for their abortions, um, and the risk that it can bring to them. Because I think you had asked me earlier about sort of you know who's these modern-day Comstocks. I think Jonathan Mitchell is one. Because you know, you're saying Comstock didn't get a lot of prosecutions. I think Jonathan Mitchell is just using the law to create fear and go after people. And when report, there have been a number of articles where reporters are reporting those stories against the wishes of the survivors, to be clear. 
And so I think, you know, for folks to understand that, um, you know, your scoop is something that someone else has to live with and their potential criminalization and a reach of their abuser. So understanding that don't be a handmaiden to Comstock or to Jonathan Mitchell in your reporting. Your job is to report truth to power, not to extend the reach of this harm. And it is very, very serious in this moment of criminalization and what's happening. No, it's, it's really, it's intense to sort of sit with that. And I, you know, from reporting on these cases too, like these legal documents that Jonathan Mitchell and other lawyers like him are generating, they're like catnip, right? That we're taught as journalists, like, oh, it's a legal document, you can cite it, you can say, like, well, according to this document, most people reading that aren't gonna know. But that doesn't mean it happened, right? They're able to get things into the record that haven't been tested, the facts haven't been questioned, and oftentimes the people that these cases are being brought to punish, who might not even necessarily be the defendant, um, they don't have the same ability to use the courts to respond, and the press is their voice in this to the extent that they can do it even indirectly. That tension between the people who are being surveilled and punished and the press, I kind of want to take this back to what you were talking about, Amy, about how Comstock built power, because it sounds like his ultimate undoing was the press, that he sort of built a permission structure through his publicizing what he was doing that made what he was doing more palatable, and then at a certain point that seems like it fell apart. Thank you, that's exactly where I wanted to go with this. I wanted to talk a little bit, and maybe it's a little bit of a pushback, just from the historical experience, that one of the ways it comes up with power is because power in a democracy is an additive sport. Even when the democracy is unbelievably flawed and you know, uh, definitely not one person, one vote, and all that you know, glossy equality, even so, Comstock never grows his face. They just die. You know what I mean? He starts with that Connecticut base. One would hope that could happen again today. <laughs> right, no, but, but, but it is happening. Yeah. When you look at the, the Pew report on religious affiliation, people don't want to be affiliated with this, this view of religion, and especially young people. So the same thing happened at the end of the 19th century, is this vindictive Christ is not appealing to younger people. And the rise of social Christianity, which is the YMCA model, they get rid of this committee as soon as they can. As soon as the New York Society of Special Advice is formed, they're like, we don't want anything to do with this. We're going to build gymnasiums and libraries. They're evangelizing, but they're going the carrots mode. And they end up, of course, growing and proliferating. Uh, whereas this sort of punishment model, this carceral model, uh, he it just loses allies along the time. And I think it is also true that in terms of the uh, understanding of free expression, you're absolutely, I mean, the, the resonance with the historical period is really true, that the people who are going to jail with really no support, people who are selling explicit photographs of sexual acts, uh, sex workers, they don't have any support. They really don't. But there is this turning point in the early 20th century where the Clarence Darrow of the world, and I think there's this critical moment in my book where I talk about how he's representing Ida Craddock, who's writing about phallic sex and sort of tantric sex, and he's representing her. At the same time, he's representing Eugene Debs. And these are in the same years that the ACLU is formed, the AADP is formed, and these disparate factions realize they kind of need each other, and they need each other to grow power both the marginalized and the lawyers, you know, and the publishers, and kind of, uh, and that's when these organizations start to form, and you know, what I write about is that forms the foundation for the expansion of First Amendment rights throughout the 20th century. And what we're seeing a century later is a kind of a testing of that, uh, of those alliances. Um, and it's been very interesting to watch the ACLU, you know, over the last decade or so of what they're willing to defend and not willing to defend. Um, we're really in the thick of it on every possible front in terms of speech and expression. Um, but I think that the then as now, if we're going to stay a democracy, mm -hmm, sit with that, 
Um, One might argue we never were. We are gonna, well, I mean, structurally, there's the ability with, you know, voting with alliances, there's structurally the ability to push back. One thing I, I just wanted to add into this conversation as well, in terms of, we talk about the Comstock Act all the time, and it's really important in terms of a lot of things that, um, the different varieties of punishment that you were raising happen in different places, and then as now, there's this copy and pasting of language around what is obscenity, for example, that goes from this federal Comstock Act to state laws, to municipal laws, to regulations, and so I really like to talk about Comstock laws because there's this proliferation. You see it now in these uh, organizations that are spitting out you know, book bans, right? And the language gets adopted in this state, in this state, in this state, in this school board, and that school board, and the exact same, you know, Moms for Liberty, Heritage Foundation kind of thing. Um, and I think then as now the the enforcement really varied of where Comstock was able to get some traction and where he wasn't. Um, so that, in that sense, I think democracy is local, or politics is local, because it's, it's doing better in some places than others. Um, Last thing, sorry, okay, go ahead. is getting ready. back to the press, getting back to the free press, and getting back to the importance of the press in the age of Comstock, and I agree with you that there's this delicate balance of telling the stories that are salacious, but then having people have access to those stories, and those stories changed culture, and it moved that window of what people were used to reading about, what people wanted to read about, and what people paid to read about, and it's part of the rise of uh, an acceptance of diverse sexualities and writing and art uh, about diverse sexualities, you know, in in the um, in the twentieth century. Yeah, I, think, I think you know. Um, while it may be that Comstock and his allies died off, anti-blackness has never died off, and, and, and anti-indigeneity has never died off in this country. And I think that. Um, one of the things that my co-author Regina Mahone and I um, track in our book is that the way in which anti-blackness has always been that undergirding thing, the anti-immigrant, anti-indigenous um, sentiment that has always upheld anti-abortion um, rhetoric and, and the um, prevalence of the laws, right? Because they're so concerned about um, the white birth rate. And so while religion, you know, Pew may be saying that religion is, is you know, going down, anti-blackness is deeply in fashion. Um, and cultural appropriation and then using it against black people is always in fashion. And when we talk about what's considered obscene, I mean, think about literally black music. You pick any rap video, does that get considered obscene? Because we even have liberals complaining about that. Complaining about the way in which we dance and the way in which what we wear and all of those things. So that's to me feels like the, the a deep larger concern about the way in which what is obscene gets then used to actually just criminalize black life and black people. Um, and there is the like of course the literal you know condoms, abortion pills, things like that. But there are actually dog whistles for there is a certain type of behavior, and those behaviors always overlap with black people, indigenous people, immigrants. Um, it's always the way in which, you know, or the way in which we dance, the way in which we talk. It's always talked about. And so I think, you know, while again, as an individual, Comstock or other people in religiosity, white Christian religiosity, ebbs and flows, anti-blackness always is always kicking it. And they and then and all and on top of that, they'll find black and brown people to then make it palatable to talk about it. I mean Clarence Thomas, Bill Cosby, right? They then find a way to complain about the way in which people behave. And so I, I think for me, talking and what we talk about in our book is like talking about how when this is um, connected to race, um, it's so much deeper. And until we can acknowledge the way and, and address the way in which it's connected to race, we're actually never going to get out of this hamster wheel. 
and that we have to look back on history, look to now, and look forward in thinking about how anti-blackness plays a role. Because um, I think you know you were talking about the misogyny piece earlier. Yes, but it looks different for white women than it does for immigrant women than it does um, for black or brown folks, for trans folks. Like, it just looks different for all of those people because of those layers. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, the, the trope of white womanhood hasn't gone anywhere. No, right? it's, now it's been rebranded to trap wives. Yeah. Like, it's, and, and, you know, Karen, and, and I need to speak to your manager at the Apple store, right? But even now, we do it with abortion stories because we, ele not we, the president is elevating one type of abortion story. Because at the end of the day, what he is saying is that the reason that these cases are such a tragedy is because the government was supposed to work for a married white woman who had some sort of medical indication. That is actually what he's saying. And he's saying, look how bad it is. It didn't work for the one person we said that we would protect. Which you would think then he, we, he would take the lesson that, wow, then maybe it's not working for anyone. <laughs> but instead, he's saying, let's make, put a Band-Aid on it and fix it for this one person. Let's, not act, let's ignore the fact that people have been traveling for their abortions for decades. Let's ignore the fact that he has voted and supported the Hyde Amendment for decades. Let's ignore the fact that he's never met with an abortion storyteller of color because he does not want to have a conversation about race. He does not want to have a conversation about Comstock. Because at the end of the day, he is actually anti-sex. He is actually anti-abortion pills. He does not support those things. He does, like, it is a deeper issue. And do not say that it's because he is Catholic, because I work with a bunch of abortion Catholic storytellers, so no. Why does Ireland have better abortion laws than we do? <laughs> Right on me that Batman. <laughs> it's just it's such a dumb excuse, and I'm sorry, like I, I think that we need to have a conversation about these things are always tied to anti-blackness and to racism. And I ask any black person who has to listen to him during the campaign, he's always making up names for black people that he's talking about. It's right there. So until we can connect the two and the way in which reproduction is is Raced, the racialization of reproduction and who gets to, to reproduce and who we care about, it's never gonna change. Like motherhood is inherently considered for white women. And that is what happens when we only elevate those stories. And I'm, again, I'm concerned as to when we, when we have such a broad term like obs obscenity or obscene, it then just becomes a code for what are those people I don't like doing with their bodies. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, well, the, again, with the, getting back to the, his, you know, I'm a historian, so um, not. And that's why you're here. Yes, we love our hair here. Yep. Um, the evolution of the use of the term obscenity is something I spent a lot of time studying. It comes from English law. And again, it was, um, it was used to describe offenses against the church and the state. So if you said something that was critical of the king, it was obscene libel, right? In the same way that it was, uh, you know, sexual, you know, um, themed literature, for example, because the king or the queen was the head of the church and state. It was the same thing. And when that concept comes into uh, U.S. courtrooms. It always means criminal, and you're exactly right. It gets enforced in a way that just shows you the power structure of the moment. Um, who's, who's on top and who's on bottom and whose culture is deemed to be acceptable or not. One of the things that I was really interested in is um, the Comstock Act is passed and, and this concept of obscenity comes into US courtrooms, which we don't have many transcripts of obscenity trials before the Comstock era. It's here and there because mostly the states adopted English common law and then they adapted it over time. So obscenity sort of lurking in there with a zombie a little bit. Uh, but immediately it becomes something that's debated. What does obscene mean? And com the Comstock Act 
that they have a section called the word in the law where they define it specifically using the terms lewd and lascivious, meaning lustful, which is why my book is Lust on Trial, because it's deemed to be anything that arouses lust. So if you think about that, it's, well, whose lust are you talking about? And I talk about in concepts here, it's like in the brain of the enforcer, right? Um, but right from the beginning, one of the ways that he gets power is just like you had your bag of tricks, right? He does this traveling road show with pornography, with dildos, with various kinds of sex toys, contraceptives. Um, and it's like a club that he's showing it to, uh, I guess, Congress. <laughs> well, yeah, Congress, you know, in the vice president's office. Um, but he does it in people's homes also to raise money. It's like, come and you'll see all this sex stuff. And, and I think of it as like a, a performance of non-arousal. You know, like they're the right kind of people. Right, because you just see these as things and not... They're, right, they're, no they're proving to each other. So that class division, and, the, and so finally in 1879 in the trial of G.M. Bennett, a judge um, imports the Hickman test from English law, which is that obscenity means anything that can deprave and corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences, right? So now you've got the powers really laid out. Like, who decides whose minds are, can be depraved and corrupted by immorality? And I think in that sense, the, the um, white supremacist and Christian nationalist hierarchies have never been separate. You're, you know, and Great, because if you automatically think that black people are, are predisposed to be you just, lewd, lascivious, all right. those things, and it, you're just gonna, then you, again, you just criminalize their entire behavior. Exactly, and also in the, I mean, it, the thing that's, I, one thing I noticed that's usually different now is that Catholics are folded into that anti-immigrant, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're rounded up in large numbers, and, and now it seems, and, and actually you guys would be the ones who would know this more, but that, that, that sort of orthodox Catholicism and orthodox evangelical Protestantism have formed more of a political alliance that didn't exist in the 19th, that in the 19th century. It was very anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish. Um, and you know, by the turn of the 20th century, especially um, in the years leading up to um, anti-immigration laws in the 20s, the New York Society of Suppression of Vice is publishing what percentage of their defendants are Catholics and Jews and for Eastern Europe. And, um, and it is, those are the immigrant groups that are kind of flooding in at that moment, um, kind of on the bottom of the, of the hierarchy. But the, the one thing I, I would add to this uh, is also the economics of it, right? Because who does it serve for these people to be uh, criminalized, for their culture to be criminalized, to be uh, labeled as, Potentially depraved and corrupted. It, it, the, the employers, the people who fund them, your society, the expression of vice, they want cheap labor, right? So, if these depraved and corrupted people aren't going to need access to good education, they're not going to need, um, you know, uh, political power, and they're going to be, you know, the source of wealth for these sort of corporate industrialists like Samuel Colby and Morris Jessup, the people who are the leaders. You know, back Comstock's work, and of course all the politicians who support them. So I think those those economic elements obviously are absolutely you know have always been with um, with the power structure of the United States, and so there's a lot of stuff woven together. You know, it's it's interesting to think of like one of the things I'm doing for my book, not to keep talking about my book that you can't have until Let's 2026. Let's drop our books. But, you know, I've been sort of like laying out these timelines and it's like, okay, so we have like the rise of like the labor movement yeah. and the IWW, like when you mentioned Eugene Debs, it's like, okay, so then we have this sort of collision of labor and law, of this need to defend, you know, we see labor organizers also facing jail over free speech issues. And to think of Comstock also kind of humming along the later years of his life anyway, while that's going on, like it, it gives it a different cast. And also a changing demographic of who then becomes white. Yes. Because at that point, right, Irish and, and Jewish immigrants, like a lot of Eastern Europeans, Italian, were not considered white. But then they become white when it is beneficial to powers that be against black and brown folks, a lot, and, and the push west over indigenous folks. Um, so again, it's, it's really looking at 
Oh, okay, well, you guys are super obscene. Actually, just kidding, you guys are fine. Come on over here. You guys are obscene now. You guys, yeah, because it, it, it constantly moves. And so, again, it's always about how can we, re, how can we construct whiteness um, to be an overarching force to, against blackness, brownness, um, and who are the people that we're against, who are the people that we don't support. And we, and we can see when you have huge anti-abortion backlashes, it is always after um, black liber liberation movements have a lot of power and a lot of gains. Um, and it's also at the same time as um, you have um, white women with lower birth rates. They are deeply concerned about um, black power, high immigration rates. They're, con they're freakishly obsessed with the nation's birth rates, but they don't actually care about black and brown people's birth rates. They care about white people's birth rates. So those things always ebb and flow together. Um, and I think the sooner we, we recognize that and, and actually curb the xenophobia, curb the anti-blackness, curb the obsession with reproduction, pro-natalist views and, and American exceptionalism, then we will actually be able to deal with our anti-abortion problem because I, I think the anti-abortion problem is, a, is, a, is um, just a piece of these larger root causes, and it's the way that it shows up. That's why they're pro-faith, pro-family, and pro-life. What does that mean? They want a Christian nation. They want a nation um, with a heteropatriarchal family, white family, and they will do anything, including stealing black and brown children from indigenous folks and from brown families to be able to do that. Um, you should read Relinquished, Dr. Gretchen Sisson's book on adoption. It's very, very good. Um, but the way in which evangelicals see families, um, their job is to rescue black and brown people, to make families in a certain way. Because again, the right family is a white family. I'm gonna do two things and ask your indulgence for this. So there's two questions I wish I could have asked you both, but I also wanna ask the other panelists this later. So kind of mentally parking lot this, and we'll get back to it. The question of Christian nationalism and white Christian nationalism, and this sort of like slipperiness of like, well, religiosity or religious practice or church attendance or however you measure that, is that going down as this political thing called white Christian nationalism is on the rise? Is that possible to have them sort of break away? From yes, stolen elections. <laughs> and the second, oh my god, uh, the second is um, this, this Perhaps this is something Kendra and I have talked about a lot amongst each other, which is why we're so glad to have you here to be part of this now. Why was Comstock forgotten? Why, why were people working on obscenity and people working on birth control and abortion not talking to each other? And race seems like the, the factor there, like at least a major factor. If people sort of thought that like obscenity is a dead doctrine and we've moved on from that, um, that's puritanical stuff that we don't do anymore, but it lives on in the structures you both were just mapping out of the out group that keeps changing and can be reinterpreted as obscene. Um, I want to get more into that too. So thank you folks for getting us. Thank you for having us. So you may have noticed that I am not, in fact, Mary Ziegler. Um, <laughs> Uh, but if you have heard, if you have friends who tell you about every time they hear about the Comstock Act, which I do, um, they, many times that they tell you about it, they will have heard from Mary. And Mary, unfortunately, had an emergency and couldn't join us today, but we've asked her to prepare some remarks, which I am going to read. Um, so I am standing in for the role of Mary Ziegler because I think so much of the kind of current attention towards the Comstock Act has been in relationship to both her work and her sort of speaking and talking about it publicly. Um, so these are Mary's words. We asked her to tell us about kind of how she came to work on Comstock. Um, I realized the renewed significance of the Comstock Act in the months after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Mark Dixon and Jonathan Mitchell, the minister and lawyer who had worked together on Texas's SB 8, a bill that allowed anyone to sue an abortion provider for at least $10,000 per procedure, had already begun speaking on the potential they saw in the 1873 ban. Dixon began tweeting about ordinances that would require clinics in New Mexico um, to comply with licensure requirements. The licensure requirements, in turn, required compliance with the novel interpretation of the Comstock Act as a de facto abortion ban. 
I knew not to dismiss Mitchell and Dixon, who had catapulted to a position of surprising prominence in the anti-abortion movement, and all without the support of a major organization. Their strategy addressed what was the most, perhaps the most significant strategic weakness of the anti-abortion movement after the demise of Roe v. Wade, the near impossibility of enforcing abortion bans when abortion pills were available through telehealth, and when some, or at least for some patients, travel across state lines was still possible. Mitchell had experimented with strategies to discourage travel, but these plans were complicated. It wasn't clear which state's laws would apply when there were conflicts of law. I can tell you that from having done the research myself, can't confirm. Uh, and there would be novel questions about due process, extradition, and the right to travel that an anti-abortion movement would have to surround. Lawmakers also seemed cautious with only Idaho and a handful of Texas counties passing so-called abortion trafficking laws. The Comstock proposal that Mitchell and Dixon developed was different. It relied on the appeal of a method of statutory interpretation known as textualism. Um, you can save the booze about that for the end. Um, sorry, I can't read from prepared remarks without inserting jokes, so all the bad jokes are my fault and all this brilliance is Mary's. Um, so it required a, a relied on the appeal of a method of statutory interpretation known as textualism to the justices on the conservative supermajority of the Supreme Court. Rather than forcing the justices to wade into constitutional conflicts about fetal personhood, a Comstock strategy allowed the court to claim and interpret an existing law that included the word abortion. Perhaps most importantly, the Comstock Act was already on the books. By this point, you've got, you know that. Uh, it seemed unimaginable that Congress would pass a 15-week ban much less criminalize abortion at, at fertilization. But reinventing the Comstock Act did not require Congress to pass a law or voters to approve. A Comstock strategy instead required only the Supreme Court reject the past century or so precedent, that's not hard, um, and that a Republican in the White House direct the Department of Justice to enforce the Comstock Act as a nationwide ban. As had been the case with SBE, the idea of treating Comstock as an abortion ban quickly spread through the anti-abortion movement. Former Trump administration officials, including Roger Severino and Gene Harrison, one of the architects of the child separation policy, argued that Comstock should be the cornerstone of a new abortion policy in the uh, GOP, new GOP administration. Virtually every leading anti-abortion group has embraced the Comstock strategy. At first, it seems like a reinvention of the Comstock Act is just a matter of strategic expediency. The contemporary anti-abortion movement seeks to criminalize abortion across the country, but polls show at or near record high support for abortion access. The Comstock Act may thus represent the only way to enact a national ban that voters would reject. The remainder of the statute, which focuses on lewd or obscene writings, or on items for indecent or immoral use, um, may simply be an inconvenience the social conservatives can ignore. But the revival of Comstock is more revealing, undoing, as it does, decades of work positioning anti-abortion advocates as anything but censors for policing sex. The modern pro-life movement has long insisted that it is, has no interest in reinforcing gender roles, or indeed, in any issue beyond the right uh, to life of the unborn child. That so many social conservatives embrace the Comstock law today makes it clear that move, movements seeking to regulate reproduction in the United States have fundamentally changed. In, increasingly, these key social conservative leaders eschew single-issue strategies in favor of new multi-issue politics of gender traditionalism, one explicitly tied to the claims about the role of Christianity in our nation's founding. The fact that the Comstock Act is an obscenity law is this, thus not an inconvenience that anti-abortion lawyers can overlook. It is an advantage for a movement that has significantly changed in the past two decades because it creates an opening for far more draconian federal regulations of sex and reproduction and speech about either one. For that reason, understanding what drives is driving the revival and reinvention of the Comstock Act is necessary for anyone who wants to make sense of what comes next in our culture wars over liberty and equality. Um, that's Mary Ziegler. Um, with that, we're actually at our first break. Um, so we're running a teeny bit over. Um, so why don't we come back, I think, at 11.35 Eastern, so folks have a chance to step outside, grab some coffee. And just a reminder that you know, please minimize to keep, not eat or drink in this room. Um, please do so outside um, if possible. See you all back in you know, roughly 10-ish minutes. Good morning, everyone. We're about to get started for our next panel. I hope you all had a wonderful break. 
I'd like to begin by thanking Melissa Gira Grant and Kendra Albert for making this marvelous event happen, and also to thank Jazjot Carr for all the support leading up to this conference. My name is Gillian Frank. Our panel today is called Peak Comstockery, and on it, we are going to elucidate the dynamics of Comstock laws, their culture, and their enforcement, while troubling conventional histories of that regime. And we have amazing guides through this world in our two panelists. Our first panelist is Andrea Friedman. She is Professor Emeritus of History and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. She has written marvelous scholarship about the history of obscenity regulation, the contradictions of Cold War politics, and the sexual politics of the Clinton presidency. Our other panelist, our second panelist, Lauren McIver Thompson, is an assistant professor of history and gender and women's studies at Kennesaw State University, and also a faculty fellow at the Georgia State University College of Law's Center for Law, Health, and Society. Her forthcoming book, so excited about this, on the medical politics of the early birth control movement, is forthcoming with Rutgers University Press. Our panel is going to proceed chronologically and begin with Professor McIver Thompson and then Professor Friedman. And then we will have time for some questions from the audience after I ask just one question of these wonderful presenters. Here we go. Thank you, everybody. Oh, there I am. Oh, my. <laughs> OK. Um, first, I have to echo Gil's uh, thanks to, to Melissa and to Kendra and to all the folks who made today possible. Um, I know that this was a lot of planning, so and it's, it's just a real honor to be here in this space with all of you, so thank you so much. Um, and then it was also an honor to think through um, uh, what Peak's Comstockery looked like in the late 19th and early 20th century with uh, Gil and Andrea here. So one of the things that we talked about when we were sort of planning this, our remarks, uh, is about the murkiness of the Comstock law and how that uncertainty created a situation where everyone, even Comstock himself, <laughs> insisted that the law uh, did or did not do one thing, while others uh, insisted that it did or did not do another. So that story starts with the fact that the Comstock Act had a medical exception built into it in its initial, initial draft form, one did that, that did not make it past the floor debates and was eventually removed. But its existence in the first place, I think, contributed to confusion. And of course, that would also shape the direction of later court cases. So I'm gonna keep my comments short in order to make sure that uh, professors uh, Friedman and Frank have plenty of time to share their thoughts and I'll be happy to, to address questions afterwards as well. So today, there are those who want to wield the Comstock Act to ban medication abortion and procedural abortion are involving FDA-approved drugs that are distributed via prescriber, subject to licensing requirements. But in its day, Comstock simply wasn't wielded in the same context. Instead, the Comstock law was used to classify and confiscate patent medicines that could prevent conception or cause abortion, as well as pamphlets or books or other information or items that were deemed sexually and morally obscene. So this is a really important distinction to think about since Comstock himself stated that the law was never supposed to target, quote, real physicians or medicines. Instead, Comstock wanted to punish commercial enterprises or persons who either sought or sold items related to contraception or abortion or who, or who performed abortions. Because contraception and abortive fashions allowed women to have consequence-free sex, he lumped these items into a larger program that sought to make illicit and criminalize anything outside of heterosexual, marital, procreative sex only. So in 1915, Comstock wrote uh, to the National Birth Control League, which at the time was lobbying to remove contrace the contraception clause from uh, the New York obscenity law, one of those mini Comstock laws that gets passed in the wake of the 1873 law. Um, and he was addressing the uh, National Birth Control League secretary, the suffragist Clara Greening Stillman, and he declares, on the 2nd of March last, I closed 43 years of public service, in which time we have made 3,870 arrests, and I challenge your league to produce a single case where any reputable physician has been interfered with or disturbed in the legitimate practice of medicine. 
Do not make the mistake, however, of classifying the quack and the advertiser of articles for abortion and to prevent, prevent conception with reputable physicians. In an interview with the reporter Mary Alden Hopkins that appeared in the, fo the following month in Harper's Weekly, Comstock again clarified his position on abortion and the Comstock law, quote, a reputable doctor may tell his patient in his office what is necessary, and a druggist may sell on a doctor's written prescription drugs which he would not be allowed to sell otherwise. Well, what did he mean by reputable doctor? Comstock was referring to the fact that American medicine, even in the early 20th century, still did not resemble the profession that we know today. Many providers competed for business and trained doctors were not even the first choice for many because the outcomes for patients, frankly, were not necessarily better than getting treated by uh, those who practiced, quote, alternative medicine. Doctors who had been trained in medical school called themselves the regulars, and those others were the irregulars. In the 19th century, uh, both regulars and irregulars performed abortions, um, and the, although the underground abortion economy was dominated largely by irregulars. So when we look at the history of the medical exception in the Comstock Law, it seems that Comstock may have changed his mind at some point about contraception and abortion in the act. Originally, the passage of the Comstock Act had a regular physician's exception built into the text of the law, but it was taken out essentially after Comstock threw a bit of a fit. First issued by the Committee on Post Office and Post Roads in the winter of 1873, Senator George Edmonds, uh, who was a, the Republican from Vermont, um, hold on one second, sorry, let me go back. Oh, my slide didn't make it in. That's okay. I thought it was in there. Anyway, well, we'll just leave that there. Sorry. <laughs> I thought that's not the right one. Um, so Senator George Edmonds, the Republican from uh, Vermont, had added an amendment stating that the law prohibited any article or medicine uh, for the prevention of conception or for causing abortion, except on a prescription of a physician in good standing given in good faith. So that was what was originally in the text of the act. Comstock, upon seeing the new version of this law, was not impressed, writing in his diary that he assumed Edmonds had doctor friends in the business, meaning irregulars, or even a trained doctor who was somehow greedy and unscrupulous and that, that uh, Edmonds was trying to shield. So during floor debate over the bill in the Senate, Senator William Alfred Buckingham, the Republican from Connecticut, then proposed amended language to replace the, provision, replace the provision about physicians. And it's really not clear why he proposed to eliminate the exception, although some historians have speculated that it might have had to do with a political rivalry between Buckingham and Edmonds, or perhaps he was persuaded by an irate Comstock. We don't really know. Buckingham's amendment to the amendment struck out the phrasing beginning with except, and the final bill read, quote, any article whatever for the prevention of conception or for causing unlawful abortion or shall advertise the same. It is important to know that the Comstock Act did not sail through with zero debate. There were misgivings about this law from Senator Hannibal Hamlin and Senator Roscoe Conkling from Maine and New York, respectively. And in the House of Representatives, uh, Representative Michael Kerr, who is the Democrat from Indi Indiana, briefly raised an objection that they were passing the bill, quote, in hot haste, and moved that the bill be sent to the Committee on the Judiciary. Speaker of the House, James G. Blaine, the Republican from Maine, noted that Kerr's motion was not in order, and the House proceeded to pass the bill. Pre President uh, Ulysses S. Grant signed the Comstock Act into law on March 3rd, 1873, followed, as Professor Friedman will detail um, in her presentation, by the Little Comstock Acts that were layered on top of existing anti-abortion and anti-contraception laws that had been passed in some cases much earlier. Nonetheless, it is striking to note that, the, that historians have found that Comstock prosecutions for abortion and contraception-related uh, obscenity were much fewer than we might think, certainly fewer than the arrests made for pornographic material. Very quickly, in fact, and here's where... <laughs> was supposed to go. Uh, very quickly, in fact, federal judges, uh, when faced with the question of birth control, at least began to carve out the medical exceptions as, as originally intended. In 1936, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit decided one of the most consequen consequential cases in this area, United States 
versus one package of Japanese pessaries, a really truly wonderfully named case. In one package, the court affirmed that physicians had the right to prescribe contraception and import devices for medical research to use them for, quote, the health of their patients. The judges in the one package decision even commented that the Comstock Act's design was not to prevent the importation, sale, or carriage by mail of things which might be intelligently employed by conscientious and competent physicians for the purpose of saving lives or promoting the well being of their patients. The court's justification for this claim included referencing the existence of the original exception in the Comstock law. Moreover, the Comstock laws never wholly prevented uh, black market birth control. An entire underground economy of sexual health related products flourished despite the laws on the books attempting to suppress them. Pharmacies and mail order companies sold sex toys and barrier contraceptives under the guise of med medical equipment. Distributors maintained their lucrative sales by fashioning their items and advertising as health aids. Vaginal suppositories, douching mechanisms, and pessaries promised to fix medical issues like prolapsed, uh, prolapsed uterus or were promoted to ensure vaginal irrigation or feminine hygiene. Most significantly, a wide range of abortifacients marketed as patent medicines containing, uh, har often containing harmful ingredients that sickened or, or killed women attempting to use them continued to be sold. These medicines, often consisting of powerfully emetic herbs, were consumed in teas or chewed, but it was really difficult to assess the quantities needed, which made them dangerous. Yet because doctors in many states were prohibited by their state's obscenity law from even discussing birth control with patients, the vast majority of Americans obtained fertility control items and information from this open market. And as Mary Ziegler and Reva Siegel have found, the problem was that the law created a chill on free speech around contraception and abortion, as well as sexuality more generally, which Andrea will address. And despite Comstock's insistence, at least in 1915, that he had never meant his law to prevent medical care, others, including the reformers in the birth control movement, saw the Comstock Act as the primary obstacle in their fight. Reformer Henry Allen, for example, wrote in an editorial for the famous anarchist free love periodical Lucifer the Lightbearer, another wonderfully named <laughs> piece here, uh, that for many years it has been a matter of surprise to me why so many hold the belief that the Comstock law was intended to prevent the dissemination of obscene literature. This was never the real purpose of the law. The intent and purpose of the Comstock law is to prevent the, dis the dissemination of all knowledge pertaining to contraceptic science not obscene literature. This is from 1897, y'all. Although many physicians were sympathetic to their patients' desire to want to control their families, many refused to discuss birth control at all, either from, uh, from fear uh, of legal prosecution or their, or, or, or their own moral stance on it. So the law demonstrates a continuity. Laws that restrict abortion, even when they have exceptions or are supposed to operate as if they do, end up restricting the practice altogether. And so I'm going to close with the Comstock Act never achieved the goals of its architect, which was to stop the trade of sexual material. Instead, its most serious consequence was to limit and criminalize the conversation on sex and reproduction in America for a century, a curtailing whose negative outcomes haunt us to this moment. Thank you. Thanks for that, Lauren. And I also want... Ah. I hate mics. Um, thank you to Lauren and to the Comstock.com organizers. And I'm just so thrilled to be here with all of you to think through these incredibly pressing questions. I'm going to be focusing today on obscenity and pornography. And I'm going to look at the period between 1915, when Anthony Comstock died, to 1957, the year of the US Supreme Court decision in Roth versus United States, which upheld the conviction of Samuel Roth for violating the Comstock Act by using mail to advertise his his uh, catalog of allegedly obscene books. And this um, case was especially important because it affirmed explicitly that obscenity was not protected by the First Amendment. And I want to um, focus my comments to complicate our understanding of peak Comstockery around two basic issues. One is I want to decenter the Federal Comstock Act itself. For in the period that I am discussing, 
I believe it was not the primary mechanism for enacting censorship of sexual speech. And second, I want to explore briefly the ways that the moral presumptions underlying the Comstock Act were being shaken during these years. And I'm going to use the concept of the Comstock apparatus, which was articulated a few years ago in an essay by Strub, Colgan, and Escoffier, and I have the citation at the end of my talk. They argued that the Comstock Act was only one in a number of interlinked strategies, and they emphasized public-private partnerships, including the vice societies that uh, Anthony Comstock was associated with, and also the passage of the Little Comstock Laws, which expanded beyond um, po the post office to criminalize the existence of Absendi itself. And it's my contention that the Comstock apparatus vastly expanded in the first half of the 20th century in large part because obtaining criminal convictions became extremely difficult in many places uh, with the spread of new ideas about sexuality um, in what scholars have called sexual liberalism. Now the threat of prosecution definitely had a chilling effect, but the criminal law was only one piece and sometimes even the least important of a more complex regime regulating a broad range of speech, including government censorship boards, industrial self-regulation, consumer boycotts, grassroots organizing, and administrative law such as licensing. And I'm gonna focus on licensing as my example. Um, in the city of New York, which I studied. So the licensing of theaters as places of amusement in New York City, I lost, oh, okay, sorry. So I'm gonna focus on the 1920s. In the 20s, there was a series of plays on Broadway that were dealing with sex. Uh, May West's Sex was one of the most uh, well-known, and particularly plays that portrayed lesbian and gay life, although in a not very flattering fashion. And in response to the proliferation of these plays, New York State legislators passed what was called the Wales Act, which was popularly, popularly known as the Padlock Law. And the Wales Act knitted together several aspects of the Comstock apparatus. Um, first, it relied on New York's obscenity statute under the Little Comstock Law, and it enabled prosecution of so-called obscene plays on the basis of any part of a play. It could be a scene, a phrase, a word, and that would be sufficient to obtain a conviction, they believed, under the Little Comstock Law in New York. Second, it allowed New York's license commissioner to revoke the license of a theater for one year if there was a conviction under the law. And that's why it was called the Padlock Act because they could close a theater for up to a year. And third, it created an outright ban on quote, sex degeneracy or perversion in place. So homosexuality could no longer be at least explicitly referred to in plays in the state. Now, this law was effective because it shifted the burden of risk, right? It was theater owners who could lose their licenses and therefore their capital for up to a year. And so during the 1920s and 1930s, city officials simply threatened prosecution and padlocking, which was enough to prompt theater owners to refuse to rent to or to evict plays that were generating some unease. Also in these years, New York license authorities used their powers to wipe out New York's burlesque industry for two decades. Okay, so this was extremely effective, but its effectiveness was more in terms of the licensing use rather than obscenity criminal prosecutions. Now in 1945, when city officials revoked the license of a theater that um, decided to house another play about lesbianism titled Trio, um, 
they moved to revoke the license or refused to transfer the license without any pretense of obscenity prosecution. And this caused an uproar. Um, through, you know, in New York's press, among its citizens, there were accusations of authoritarianism and fascism on the parts of New York City officials. License Commissioner Paul Moss, was caught, who was Jewish and a former vaudevillian, was called, you know, a little Nazi on, on Broadway. Um, and this caused city officials to back down. And they agreed they would not revoke licenses as they had been doing unless they got an obscenity conviction under the law. Now, this shift in attitudes towards licensing points us also to the other theme I want to explore, which is changing attitudes about the dangers of obscenity and its policing. And I'm going to shorthand this by referring to the standards that were employed by courts in these years. So as Amy helpfully noted, in 1879, US courts embraced the so-called Hicklin rule, which came from British law, in a Comstock Act prosecution uh, regarding newspaper advertising of a free love tract, I think by Ezra, uh, Ezra Haywood. Um, and they said there that the test of obscenity is whether the tendency of the matter charged is to deprave or corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences and into whose hands a publication of this sort might fall. And importantly, Hicklin specified again that this could be gauged by consideration of a phrase or a word. It, it, they were not concerned with the impact of the work on the whole. Okay. What I want to highlight is the focus on the threats to the vulnerable, um, which usually was figured as a child or a young adult, especially young men, but not only. And I want to note that even as these standards began to be rejected by some courts and the judge in one package, Learned Hand, was very important in this area as well, um, even as they began to be rejected. By some courts, they remained compelling to many people throughout the period, including many people outside of New York. Now, Hicklin was explicitly overruled by the Supreme Court in Roth. And here is the new definition of obscenity. Material was obscene only if to the average person applying contemporary community standards, the dominant theme of the material taken as a whole appeals to prurient interest. Now there's a lot going on in that definition. They're changing a lot of things. But I want to focus on the shift from the vulnerable viewer to the average person. Okay. This shift reflected decades of conflict between anti-obscenity and free speech activists about the dangers of obscenity on the one hand, and um, censorship on the other. And during these years, the languages of citizenship and democracy came to the fore of these debates. So free speech advocates positioned censorship as anti-democratic. Um, they saw it as a strategy used by a distinct minority who wanted to control the ideas and lives of the majority of students. And so they were positioning um, anti-obscenity activists as not democratic. While anti-obscenity campaigners who were seeking to modernize their language because the kinds of arguments that were made by Anthony Comstock were generally not really very effective, argued that they were actually the representatives of the people, which we hear echoes of, for example, with the creation of the moral majority later on, who only wanted to protect the nation from the dangers of obscenity and pornography. And while this anti-censorship position seemed to be ascendant, anti-obscenity campaigners were able to remain relevant even with the change in the standards by once again claiming to protect the child who they figured as the, the future citizen, okay? And this kind of argument was actually revitalized and strengthened in the 1940s and 1950s with the advent of World War II and the domestic Cold War. This position was revitalized in many ways. So on the one hand, advocates of limits on speech 
obscenity, um, claimed that obscenity and pornography were fascist and totalitarian imports brought by outsiders intended to weaken America's moral fiber. And citizens have the patriotic duty to stand up against these foreign um, ideas. And these kinds of arguments were taken up by organizations like Charles Carding's, Keating's, excuse me, Citizens for Decent Literature, which was founded in 1956 in Cincinnati, and became an important force in the emergence of the movement against pornography into the 1980s. Okay. So that by the end of the period I'm talking about, both sides were claiming something we might call democratic moral authority. And I want to offer this story in part as a cautionary tale about the slipperiness of claims to democracy, which I think haunts our politics today, right? Democracy is a fiction, and people mean very different things by it, and they use it to different aims. I want to briefly conclude, conclude with a few thoughts about the relevance for today of these older debates. So even though it may have in the case that the Comstock Act and the Comstock apparatus seem to be a dead letter, each of these has lived on, especially in the emphasis on protecting the vulnerable. And vulnerable children remain at the center of conservative, aka parental efforts to save the nation from outsiders. But outsiders today are figured as queer and trans folks, feminists, critical race theorists, liberals, take your pick. Second, and I hesitate to say this, at a conference sponsored by the Center for the Inclusive First Amendment, calls for freedom of speech come with their own complexities, right? <coughs> so the court's continuing definition of obscenity, of obscenity as not protected by the First Amendment exists in this moment side by side with the strengthening of religious expressions, um, inclusion, and kind of placing at the center of the First Amendment. And in such a situation, freedom of speech claims are particularly useful to precisely those who want to restrict the speech and visibility of those of us who are considered obscenities. Thanks very much. Wow, that was just fantastic, two wonderful talks. I'm gonna offer one question to invite you all to think with each other, and then I wanna turn it over to our audience should they have any questions. So I wonder if I can invite you both to share your thoughts on the gendered politics of constockery in terms of those who would enforce it and those who it targeted. Let me nuance that just a little bit. A casual observer might surmise that constockery was a simple crystallization of patriarchy with men policing and subjugating women. But we know from both of your own works and from the many histories of women as activism, sexual conservatism, and obscenity, that women have also been the engines of anti-obscenity movements. And in those movements, we have seen them police each other and men. So my questions, and I front-loaded this a little bit, but how should we think about gendered politics during what we're calling peak comstockery, or how might the politics of gender and also race trouble our understanding of the history of comstockery as a simple history of conservatism? <clears throat> well, I, the kind of simplest first sentence that I would say to that is that we cannot think about the Comstock Act without thinking about the intertwined intersections of race and gender. Um, we just cannot understand this act and, and the person behind it and the people that um, advanced the punishments for it without understanding those things. And so I, I wanted to say too that I think that today we're sort of um, assigning this rebirth of Comstockism to Republicans, right? But um, in, the, in the past, even in the brief anecdote I shared with you about the passage of the Comstock Act, you, can, you could hear that Republicans and Democrats were sort of um, looking to pass it together, and then there were <coughs> objections from both Republicans and Democrats. And so um, Comstockism was really like sort of an equal party um, thing uh, for, for decades. 
um, when it was active. And the other kind of um, to piece to this is to think about the role of even what we would maybe call like liberal white women and even in some cases conservative black club women who were very devoted to the idea of fighting obscenity and fighting um, pornography because they saw that within a universe that was dominated by the patriarchy, a legal patriarchy in which black women uh, and women of color were at the very bottom of that hierarchy. And so for both white and black women who actually supported um, Comstock and sort of related efforts against pornography in the 19th century, supported, for example, raising age of consent laws, which was, you know, at the time, the uh, age of consent in, I think it was Delaware, maybe, was like nine or 10 years old. So um, specifically related to slavery um, and ensuring that white men would not get prosecuted for uh, raping enslaved children. And so, um, you know, there, there were, I think, we have to understand the Comstock Act as coming out of both a liberal and conservative tradition. And within that tradition, you had both black and white women who saw the opportunity to target pornography as a larger feminist project. And so I think that's important to remember. But that being said, um, there were many reformers who then went on to say, you ladies who are getting hung up on the porn part are not paying enough attention to the contraceptive and abort an abortion part, and that's hurting you, and you need to pay more attention. And so then you get in the early 20th century um, reformers who begin to to say, "Hey, look, you know, this is really the what has what Comstock has done." And you heard a little bit about that in the presentation as well from Henry Allen. So, yeah, and I'll just briefly add that. Um, Women were on all sides. Uh, women were particularly um, influential in a variety of efforts uh, advocating for the protection of children, especially movies. Mike, your it's mic's not on. Oh. Oh. I'll just hear yours, yeah. Uh, I hope you could hear that. OK. Um, so women were at the forefront of efforts to um, control motion pictures and also comic books, in particular the General Federation of Women's Clubs in the 50s. But I want to stay with the um, focus. And, and also women were extremely important, especially feminists and sex radicals, in um, forming coalitions that were fighting against censorship and for the possibility of uh, recognizing the importance of women's sexual pleasure. So they're on both sides. But I want to stay with comic books for just a minute because I think it's a great example of the ways in which um, thinking about anti-obscenity as always activism, as always conservative, can uh, cause us to not see some other things. So I've written in several contexts about Frederick Wortham. Has anybody heard of Frederick Wortham? Forensic psychiatrist. He led the charge against comic books in the 19 late 40s and 50s. Uh, his activism led directly to the passage of the Comics Code, which kind of destroyed the industry, again, for several decades. Um, but it's really interesting if you pay attention to the reasons why Wortham said he was trying to protect children against the comic book industry. Because his argument was, when he talked about children being seduced, he talked to to a life of violence and fascism, basically. He was talking about the ways in which the show of violence, the appearance of violence in comic books, um, and the focus of other crusaders on the appearance of violence in comic books was actually a way to avoid seeing the real problem. And the real problem from Fred, for Frederick Wortham was the structural violence that children were being indoctrinated into as American citizens and that underlay all of American life. So he would argue, for example, that um, uh, the problem with policing kids who read comics was that uh, they were mostly young kids who nobody who were not who were invisible to the state in many ways so he was especially concerned with young black boys and puerto rican boys who ended up committing crimes not because they actually read comics but because they were subjected to 
um, to police violence, to uh, poverty, to poor education. They were just invisible to the society. And they were made to become symbols of the problems of comic books without paying attention to the structural violence that pervaded America. So in certain ways, I think that it's wrong to think of um, Wortham as a conservative, right? His work was bent to conservative ends, but, and you know, he participated in making comic books problematic, but, but he was doing it for very different reasons. And so um, I think we always have to look under the surface. It appears, because of the history of anti-obscenity campaigning, that he's just another one of those. But in fact, he's a much more complicated figure, so. I, I really appreciate how you both invite us to think about culture and structure, not as just merely reflecting each other, but as complex, contradictory, and changing over time, and fractured along internally and between racial and gendered lines. That was so fantastic. We have some time, I think. One, one question from the audience. Who's going to be our lucky person? <laughs> that, that's putting people on the spot, I fear. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed listening to these presentations, both the first panel and, and yours as well. It's fascinating stuff. The one quick question I wanted to ask you about was your assessment of the role of technology, which is kind of my bailiwick in all of this, in the uh, push for more enforcement of things like the Comstock Act. I really got into this back in the late 1990s following the passage of the Communications Decency Act which was an attempt to go beyond obscenity into the realm of indecency. And that, of course, got shot down. I'm not sure it would today. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that. So, you know. Mike. So, is this on? Can you hear me? OK. So I'm kind of a Luddite. And my basic argument is that there is always technology the forms of technology change, and maybe sometimes they have greater reach, but that the law is really adept at expanding to account for new forms of technology, right? So, um, you know, so what I think what's especially important from my perspective for the Communications Decency Act is it was, it was once again argued for in the names of protecting children, right? And so that basic argument can be adapted in so many ways to so many different technologies. Now, like I said, I'm a Luddite. I don't like social media. I'm still a Facebook person. You know, I'm very backwards. And so I don't really understand how it has changed recently, but yeah. Technology is important, but it's less important than the kind of bedrock foundations of regulation. So my response to that is to I have sort of two directions and or ways of thinking about this. The first is to think about how technology is now going to be employed to surveil even more closely the people, for example, who are seeking abortion. And there, we already know that this is happening. I think there was a mother and daughter in Virginia who were prosecuted after the police looked at their Facebook messages about, uh, about the daughter um, receiving an abortion or committing an illegal abortion. So we know that they're going to use technology. Uh, uh, um, and this is all like so fluid because aren't we about to ban TikTok or something? I don't, I don't you know, so I'm not on, I'm not on TikTok, so <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, my other kind of uh, response to that is that in some ways, it, it, when it came to contraceptive uh, and abortive fashion material, Actually, the sort of advancements in technology actually, I think, helped to weaken the Comstock Act when it came to contraception, at least, because uh, the, the one package of Japanese pessaries was actually a very new, um, it was a new technology that had been developed by um, a physician in Japan, and uh, Sanger, Margaret Sanger and uh, the physician Hannah Stone had asked him to send these pessaries to, uh, to New York to their clinic to test on American women. And so the case that came out of it, the judges were convinced that 
wow, this is a new medical technology that we need to make room for, and therefore we're going to allow physicians to take advantage of this and treat, the pa treat their patients in the way that they see fit. And there's, you know, that is not that simple, but um, so technology has kind of operated in these two different ways, I think. Um, so, and it's kind of anyone's guess, you know, how this is gonna go. They're, now we're attacking the FDA and pharmaceutical regulation and all of these things. So I don't know <laughs> um, where we go next from this, but I think that that maybe has a little bit of a, uh, gives us a little bit of a 360 degree view of what happened before this, so. Y'all could join me in thanking our panelists. Um, that puts us at lunch. Uh, so we will be back at 1.15 um, for our next panel, but lunch is uh, in the atrium. Please uh, enjoy it outside and we'll see you back at 1.15. Yeah. All right, folks, welcome back from lunch. Uh, we're so excited to be back at it, um, back in conversation. And I'm going to take you forward a teeny bit in time. Um, so picture yourself landing somewhere between, in between the 1970s and 2022. Um, and, you know, as I probably don't need to tell many folks in this room, in the 1960s and 70s, the Supreme Court had done much to expand individual rights, including to contraception under Griswold, to abortion under Roe, and fixing a narrower definition of obscenity under Miller. And of course, you know, that means we're done with Comstock, right? This is now Chief Justice Warren Con, and we can all go home. <laughs> A laugh, thank you for the laugh. Um, uh, it's not quite. So our next group of incredible speakers is here to tell you about how sort of Comstock lurked beneath that surface, right? Whether through the Comstock Act and state level equivalents, which we talked about a bit before lunch, or through the eugenicist and anti-vice agenda, they continue to mediate access to reproductive care. Um, so I'm gonna introduce each of them briefly and then them let them take the stage, tell their part of the story, and then of course we'll go to a group discussion and then finally a Q&A with all of y'all. Um, so oh, that's a, yes, those are our speakers. Um, so first uh, up is Professor Gillian Frank, who is a historian of sexuality and religion and a lecturer at the Stevens Institute of Technology. You got to hear from him a little bit in his role as moderator on the last panel, but now we're so thrilled to have him talk about his own historical work. Also, if you like his talk, I encourage you to check out his podcast, Sex and History, available wherever you get your podcasts. Um, next, I'm so honored to welcome Professor Bridges. Um, professor Kiara M. Bridges is a professor of law at UC Berkeley School of Law. I won't read out her whole bio, because um, we would be here for a while, but she includes a number of incredible accomplishments, but instead I'll just summarize by saying her work on privacy, rights, race, class, and reproduction is required reading for anyone who wants to understand our current moment. Her, her book, Reproducing Race, amazing. Um, last but certainly not least, is Judge Jennifer Kinsley, um, a judge on the Ohio First uh, District Court of Appeals, not appearing in her, her judicial role, and a member of the tenured faculty at the AKU Chase College of Law. Her work has been a personal inspiration for me, so it's very cool to get to meet her in person. Um, and as someone who's been interested in how obscenity was sort of considered settled and not relevant, and we're really honored to have her here to talk about obscenity post-Miller. Um, so I'll just start with Gil. so nice to be with you all today. This is like a dream come true to me to think with these wonderful folks about comstockery, its consequences. Today I want to think with you about domains not typically associated with comstockery, which are religious freedom and medical migration, which is to say I want to talk about how religious activists enabled abortion travel by carving out an abortion information and travel network before the 1973 Roe and Doe decisions. So let me offer an overarching premise. Laws regulating abortion, Comstock and otherwise, created both medical scarcity and 
informational scarcity. Now, as earlier panels have noted, Comstockery at once consolidated and elaborated laws governing the sharing of information about contraceptives and abortifacients, those who provided them, as well as the devices and procedures themselves. This information scarcity was such that in the pre-Roe era, women from all walks of life had difficulty answering elementary questions. Questions like, how can I end my pregnancy? Where can I get an abortion? How will I get there? Can I trust the provider? Can I afford the procedure? And what do I do if something goes wrong? In a context where Baxter Butcher is exploited, mutilated, and killed those desperate abortion seekers, correctly answering these questions was a matter not just of reproductive freedom, but often of life and death. So, in the years between Griswold and Rowe, many mainline Protestant and Jewish clergy and laity expressed their faith by attempting to provide concrete answers to the questions I just read. The context in which they did so, especially for clergy, was pastoral counseling, a practice that wove together religious guidance, therapeutic frameworks, and practical advice. And by offering pastoral counseling, cler uh, clergy shared information about how to access abortion safely. And this process often involved traveling. And so clergy across the United States found themselves contravening laws that prohibited the sharing of such information and enabling these practices. And as a result, found themselves in the crosshairs of state officials that would enforce these regulations. To get a sense of the texture of these conflicts, I want to take you back to Florida in 1971, where the Reverend Charles Landreth, a minister at First, First Presbyterian Church in Tallahassee, took to his pulpit one June Sunday to preach. During his sermon, the minister asked his congregants to consider what an unwanted pregnancy would mean to an older married woman, a young woman who had been raped, or a high school girl, in his words, scared literally to death to tell her staunch Catholic parents, and therefore very tempted to run to a quack, which is to say a factory butcher. That summer Sunday at Tallahassee's oldest church, the Reverend argued that it was Jesus' declaration that the first stone should be cast by those among you without sin. And this declaration was, in his words, a radical challenge to the scribes and the Pharisees and to their conception of morality and authority. Now, I'm not a preacher. I'm not trying to convert. I'm just a secular Jew. But I want to get us into the religious <laughs> texture of this moment. Because invoking these scriptural passages enabled Landry to protest against the immorality of Florida's laws, which prohibited abortion unless the mother's life was in danger. But he also objected to one more thing. Laws prohibiting him from fulfilling his religious obligations to help women get the medical care he believed they deserved. And towards the end of his sermon, Reverend Landreth revealed to his congregation what had already been in newspapers all over Florida in the preceding weeks, that he and one of his colleagues, a man named Reverend Leo Sandin, had been helping women in Tallahassee travel to obtain out-of-state abortions. And they were doing so as part of a much larger religious enterprise called the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion, which had branches in Florida, but also numerous other states. Now, between 67 and 71, the group to which these reverends belong, the CCS, helped upwards of a quarter of a million women get abortions, helped them access pre-vetted, illegal and illegal providers, and they did so within an extensive international medical network. And they did so while publicly advancing a theology meant to lift up women's voices and advance their reproductive choices, even as they offered concrete mechanisms through which they could travel to obtain abortions. Now, these activities had consequences. Sandin and Landreth were targeted by a state senator, a district attorney, a senate committee, two separate state attorneys, and a grand jury. And these officials believed that the two reverends were violating Florida's long-standing statutes that prohibited advising, aiding, or assisting women to procure miscarriage, and distributing material that gave, in the words of the law, any advice, direction, information, or knowledge that may be obtained for the purpose of causing or procuring the miscarriage of any woman pregnant with child. Informational scarcity, medical scarcity. With good reason, the clergymen were certain that they would be charged and prosecuted, and they decided to act preemptively, file a lawsuit that challenged Florida's abortion statutes 
on the grounds that they abridged religious freedoms. Now, I'm going to return us to Florida and these two reverends at the end of my talk. This is what we call a mini cliffhanger. But for now, I want to rest on some of the underlying themes of this charged encounter. The conflict between these clergy and the state emphasizes how abortion history is a history of state-sponsored medical and informational scarcity, a history of medical travel, and a history of policing. It's a story of legal restrictions limiting information and medical resources as much as it is a story of abortion seekers desperately searching for guidance while crossing state and national borders to obtain treatment. But it's also a story of information providers, of guides who helped plan these journeys and make them possible. Now, we should note that the CCS was just one of many abortion referral groups that flourished in the years before Roe. But this story, particularly the ways in which clergy challenged the enforcement of abortion laws, is particularly salient today at a moment when religious freedom arguments are once again being successfully mustered to carve out exceptions to abortion bans. Let me make the connection to Comstock laws even clearer. The lawsuit in Florida, which emphasized a religious right to offer abortion counseling and referral and enable travel, wasn't unique. It drew from a legal repertoire that had been used in the clergy contraceptive activism against Comstock laws two decades earlier and was actively in use in the early 1970s across the US. For example, the assertion of a religious right to offer abortion counseling came up in New York in 1970 in a case called Lyons v. Lefkowitz, where a clergy consultation service member sued for, in the words of the case, the constitutional right to refer his pastoral counselees to qualified gynecologists and surgeon. It came up again the same year when three Missouri clergymen joined a lawsuit that sought to overturn that state's law. And in their filings, these state leaders described how they devoted the substantial time and quoting, and energy to marriage and to family counseling, and were continually requested by congregants to provide, to discuss, and to advise in regard to information about obtaining therapeutic abortions. And it emerged in a number of other cases in other states, including one in Georgia, where Atlanta-based clergy joined in a case that we now know as Doe v. Bolton, the sister case to Roe, arguing for a religious right to offer abortion counseling and referral. There's a religious architecture to much of the reproductive freedom struggles of the 60s and 70s. Now, in each of these cases and many others, clergy sought to protect the information network through which they made abortion travel and abortion access possible to those whom they counseled. Put slightly differently, these religious folks maintained that restrictive abortion laws interfered with their free religious expression and the beliefs and practices of their congregants. And they did so while framing abortion counseling as an expression of religious belief and freedom. Now, a number of you are probably thinking, what on earth are clergy doing involved in resistance to abortion restrictions? And how do we make sense of the fact that their advocacy for reproductive freedom was phrased as an expression of religious freedom? I'm gonna give a very brief answer. Now, it's, it's very brief, which is to say that by World War II, support for planning parenthood through contraceptives was tightly interwoven into mainline Protestant and Jewish religious institutions and thought, and had been for decades in many cases. By the early 1960s, support for contraceptive freedom expanded to include support for abortion access, and the reason for that was clergy were troubled by their repeated encounters with members of their own community, with people who they knew intimately from seeing week after week in the pews, from members of their family who were denied abortion, who were humiliated in the process of obtaining legal abortions, or who were endangered or died from illegal procedures. Individual clergy and entire denominations began agitating for social change by the early 60s, and while there wasn't complete agreement within and among denominations, mostly mainline Protestant and liberal Jewish, as to whether abortion should be strictly doled out on a therapeutic level or be given on demand, there was a consensus that the law needed to be changed. Now, for activist clergy, the idea that the law should be such that women were arbiters of their own reproductive future became common sense. And the goal became for clergy of the CCS to ensure that women received safe abortions wherever they were available. And so to do this, these clergy worked within well-established theological and pastoral traditions of offering counseling and aid and information, which is to say across dozens of states, clergy self-consciously transformed pastoral 
into a tool for widespread social change. Now, in doing this, in having people come to churches and synagogues to get counseling and abortion advice and directions on how to get to providers, it lends an era of respectability and religiosity. But these efforts also have legal meaning. The pastor penitent relationship was theoretically supposed to create a zone of privacy that protected clergy and those they counseled from state surveillance and forced court testimony. So CCS clergy, in other words, sought to turn religious spaces into sanctuaries where abortion seekers, especially in the many states that prohibited sharing information, could learn how to terminate a pregnancy and learn how to travel to get the medical health care they needed. Now, this theory of privileged religious speech around abortion had yet to be tested in the courts. And so to offer themselves an added layer of protection and on the advice of their lawyers, CCS groups initiated a policy where clergy referred clients across state lines or national borders under the belief that it would make DAs less likely to prosecute because of the limited fiscal resources and just the hassle of doing their jobs. Now, it was a great theory, but it didn't play out that way. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But I want to just talk about travel itself for a brief moment. So this was the era before the internet before TripAdvisor, before GPSs, before Yelp. Traveling wasn't easy. It's not like it's easy today, but it was profoundly difficult. And most of the time, folks who were seeking out abortions had never left their home state or home country. And so an essential aspect of information management, of guidance, of what we would call pastoral care, was helping travelers navigate a transcontinental medical network, which had, by 69, spent three continents and five countries. Now, if mandating travel and pastoral counseling was meant to shield clergy and abortion seekers, there was an ever-present threat, threat of arrest and prosecution. I want to note that most of the time, authorities were willing to look the other way, if not outright assist the clergy. Numerous police took their wives, daughters, or lovers to the CCS for help over the years. Same with prosecutors and politicians. But time and again, these clergy found themselves in the crosshairs of DAs and state politicians usually conservative Catholics, who sought to squelch their counseling and referral activities and stop abortion travel. Now, typically, they were charged with violating laws, criminalizing sharing information. Language like aids, counsels, or procures were used frequently in the charges. And in these cases, police and prosecutors hounded the clergy. They tapped phones. They sent in undercover officers. They audited financial records and patient records. They'd show up at the homes of abortion seekers, at the workplaces of these women, all trying to get them to testify. And these efforts frequently found their way into newspapers and into the courts, which brings us back to Florida in 1971, I promise you we'd be back, and to Reverend Sandin and Landris' attempt to use the courts to stimmy prosecutions and to overturn Florida's abortion laws. Now, it was found very quickly that their case didn't have standing. They had asked a three-judge federal panel to declare the state abortion laws unconstitutional and to issue an injunction. They were joined by Presbyterian couples who had they had help, and they all maintained together that their religious consciences were being violated and that they needed the help to travel to New York, where they all had received abortions. Now, the judges rejected the case as too speculative, but another judge who was arbitrating one of the grand juries said that oral testimony or oral communication is not subject to these regulations and the written material is too vague. And so, as a result, the grand juries dropped their investigations of the clergy for a moment, which allowed these clergy to resume counseling. Now, by October of 1971, after a brief pause between July and October, during which they were being investigated, Sandin and Landreth resumed their counseling, resumed sending women from Florida to New York City where abortion was legal. By way of conclusion, I'm going to share the words of one of the travelers that the CCS helped the very month that they resumed their counseling. That month, a freshman at the University of Florida named Marion, this is October of 71, discovered that she was pregnant. And here are her words. I was vomiting every morning. I'd have to stop five times on the way to class to vomit. She's remembering about her first semester of college. And at 18 years old, she knew that having a baby, in her words, meant that her educational plans would be devastated. 
despite the illegality of abortion in Florida, she was determined to terminate her pregnancy. And like many other students at the University of Florida that semester, she learned about the clergy from an insert in her school's newspaper, which had printed and distributed the names of abortion referral groups, an act that was actually still illegal. Her words, I read the paper and I saw this ad and it was like my prayers were answered, even though I didn't believe in God anymore. It was like, hallelujah, somebody's gonna help me figure out what to do. She remembered her abortion counselor, helping her plan every detail of her trip, helping her navigate New York City. They were fabulous, she said. I was so relieved, here was my answer. During her flight from Gainesville to New York Airport, and again on a bus from the airport to Midtown Manhattan, she saw that she wasn't the only abortion traveler. People were coming from all over, she remembered. There were at least 10 other girls who got up at the clinic, stopped from the bus from the airport, and when I got to the clinic, there were probably about 400 women in this clinic. It's like everybody east of the Mississippi came here. Information, medical support, travel, these were some of the foundations of abortion access before Rao, and the ability to access each underpinned Marion's journey and the journey of hundreds of thousands of women in the years between Griswold and Rao. And that information chain, fragile as it was, provided the vital information to answer key questions. How can I end my pregnancy? Where can I obtain an abortion? How will I get there? Can I trust the provider? Can I afford the procedure? And what do I do if something goes wrong? Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Gail. Assault, homicide, 
and an array of other crimes. It bears noting that the longitudinal studies that have been conducted on children who have been exposed to cocaine in utero show that they do not differ from children who did not sustain in utero exposure to cocaine. These studies establish that while cocaine may have had a nominal effect on children exposed to it in utero, poverty by far bears the greatest responsibility for infant mortality and morbidity. As neonatologist Hale Perk concludes, poverty is a more powerful influence on the outcome of inner city children than gestational exposure to cocaine, end quote. Nevertheless, during the crack cocaine scare, the impoverished, unhealthy environments in which poor black people lived were erased from you. With this context completely obscured, black women's use of crack cocaine was identified as the sole cause of their infant's poor health. And thus framed, prosecutors endeavored to bring the full weight of the criminal legal system on these women for supposedly permanently damaging their babies with the crack cocaine that they sold while pregnant. I should tell you that even if cocaine use during pregnancy could cause permanent or significant harm to fetuses, and even if poor black people did in fact harm their fetuses by using cocaine while pregnant, there remains the question of why the penal state chose to single out people who used that particular substance while pregnant. A number of other substances can harm fetuses. Why punish the individuals who expose their fetus to one specific harmful substance while many substances, some illegal, many legal, also cause harm? For example, cigarette smoke is exceedingly harmful to fetuses. A 2014 Surgeon General report of smoking explained that uh, smoking's effects, quote, extend from fertility through gestation and beyond, resulting in cases of fetal growth restriction, preterm delivery, placenta previa, placental eruption, some congenital abnormalities, and impaired lung development, end quote. Yet during the crack cocaine scare of the 1980s, prosecutors did not bring criminal charges against the hundreds of thousands of people who smoked cigarettes while pregnant and exposed their fetuses to no Instead, prosecutors brought charges against women who used only one highly stigmatized drug that was imagined to harm fetuses, crack cocaine. And scholars have argued that the state's choice to single out users of crack cocaine for criminal punishment while ignoring users of the smorgasbord of other substances that is unhealthy to be fetuses, that is a consequence of crack cocaine having been racialized as black and associated with black people. Arrests and prosecutions for substance use during pregnancy continue to the present. Many of these arrests and prosec uh, prosecutions target people who have used opioids or methamphetamine while pregnant. Many of these people are white. And I have written about the shift in the racial demographics of those who have been arrested and prosecuted for substance use during pregnancy. And the short of it is that we should understand the fact that white people are now being arrested and prosecuted for substance use during pregnancy as evidence that anti-blackness and white supremacy is black for everybody, including white people. Further, criminal punishment of pregnant people who have suffered poor work outcomes occur outside of the context of substance use. Police arrested a pregnant woman who fell down the stairs. Police, uh, prosecutors brought charges against a depressed pregnant woman who attempted suicide. Her name is Bebe Shui. Uh, she found that she was pregnant, told her partner, the father of the, the fetus, that she was pregnant, and he said he didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so she became deeply depressed. Um, and in an attempt to end her life, she ingested rat poison. She survived, thankfully, but her fetus died. Prosecutors brought homicide charges against her for killing her fetus. Prosecutors brought charges against a pregnant woman who suffered a miscarriage after being shot in the abdomen during an altercation. This happened a couple of years ago in Alabama. A woman was five months pregnant. She got into a physical altercation with another woman who had been sleeping with her man. Um, they were fighting in the parking lot. And the pregnant woman, seems by all accounts, was winning. Um, the other woman pulled out a gun and shot the pregnant woman in her abdomen. Her fetus died. She survived. Prosecutors brought charges of involuntary manslaughter against her. They said that she killed her fetus because she should have avoided the fight. Prosecutors have also brought charges against pregnant people who have suffered no adverse outcome. A pregnant woman faced charges for endangering her fetus after she drove her car without wearing a seatbelt, and then she tried to avoid arrest by the police officer. She pulled her over. She was charged with fetal endangerment. 
So more broadly, we should know that there is something profoundly hypocritical about a state that punishes people who suffer or might suffer poor birth outcomes, but also selects poor communities and communities of color as sites for chemical plants, oil refineries, garbage dumps, and other hazardous waste. Even though it is well documented that the babies born to those who live in proximity to such sites have an increased incidence of health impairments. We should know that there is something profoundly hypocritical about a state that punishes people who suffer or might suffer poor birth outcomes, but also erects a social safety net for some covered citizens that is punitive and radically incomplete, even though researchers established a long time ago that poverty compromises fetal health and increases the likelihood of poor birth outcomes. We should know that there is something profoundly hypocritical about a state that punishes people who suffer or might suffer poor birth outcomes, but also puts pregnant people whose behavior might lead to poor birth outcomes in jails and prisons, although jails and prisons are unsanitary, health-compromising sites that certainly are not conducive to maternal and therefore fetal health. In conclusion, the policing and criminalization of sex, sexuality, and reproduction did not end after the Comstock Act ceased to be enforced. It didn't end during the reign of Roe vs. Wade. We should simply expect more policing and criminalization in the post-Roe era, and we should expect even more if and when the Comstock Act is enforced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Gregers. And Judge Kinsley, you are up. Thank you so much. Um, before I get started, I want to say um, I spent about a decade of my life in courtrooms across America defending people against Comstock Act charges and what. Um, Andrea Friedman has now taught me to call Little Comstock Act charges. Um, these cases were used to suppress the voices of women and to reinforce negative stereotypes about women, that women are victims, that women are weak, that women need protection. Oftentimes, I was the only woman in the room. And how empowering it is to be here today to flip the script and to be talking about what happened in a way that empowers us and educates us. Thank you very much, Kendra. Thank you, Melissa, for making this happen. Um, so I'm here to talk about the myth of obsolete obscenity, um, to speak to post-Miller obscenity prosecutions under the Comstock Act. I'll specifically be talking about the early 2000s, um, although I'll reference some other time periods as well. Uh, with the rise of brick and mortar retail distribution in the 80s and 90s and later the ubiquity of the internet, it is fair to question what relevance the obscenity clause of the Comstock Act has to First Amendment and the doctrine post-Miller. Uh, perception and reality may not align on this question. So here's the perception, uh, a few quotes. In the escalating war against pornography, pornography has already won. That's from Professor Amy Adler. Today, pornography is ubiquitous and essentially legal from Professor Brian Fry. And this, one of my favorites, um, a hiatus in federal prosecution of obscenity has brought forth the courage in the adult industry to produce extreme sexually explicit products. Any guesses who said that? Senator Orrin Hatch. <laughs> But here's the reality. Uh, it tells a very different story, um, and that obscenity law isn't actually dead and maybe never was. Uh, certain Republican-led administrations, most notably Reagan and George W. Bush administrations, strategically prosecuted obscenity cases to impose a chilling effect on sexually explicit conduct uh, and content. Centralized Department of Justice efforts were initiated um, rather than community-based efforts, and these prosecutions were forum shocked. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then there were Comstock copycats at the state level, and those continue still today. 
here's some numbers that may be of interest to you. These are from 96 to 2007, and you can see a notable spike uh, in the mid-2000s under the Bush administration. Uh, a large unit at the Department of Justice called the Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section received a very large infusion of funding, um, and they were ramping up to prosecute adult-oriented content. That got way late a little bit by 9-11, but you can see in, in 2004 a large spike and prosecutions continued through the late 2000s. Uh, the first one was the Extreme Associates case. This was brought in the Western District of Pennsylvania in 2003. Um, and as an aside, this was actually a case that I handled. Um, Rob Black, who's depicted here, the head of Extreme Associates, went on Nightline, a television program, um, and maybe he didn't get legal advice before he said this. Um, he essentially dared John Ashcroft to prosecute him. John Ashcroft was the Attorney General at the time. He had famously taken office in the Department of Justice by covering up a statute that, that exposed a female breast. Um, and Rob Black says, we've got tons of stuff they technically could arrest us for. I'm not saying I want to be the test case, but I will be the test case. And in fact, he was the test case. Um, the Western District of Pennsylvania, the district court judge, actually dismissed the extreme associates indictment on substantive due process grounds. And when that happened, many people thought that this case was bound for the Supreme Court. But the Third Circuit reversed that decision, reinstated the charges, and the Supreme Court did not take the case. Ultimately, Rob Black and Extreme Associates pled guilty to federal obscenity charges under the Comstock Act, and they served a year in prison. Um, this follows a forum shopping pattern that began in the uh, early 1990s, where the federal government would essentially choose a jurisdiction and intentionally order materials alleged to be obscene into that jurisdiction. It started with the Broken Arrow case in Oklahoma, where the federal government established a fake adult bookstore operated by the federal government in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. They ordered materials um, from an LA film producer into that fake bookstore and then prosecuted uh, the people who distributed the material there. That prosecution was successful. And that, that pattern of um, prosecution continued when the Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section continued its wave of prosecutions under the Comstock Act in the 2000s. Another case that followed this pattern was the Max Hardcore case in Tampa, also a case that I worked on. Um, the federal government ordered materials into Tampa. Big difference between Broken Arrow, Oklahoma and Tampa, Florida. Um, regionally different, demographically different, a much bigger city. And of course, the federal government was trying to send a message by doing this. Um, in the 2000s, it initiated cases in large metropolitan areas, Pittsburgh, Tampa, Phoenix, Washington, D.C., and even Los Angeles. It also progressively prosecuted more and more mainstream content. Um, many people were surprised when the federal government brought a prosecution against John Stagliano who at the time was one of the most mainstream producers of adult-oriented content. Uh, he had material that was shown on HBO and Cinemax at the time. Um, but his case actually backfired for the federal government. It was dismissed by a federal judge saying, I hope the government will learn a lesson from its experience. Essentially, um, the cases started to break down because what the Department of Justice would do is it would set up a post office box or some fake address. It would order the material um, into a place, but it would become very difficult to document who was doing the mailing, who exactly was the person doing the distribution. And in the Stagliano case, the government failed to prove that. It could not connect the dots as to who exactly caused the material to be put into the mail. And then this wave of prosecutions ended officially with the Ira Isaacs case in 2012. That was the last federal Comstock Act indictment um, that resolved by way of plea and a sentence in 2012. Um, but there continue to be copycats at the state level. This is Sheriff Grady Judd of Polk County, Florida. 
Um, he continues to aggressively enforce state obscenity laws. Um, there is also a sheriff in Kansas that does the same. You may have heard uh, back in, I think it was 2007, 2008, about the Halloween costume case in Kansas, um, where uh, an operator of a, one of those pop-up Halloween costume stores was uh, prosecuted for um, selling allegedly obscene Halloween costumes. That case ultimately got dismissed because there was no sexually explicit content um, in, the, in the costumes themselves. Um, but we do see that these cases tend to be clustered geographically in the South and the lower Midwest, and they focus on more brick and mortar distribution outlets rather than the internet. So um, unlike the perception of obscenity law being dead, it is actually very much alive. Um, people were in fact prosecuted to um, a significant degree in the 2000s. Many people went to prison for Comstock Act and so many violations, and uh, the state law copycats continue even through today. Thank you so much. Oh, I will fix my mic after I actually start asking questions. So. We have this incredible panel, and so I'm going to take the liberty of asking a few questions to begin, and then I'll turn it over to our audience, and then I've taken the reserve final question for myself, moderator's privilege. Um, so one thing that I kind of was thinking about through all of your talks is sort of the way in which they, I think, challenge the conventional narratives of both that rights matter or rights don't matter. There's sort of this like interesting thread of how it both did, the law both does and doesn't play into the stories that you're telling. And I'd be curious about, you know, especially because I think this is one of our, you know, not to tip my hand too much, but core themes for today. Um, I'd be curious if y'all could talk about how sort of like kind of the rights guarantees that I teed up the session with, the sort of like story of, oh, we're all set, um, does or doesn't play out in parts of the story that, that you're telling. Um, I'm gonna hand this mic uh, so folks can um, whoever wants to start can go for it. Sure. How do you, like, rights guarantees? Like, the idea sort of uh, play into, and like sort of legal guarantees, um, play into or not play into the story you're telling? I'll, I'll start just by, um, you know, giving a shout out to the reproductive justice framework and, and just by observing that the entire um, intervention of the reproductive justice framework is to say that rights are incredible when one is privileged along, along the lines of race and class and gender identity and nationality and ability and so on and so forth. Um, but rights exist in theory alone and are just really good for patting ourselves on the back um, when one is unprivileged along, you know, one or many of those lines. So, um, you know, just to bring it to a context that everybody talks about these days, the reversal of Roe. Oh, you know, abortion rights were amazing if, you know, you had the means to purchase abortion services in the market. Um, but Roe has existed in theory alone for many, many black people, people of color, undocumented people, people who are survivors of intimate partner violence, um, people who are, you know, uh, trans or non-binary, right? So um, I think that that's just a lesson that we should take as we agitate against the Comstock Act, as we try to um, sort of piece together some semblance of, of reproductive rights in the, in the current era of backlash, we shouldn't be nostalgic for this era that passed. Instead, we need to be actively imagining a better future. I'll add to that um, by saying that a right is only good if you can exercise it. Um, and in the context of obscenity specifically, there's this outlier, what people call outlier case, Stanley versus Georgia, that it is you have a constitutionally protected right to possess and consume obscenity in the privacy of your own home, even illegal obscenity. But the doctrine has never explained how you are to go about exercising that right because you do not have a concomitant right to get the obscenity, to go out and procure it from somewhere. So how is it that you are, it is protected for you. You have a right 
to possess and consume this material in your home, but you literally have no ability to go and get it in the first place. And I think when we're looking at reproductive rights and this modern era and what the Comstock Act means today, it is critical to answer that question. How are we to exercise a right that we have if we literally do not have the means to go out and exercise it? I'm, I'm merely going to echo that in, in the story I was trying to narrate, there was an expectation of First Amendment rights, of religious freedom, of free speech, and time and time again, these religious groups would go before the court to ask for these rights to be guaranteed time and time again, they were dismissed on procedural grounds. So there was a disjunct between expectation and sort of ideas of what rights ought to be with the actual ability to have these enshrined in the practice of the law and guaranteed. And so I, I, just merely echoing, there's often people have a sense of the rights that are far more expensive than what they can actually practice. And I think those disjuncts are very important to Thank you. So I'm actually going to maybe, I'll skip my individual question because I, I feel like there's so much brilliance in this room that I, I'm a little bit tempted to just go straight to that um, and reserve the last question for me. So do we have folks in the room with questions? Yeah. Um. Um. One of the things I've noticed over the last two to three years is this increasing um, uh, propensity by states to pass what I call like Miller with a twist, where they take the Miller test but add the words to a minor at the end, on like the third prong. Um, and it's been used in drag bands, uh, book bands, um, and now they're increasingly being added to these social media regulation bills like Florida's HP3. And to me, like as Roe wasn't overturned in a year, it signals to me like a long term concerted effort to redefine or re like overturn the Miller test into creating some kind of two-prong test. And I guess my question to you all is, you know, what are your thoughts on, on this kind of increasing like reification of the Miller test into state law like that? Um, yeah, so uh, in Ohio, the jurisdiction where I'm a judge, we have that identical law on the books, um, and it has been employed. Uh, I'm familiar with a case where somebody was driving through McDonald's and um, looking looking at content on their phone, and um, the argument made by the prosecution was that that could be seen by a minor, and that is distribution to a minor, right? So I think those, to your point, the purpose of those laws is to really sanitize public distribution, public consumption, um, and really dumb down uh, choice for adults to what we think is suitable for minors or what we think minors should be able to see or consume. Uh, it raises a lot of questions. Um, even when we look at children, it raises a lot of questions. Um, you know, there's the Child Pornography Prevention Act case, Ash Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition, also a case that I worked on. Um, that talks about the difference between you know, young children and older children and what might be developmentally appropriate for them. There's lots of questions here, but you're right, this is what states are doing, and it is an effort to sanitize um, you know, our speech even further. I'll just add, just on a more general level, um, you know, beyond the Miller test, um, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out a way to answer this question without cussing. Um, it's becoming more difficult. It's not becoming more difficult. Um, but people are able to accomplish a lot of regressive things <laughs> when, when they say that they're doing it to protect children. Um, and so just a brief, like a history of the present. Y'all remember critical race theory, like when they first discovered it in 2020? <laughs> like, they said that we needed to protect federal employees from critical race theory, right? So it was a ban on introducing critical race theory to people in the executive branch and administrative agencies, right, federal employees. But that war against critical race theory didn't take off until they said, oh, and actually kindergartners are being exposed to critical race theory as well. K through 12 schools are hotbeds of critical race theory. And it was only when critical race theory, when uh, minors, children, had to be protected from critical race theory, that the war against CRT really being seen 
remaking curricula across the country, book bans, libraries shutting down, right? It was only when it was done for the protection of children. And now we've seen that the work against create CRT has morphed into something against you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion as well, against just like talking about race in public. Um, so all that to say, a lot of very regressive ends are accomplished when we put that tag on to a minor, and we need to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. And the sort of logic of Save Our Children, which goes back to the early 20th century, you see it in anti-gay campaigns, anti-integration campaigns, from integrated schools to anti-bus campaigns that succeeded in, to CRT, to the current drag panic, to the anti-trans backlash. Well, no, they're in the bathrooms. Um, the logic of child protection is one that is about boundary drawing, to say who belongs to the body politic and who can have full social citizenship, and who should be deemed both dangerous to us and therefore needing to be policed, regulated, medicalized, subjugated. And so if we look at laws around abortion and trans rights in Texas, where they're trying to deny, and we're seeing it in Idaho and other places, the logic of the anti-trans bill is if we allow them to have gender-affirming surgery, they won't be able to reproduce. So we are harming these children by not allowing them to have children. And so this language of pronatalism and child protection are deeply folded into each other in our commensurate projects. I'll just add that, of course, we're not talking about all children, <laughs> right? Um, like these are these are racialized children. These are children with gen gender identity, right? Because nobody, hard to cut, hard to cut. Nobody, 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 nobody. I don't have any objections to your cousin. <laughs> nobody cares that children of color who can no longer hear about their histories in yeah. school are experiencing a hostile environment, are being discriminated against by having history sanitized in their part. Nobody cares about those children. Is that it's, you know, the white children who might feel uncomfortable um, if race is talked about. And so speaking about, you know, the bans on gender affirming care um, and bathroom bans, right? Nobody cares about the trans and non-binary children, right, who need access to this health care. Instead, we're protecting presumably cis children um, from being exposed to uh, gender, you know, non-normativity. Um, so again, even though children, this is a universal category, we understand that it's embedded with all sorts of, you know, stratification along lines of race and class and gender and so on. They're fairly racialized and it's symbolic practice because there's no actual welfare being given in sort of a material attempt to help these children to heal their lives, to give them resources, right? In the states where there's all these performances of Save Our Children, what are the incidents of gun violence, child hunger, child poverty, access to resources in the classroom? The, dis the disparateness of that is so stark. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that Jules Gell Peterson has like an incredible book that is all about this history of the transgender child, um, and especially the way whiteness of transgender children is reviewed as plasticity. I'm gonna butcher her theory, so she may correct me later. Uh, so I think that it just speaks like, you know, all of what y'all are saying, I think speaks to this, both like the way in which children is already a racialized category, but like certain children are seen as having potential, um, and that certain children are seen as not, not worthy of that effort. Um, let's go to our next question before I just keep talking about all the wonderful things our other panelists have written. <laughs> Thank you so much. This this panel has been amazing, and I, I feel so so honored to be able to learn from you all. Um, I have a related question, just why my hand's been up for for uh, so long, um, which is you know thinking about the entwinement of these narratives and the way they sort of come together under the umbrella of the Great Replacement Theory, right? That like the the anti-trans legislation um, aimed at at protecting the most valuable asset of white supremacy, which is the reproductive capacity of young white women. Um, and looking at that through what we talk, heard about in the last panel, which was the definitions of sanity in Hicklin and then in Roth, which struck me as really, really different. Where like the Hicklin definition is about depraving or corrupting those whose minds are open to a moral influence, which really resonates with how the narrative works today. And then the Roth definition is about the average person who has prurient interests and who is at risk of having those prurient interests appeal to, which seems like a big deviation in, in narrative and like who is being protected and what they're being protected from. And I wonder how you think about the evolution of, of that question through Hicklin and Roth into today. Fantastic. 
question. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to give you my, my gut reaction. Some of this is about prosecutorial choice and not necessarily the standards. So we've evolved even from Hamlin and Roth now to Miller, which goes even further in empowering the community to make a choice as to what's obscene or not because two of the three pieces of the Miller test are filtered through community standards. What does a community think the average person's prurient interest will be? And a prosecutor literally, on a practical level, picks content and brings it to a jury to say, do you think this is obscene or not in your community? Some of the cases I show you started off with what we could label when the prosecution labeled as quote unquote extreme material because it involved simulated rape, because it involved violence, because it involved excrement, because it was sort of other type content. And that migrated over time to more mainstream content for the stated purpose of scaring people for the stated purpose of silencing any other kind of expression. So to your question, the standard itself is vague enough that it can be employed to the end of silencing the most marginal voices. And that is how it has been employed over time. I hope that helps. Andy has stumped the panel. Uh, it's an excellent question. Do we have other questions from the room? Oh, I think there's one in the way back. Um, for Di I'll, I'll vamp while Di poor Diane has to like sprint across the entire conference. Uh, thank you, Diane. Okay, this might be a little bit off topic, but I don't think it is. Um, when Professor Bridges was talking about how you know they've tagged on a lot with in the in a for a minor, right? I just was thinking about the co-optation of progressive language in a lot of these bills, right? So with abortion, it started out women's health. And like, who could be against women's health? Um, and with, <laughs> and with, with anti-trans bills, it's like y'all were saying, it was protecting the kids, but the way that they tweak language, is it your, if anyone can speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can add Thank you for observing that. I mean, so yes, uh, co-opting the language that progressives, you know, um, have used for regressive ends is kind of like a long-standing practice. And so, you know, uh, exposing children to um, the fact of, you know, human heterogeneity along the lines of sexuality and, and gender is, is called grooming, right? Um, uh, bills that purport to protect fetal life or understand as civil rights bills. Um, I'll also just mention the co-optation of the, of the language of genocide um, in the context of abortion and the Holocaust as well, right? Um, and survivors, like right, we are all survivors of the Holocaust that Roe um, per, you know, perpetrated, that's what they say. Um, so, you know, so there's this long-standing practice of, of co-opting the link. And as, you know, and just like a pet peeve since y'all are here and we're family, um, I'll tell you, like, the co-optation of, like, the reproductive justice framework is, like, maddening to me. Like, all of these organizations purport to do reproductive justice now, but they're still doing the same old work. Um, and so, co-optation of critical race theory, right? It used to be an advanced legal theory that theorized the relationship between law and racism and racial inequality in the post-civil rights era. Now it's anything, <laughs> um, it's everywhere. So um, part of me, so part of, you know, part of me is, is frustrated to no end. Um, the practical part of me wonders if when they take our language, we need to, we need to just create a new language um, but part of me is like, no, but we worked hard for that framework, you know, for the past 40 years critical race theory, for the past 30 years reproductive justice, like it's ours and, and I don't want to abandon it. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really know um, what to, to do about it. But I also know that just, just 
beyond the sort of rhetorical violence of it, there's also like a practical um, danger involved in the co-optation of our language. And just as a final example, I'll just note like the language of discrimination, right? Racial discrimination. Like it used to be like a, a framework for thinking about how historically marginalized groups remain burdened, right, by laws. And now the way that it has flipped it's like even historically dominant groups can, can claim the mantle of discrimination and use it to silence right, efforts towards you know, racial equity or justice or something like that. So um, I think that the answer is to just embed, specifically the, the term discrimination, just embed it like an insistence upon recognizing power and power differential. Um, and that has to be a component of discrimination, that has to be a component of grooming, that has to be a component of civil rights. And um, efforts that seek to uh, I don't know, redistribute power um, should not be understood as discrimination, should not be understood as grooming, should not be understood as uh, anti-civil rights. I don't know, I think that there has to be some sort of attention to power dynamics, um, historical and present. I think we have time for one more audience question. Um, let's go up here, if that's okay. Yeah. Yep. Hello, mine's for uh, Professor Bridges. Um, uh, first off, I, I found it amazing that you're worried about cursing on an anti obscenity panel. It's great. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I, I was really taken by the, the story you shared of the woman who was prosecuted. Um, after attempting suicide uh, while pregnant. Um, and I'm wondering um, uh, if and how uh, pregnancy criminalization and um, mental health pathology um, interact. Because um, I'm more familiar with like, Robert Burton sort of like after pregnancy, but I'd be interested to hear more about like during pregnancy. Oh gosh, so for the uninitiated, even though I'm pretty sure everybody in the room should be initiated on this, just that 99% of the people um, who have abortions um, report feeling amazing afterwards. Um, very few regret their abortions. Um, um, it is uh, being able to obtain a wanted abortion um, is predictive of future mental health, right? So that's just important to establish. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit in response to your question about the litigation over Imtala, um, because what really mind-blowing to me, for me, was the oral argument um, in which the... I'm sorry to interrupt. Could I ask you to do like two sentences on what the litigation is and what it's about for okay. folks who don't, aren't following as closely? Sure, sure, sure. So um, the litigation is Moyle versus uh, United States and Idaho versus United States. Um, it's about whether EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Act, um, passed during the Reagan administration, um, what uh, requires in states that ban abortion to require abortion services if those abortions are necessary to essentially conserve not just the health of the pregnant person, but also the life of the pregnant person, right? So, so Idaho, for example, may, uh, has an abortion ban that makes no exceptions for um, conserving abortions that are necessary to conserve health. They have a life exception, but they don't have a health exception. In Tala, <laughs> the natural and, and historical understanding of Impala is that Impala requires emergency rooms to provide medical care in order to not just conserve life, but also to conserve health. And so the question is whether there is um, a conflict between those laws, whether the federal law preempts state law, and therefore, even in states that ban abortions that are necessary to conserve health, Impala requires them to, to provide those abortions um, in their emergency rooms. Um, and the reason that I thought of the Moyle versus U.S. and Idaho versus U.S. litigation in, in light of this question was that there is this, this fear amongst Idaho, but then also amongst Solicitor General Elizabeth Kolodra, who had to respond to these fears, that that health exception is not just to conserve physical health, but also to conserve mental health. Right, because Idaho was saying, oh my God, if health is mental health, well then anybody can just walk into an emergency room and say, 
I'm going to kill myself without an abortion, and then the emergency room is going to have to provide it. And then Elizabeth Kaloger was like, no, 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 no. This is just physical health, it's not mental health. Someone can't walk into an emergency room and say, I'm just going to kill myself if I don't have an abortion and get it. And I was like, what a bizarre argument to have to make. Because wouldn't it be incredible if we were able to get abortions for any reason whatsoever? But even if they're like restricted to health, why wouldn't our mental health count? Why wouldn't it be as significant as our physical health? So um, as we think about this world that we want to create, right? This world that never existed. We're not nostalgic for the old one, but this world that we want to create. Um, it has to be a world in which mental health is not um, subordinate to physical health. It has to be one in which they are equal and that we can't dichotomize those things because, I mean, to separate mind and body um, is, is a fallacy. I think that's what Descartes said. Um, so, so, yeah. <laughs> Of course, they're drawn from a larger history where psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists and allied professions pre row I mean, certainly some were hostile to women and were used in abortion committees to pathologize them and say, no, actually, you're trying to evade your reproductive destiny. But in many cases, California, which was one of the notable exceptions, basically became conduits to opening up and liberalizing abortion laws. Mental health became a pathway to enable and to recognize that it, it's sort of a capacious notion of health physical, mental, expansive. And so it wasn't just the threat of suicide, but the overall emotional well-being. You can see a bunch of statements coming out of all sorts of reproductive rights groups, religious groups, thinking about the total circumstances of the person as a prerequisite to it. So once you open the realm of the mental, that can include economic, social, which is a gateway to basically what they now pejoratively call abortion on demand. And they're looking to them, sort of winnow away the possibilities, whether it's travel, whether it's health, whether it's mental health, whether it's sort of access to information, all of the old routes to gaining access and creating just little little ways to these expansive dragnets. They're trying to just close all those historic loopholes. This is what I see when they start targeting mental health. That was one of the major pathways for many, many people to get access to vital health care services. All right, so I have one last question for our panel. And of course, I feel like we have these historical panels and we're all talking about the present also, you know. Uh, but y'all are our last sort of panel that sort of thinks about the kind of historical moment um, before we sort of move more firmly to the present. And I'm wondering if there are lessons from the folks that, from the folks who practice resistance in the stories that y'all share, right, in the context you've studied that we should bring forward with us as we move to, move to our present whoever wants to go first. I'll start. Um, I'll, just, I'll just observe that um, I, my, my presentation was about substance use during pregnancy, and um, I see so much resistance um, in that space. Um, you know, simply, you know, talking about language, right, um, the refusal of the, you know, pathologization of, of drug use, right? We don't need to talk about addiction. We don't need to talk about substance use disorders even. We can just talk about drug users. Um, and, and while recognizing there's a spectrum of drug use with some drug use being chaotic and others, you know, not being um, a, a problem even. Um, so I see resistance. Um, a re uh, I would also talk about a reclaiming of drug use from medical, you know, medical, medical paradigms um, that necessarily uh, pathologize them um, and sort of reclaiming it, demedicalizing it. I see that, but all of these resistances that I see are taking place on the ground um, through community organizations, um, through this movement organizing. Um, and so let that be a lesson for us um, that we cannot rely on our institutions that purport to represent us. Let us, that be a lesson that we can't rely on even like the big, well-funded, you know, nonprofit industrial complex. Let us, let us know, let that be a lesson that we can only rely on us in order to move us towards this future that we're all trying to build together. Um, I'll share the story of Karen Fletcher. Uh, she was a woman who lived outside of Pittsburgh and was one of the people prosecuted under the George W. Bush administration under the Comstock Act. 
She had been a victim of um, a sex offense when she was a young girl and became extremely agoraphobic, rarely left her house. But in order to reclaim her story and to personally heal, she began writing a blog. Um, which was fictionalized, but described graphic sexual acts that were occurring to fictionalized children. Uh, she was prosecuted under the Comstock Act um, for those stories. She sold ad space uh, on the side of her blog, making, I don't know, five, six, seven dollars a month, something in that vein. Um, and she um, tried to negotiate a plea deal that would put her on house arrest so that she did not have to overcome her agoraphobia in order to go to federal prison. That was rejected and she did serve time in federal prison. So I think she's one of the victims and maybe um, heroes of, of that time period given her personal story. I, I guess as I think about the stories of struggles for religious freedom in the past, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we're in a very different legal paradigm now where things like RIFRA rule the day, where religious exceptions through Hobby Lobby and such like have allowed groups to opt out of the social contract and to deny rights to others under the auspices of religious freedom, whether it's giving a wedding cake or providing contraception. But in recent weeks, Indiana recognized a religious right to access abortion through the advocacy of groups on the ground there. And it's a carve out that's remarkable using RIFRAs to offer a possibility to guarantee information, medical access. Now, is this an ideal scenario of like a sort of further erosion of the establishment clause? Not especially. But when you're sort of against the wall, you have to use whatever tools you have available to you as a starting point. If the possibility of a unitarian sort of religious view neutralizing a sort of evangel deeply conservative evangelical and conservative Catholic prescription that nobody should have abortion is the way to go. Perhaps there's a lesson to be learned from that. It's hard to predict what will come out of it, but it seems that these older tools are being revitalized now in any way, shape, or form to just sort of broaden the window of access just to crack to allow people. I'm not sure if that's a lesson or so much as a diagnosis of the desperate circumstances we're in. Well, on that note, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, all right, let's, uh, yes, let us do a round of applause for our incredible. <laughs> and then we're gonna take that 15 minute break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about the dire circumstances. We're gonna be talking about uh, the ongoing haunting. We'll see you back at 2.45.
somewhat truncated versions of their very impressive bios. Um, and then we'll get to the good stuff. Uh, immediately to my right is Amy Littlefield. Uh, she's the abortion access correspondent for The Nation and a freelance journalist who has covered reproductive health care for more than a decade. Her work has appeared in many, many publications, and she's currently writing a book about how we lost Roe versus Wade. Um, <laughs> just a short, just a little, like two paragraphs, right? Um, <laughs> then we have Nancy Cardenas Pena, who was born and raised in the Texas border community of the Rio Grande Valley. Many of y'all know her work from the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, where she organized against the criminalization of pregnancy outcomes, state-sanctioned violence through militarization, and worked on immigrant deportation defense cases. She served on the boards of Repro Action and the Frontera Fund, and is an abortion storyteller with the Testify. She's currently the campaign director at Abortion on Our Own Terms. Well, see. And Mary Virgin Roberts is a low-income, black, queer, disabled, grassroots, reproductive justice act activist, freelance writer, doula, aspiring midwife, and mother. <laughs> she is the co-founder and executive director of the Mississippi Reproductive Freedom Fund, which provides direct funding and practical support for abortion access, emergency contraception, birth control, community-based sex education, parenting, and no strings, no stigma pregnancy support, regardless of pregnancy outcome. Public learning. So, um, this is a really powerful group of folks who can share firsthand stories from the ground um, and offer context on the ways in which Comstock still haunts us today. Um, you know, in many ways, Comstock is not a moaning ghost in a remote castle, uh, but instead a poltergeist, smashing dishes, possessing television sets, and simply terrorizing us where we live and where we ought to feel the safest in our homes, in our home states, in abortion-friendly states, and in abortion-hostile states, against our will and without our consent. The legacy of Comstock regimes that we've heard about throughout the day are live issues still. The criminalization, policing, and prosecuting, prosecution of pregnant people, pregnancy outcomes, and importantly, also of families and parenthood, especially for black, indigenous, and people of color, are rooted in anti-blackness, white supremacy, white nationalism, and white Christian patriarchy. And they are being expanded and weaponized even today. Nancy and Lori will speak to what they're seeing from their own experiences in Texas and Mississippi, while Amy will relay what she's seen from her careful and thoughtful reporting for the nation and elsewhere. So, Amy, my first question is for you, which is, who is behind the continuing Comstock haunting today? Who are, who are the bad guys? Thank you so much. Um, what an honor to be on this very esteemed panel, and thank you to the organizers um, for this incredibly thoughtfully produced conference. And I also want to take a moment to thank the student encampment here at Harvard, which, yes, made the decision to end today their encampment, their very brave encampment after the university suspended 20 students, many of whom immediately lost their housing. One of the lessons I'm taking away from this conference is that moments of righteous resistance and protest often go hand in hand with violent repression. Um, and the students and their actions against you know, these horrifying images we've all seen on social media of police with batons invading college campuses, I think is a haunting reminder to us of another takeaway from this conference, which is Comstock exists in both liberal regimes and conservative ones. So the folks I'm gonna be talking about today are right-wing figures, they're conservatives, who are very intentionally bringing about what I think is kind of a reinvention of Comstock. Um, but that is not in any way to suggest, um, as we've learned from the historians here today, that, that uh, conservatives have a monopoly on Comstock rape. Um, so I've been working on a book about the anti-abortion movement, which means I've been spending a lot of time talking with Mark Lee Dixon and to a lesser extent with Jonathan Mitchell. The two of them and their brains fused together have created what I think is sort of the closest thing we have to a modern day embodiment of Anthony Comstock himself. Um, Jonathan Mitchell is the legal brain behind the reinvention resurgence of Comstock. Mark Lee Dixon is the on the ground, 
you know, working 24-7, living on the road, ambassador of his Comstockian ideas. Um, so I actually asked Mark Lee Dixon last week, and I'm gonna, I'll give you the bios of them, but I wanna kick off with a quote from Mark. Um, I told him I was gonna be speaking to a room full of um, very illustrious scholars, activists, and journalists who disagree completely with his project and are doing everything possible to undo it. And I was like, what would you say to them, Mark? <laughs> um, and he said, that he wanted me to tell you all that Anthony Comstock was doing what he was doing because his heart was moved over the value of human life. Okay, so I'm just, I want to just ask the historians to, I thought this was such a striking quote, I wanted to start with it because, um, and I'm looking at the historians here, they're like in a row, um, to just fact check me here, and I'm going to use a, a scholarly, pretty advanced term. Is, am I right in saying this is, in fact, um, utter bullshit? <laughs> okay, good, yeah. Um, because in reading, um, particularly Reba Siegel, Siegel and Mary Ziegler's analysis, right, of um, Comstockery and its origins, the anti-abortion movement as we know it today did not exist back then. Um, okay, thank you for the historians nodding. It's just making me feel so good. <laughs> The abortion was not even defined the way that we define it today. It was more akin to a miscarriage. Um, the, you know, we have heard about the fact that there was a panic over white Protestant women not having enough kids, over you know, recently liberated, um, formerly enslaved people uh, potentially having kids, um, over waves of immigrants um, from countries like Ireland having kids. Okay, this was the backdrop to Comstock, who was a man who, as we have heard, carried around a suitcase full of dildos and could not stop himself from masturbating and decided, as a result, to purge all the pornography from the city of New York. So that's my understanding of Comstock. Um, so I think what we're seeing basically is an attempt to reinvent Comstockery in the context of our present day anti-abortion movement. Um, Mary and Riva talk about how there's an attempt to redefine the Comstock Act as an anti-abortion law, even though it was not intended that way, of course, as an anti-vice law. And I think what Mark and Jonathan are trying to do, especially Mark, is reinvent the person of Anthony Comstock himself as a present-day anti-abortion activist, um, rather than what he was, which was, you know, an anti-vice crusader, who, as you heard in his own words earlier today, was obsessed with um, the idea that sex for pleasure is leading to the disintegration of society. Um, so very, very briefly, just to talk about who Mark Lee Dixon and Jonathan Mitchell are, um, and then Nancy will speak, I'm sure, very powerfully to the impact of their work on the ground in Texas. Um, Mark Lee Dixon is born in um, East Texas. His grandfather is the president of Right to Life of East Texas. He has early memories of being at the county fair where his grandfather would display these fetal models. Um, if you've read Jennifer Holland's book, Tiny You, you know, she talks about how powerfully the anti-abortion movement capitalized on these images to sort of help people form an identification with the fetus. And this worked swimmingly in Mark's case. He formed this identification with the fetus. He saw in it a small version of himself. Um, he would later go into struggle, trigger warning for suicide content, to struggle with depression um, and suicidal ideation. And he lost several friends to suicide. He sees a connection between the idea of abortion and someone deciding the worth of another person in his view and um, the idea that that leads us to a sort of societal carelessness that's a slippery slope to suicide. Um, he becomes a pastor, starts preaching outside an abortion clinic in Shreveport, Louisiana in 2019, becomes concerned that um, the, an anti-abortion law in Louisiana is gonna send patients into Wascom, Texas. He works with the city council there in Wascom, Texas to try to pass what he calls the Sanctuary City for the Unborn Initiative, co-opting the term used by immigrants' rights activists. Um, and 
but he, there's a problem, right, which is that he knows the city's going to get sued into oblivion for doing something that's unconstitutional. So he calls up a member of the state legislature, Brian Hughes, who connects him to Jonathan Mitchell, a legal mastermind and former solicitor general of Texas. The three of them get on a conference call from the parking lot of a Chick-fil-A, which is Markley Dixon's favorite restaurant. <laughs> and they hatch an idea to, um, Jonathan Mitchell's innovation is to tack on a private civil bounty hunter enforcement mechanism to this city ordinance that will mean that instead of city officials enforcing it, um, private citizens will enforce the abortion ban in this city and therefore no one will be able to sue to preemptively stop it because there won't be anybody to sue. Um, it works, Mark spreads the gospel of this ordinance all over Texas. Um, it passes in Lubbock where there's actually an abortion clinic and where it succeeds in shutting down abortions at a Planned Parenthood. Um, and then it's implemented on a state level in the form of SB8, the six week Texas abortion ban that ends up eliminating most abortions in Texas nine months before the Dobbs decision. After the Dobbs decision, Mitchell and Dixon reprise their partnership and they start seeding Marx ordinances with the Comstock Act. So the Comstock Act now, the, the ordinances now have a provision that says the Comstock Act in its literal interpretation is implemented in the cities and counties where this ordinance is passed. They use this along a large swath of eastern New Mexico to try to prevent clinics from relocating to that area. What they're hoping to do with this is tee up a situation where the Supreme Court takes up the question of whether the Comstock Act is a de facto nationwide ban on legal abortion. And that is where we are today. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Um, so Nancy, what's that actually look like for you and the folks in your communities in Texas and the folks that you serve and look up? <laughs> is it good? I mean, can, can everyone hear me, first of all? I, okay, cool. Um, that's a very big question. Uh, I think it's really, really important to create a foundation of what things have been like, not just post SB8, but I mean, I think for Texas, there it was a very, very long road of restriction after restriction after restriction, um, and then of course, no in-clinic abortion care uh, left in the state of Texas. And so for a lot of communities throughout the state of Texas, uh, these resources were incredibly limiting, uh, limited. Uh, their options were very limited. They already were though. Um, I think when you're looking at areas like, for example, where I live, which is the Rio Grande Valley, um, that there are folks at the intersection of immigration and reproductive health care doing this work, uh, but it's a lot of mixed status families. So a lot of folks who need access to health care who are undocumented, but cannot get past the surveillance, the enforcement of so many different mechanisms, uh, which is police, ICE, Border Patrol, and National Guard in these areas. Um, and folks who are undocumented cannot leave these border communities. Uh, so especially in the Rio Grande Valley, it's kind of like a, like a bubble where we have internal immigration checkpoints 100 miles in, uh, where people will stop and ask you if you're a citizen or not, where you're going, what you're doing. And so I, I think it's also really interesting when we're talking about these like different ordinances or resolutions that are passing um, statewide about like travel bans and checkpoints because as we are talking about the impact of abortion restrictions, we have to acknowledge how deeply tied they are to oppressions of other movements. And with immigration, we've long seen these like checkpoints, these like random immigration stops of people, um, especially brown and black folks who are living on the ground in Texas, who constantly get asked where they're going, what they're doing, and set themselves up for deportation proceedings. Um, and so with anti-abortion restrictions and with anti-immigration restrictions, a lot of the conversations, of course, where, you know, is this legal, is this not, what do I do, where do I go for care, who do I talk to about this? And so there are ongoing conversations where 
people no longer relied on formal infrastructure because the infrastructure was just simply not there. Um, but with activists and people who were doing this work for a really long time as pillars of information in their community. And so for a really long while, I've been getting lots of questions around like, what does that care look like? What can I do? And it's been organizing at that intersection where we also acknowledge that immigration restrictions really harm people's ability to be able to get those reproductive health care services. A lot of the situations we were facing was immigration was, you know, on the way to someone's appointment at a health care center, or like immigration was off route to where people were usually going to get, you know, their abortion care appointment. And it was having a lot of these like intentional conversations and organizing around what that sort of surveillance looked like. And so, of course, like, you know, as someone who had a self-managed abortion, that was the best option for me. But I understand that my story is a reflective of what, you know, everyone chooses to do in regards to their pregnancy. And so for areas like the Rio Grande Valley, for areas, um, you know, all across Texas, um, self-managed abortion, medication abortion is sometimes the only option people have left, which is why it's extremely concerning, these conversations that we're having. Um, and so I think that's sort of the tip of what we're seeing. It's this increased surveillance and this cat and mouse game we keep playing with the state around like trying to circumvent state policies at the local level and then they do something and they don't. It's exhausting, it's tiring. I think this is a long overdue conversation. But with no in-clinic abortion care left in the state of Texas, a lot of people are now more than ever talking about self-managed abortion and we're answering lots of questions and conversations while the state is continuously playing a role in trying to restrict and limit that access to information and resources. Yeah, and the thing that strikes me, particularly, that seems particularly nouveau Comstockian, perhaps, right, is that this cat and mouse game is not purely between Texans and the state apparatus or Texans and the border apparatus, but it's also meant to foment fear between and among Texans ourselves, right? We're supposed to fear the bounty hunter neighbors. We're supposed to be afraid of the abusive exes, right? Like this whole apparatus is meant to create quiet, private, small terrors, right? And that's something that I think, um, you know, the, that sort of low key fear is something that repro activists everywhere, and in Texas in particular, um, have a lot to learn from other movements where folks are familiar with the ways that that manifests in other areas. Yeah, and, and I think it's really interesting to also bring that up because, you know, with a lot of immigration cases that we see, it's, it also is a very critical mechanism of enforcement where people report other people for their immigration status. Um, and, and we see it with all sorts of entities, whether they'd like to whether intentional or not, put people in harm's way of that criminalization. And so this like bounty law aspect of SB has long been used uh, for criminalization and oppression with the immigration movement. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important conversation to have. Lori. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta hear me, right? Yeah. Because I'm really loud without a mic. What are y'all seeing in Mississippi? And um, I'm particularly interested in hearing um, about the sort of the totality and the reach of the work that y'all are doing at Mississippi Reproductive Freedom Fund because it goes so much farther than just abortion access. But it is touched by all of this Comstocky nonsense as well, right? Well, definitely because we do comprehensive sex ed in the community, and one of the reasons we do it in the community is because if you've never heard, in Mississippi, it is illegal to demonstrate a condom in classrooms, and it is illegal to hand out condoms to teenagers on school property. So we're already living in like a Comstockian kind of world, already. You know, already they just tried to outlaw uh, being able to change your license if you're trans. Um, Mississippi's been on a roll. Uh, <clears throat> we tend to be the worst at everything good and the best at everything bad. <laughs> and <laughs> I love my state, I do, but I swear it's the truth. Um, 
what we've seen a lot of is folks who don't didn't plan on being pregnant wouldn't have planned to stay pregnant who now need diaper services who now need formula who now need you know everyone talks about this baby boom from the pandemic but it's like the pandemic and the end of row segue segue you can't take one out of context from the other right and in a state like Mississippi, it's been a post-row existence in Mississippi for most people in that state for decades. Um, the way that we do our work as far as helping people access care has not really changed, right? We help people get to their appointments, we give people money to get their appointments, we teach about SMA, you know, we have abortion doulas, we're doing the same work, it's just that now everything is more dangerous. And we know that like there are lawmakers just itching to misuse current laws. Uh, Lynn Finch, if you don't remember any other name, I tell you that, remember Lynn Finch. She's our attorney general, and she has described taking away abortion rights as empowering women. That's her women empowerment program. I wanna get into this sort of co-optation, I think, of language. I, I'm, well, please would be the wrong word. I appreciate you bringing up Litfish um, because I wanted to talk about um, her sort of ideological mini Comstock partner in crime, Pat Paxton in Texas, but an, an all time cuss word. Um, and talk about how uh, these state apparatuses, these, these mostly Republican politicians, although we've seen how Democrats uplift a lot of this stuff too, it can be sort of trapped into going along with a lot of this stuff or enthusiastically supporting it, who knows, um, especially when it comes to young people and supposedly protecting children, right? Um, Amy, I wonder if you can talk about um, some of the sort of like reddest red flag moments or initiatives from any of these sort of actors that, that really stand out to you as like emblematic of the ongoing Comstock content. Yeah. So um, I have in my lap here um, Markley Dixon and Jonathan Mitchell's latest ordinance um, proposed for the city of Clarendon, Texas. Um, it's 17 pages long. Um, it includes several provisions, including making abortion pills contraband, declaring any organization that aids or abets an elective abortion by using the mails or any article or thing designed, adapted, or intended for producing an abortion. Sorry, why is that language familiar? <laughs> oh yeah, that's the Comstock Act. Um, a criminal organization. It bans abortion on a resident of Clarendon regardless of where it takes place. So some of you all may have heard about this effort to like ban abortions on city residents, regardless of whether they happen in the city. It also bans what they call abortion trafficking, which means using the road to travel through a place. So, um, and tries to stop, this is a relatively new one, tries to stop fetal remains from being transported through the city because Mark has identified a waste management company that is in Texas. So they're going after like the person driving you to the appointment, the car, the, the roads you're using, the waste management company. Um, and all of this is under the civil private enforcement bounty hunter, you know, mechanism that was used to make SB8 basically court proof, right? Um, and I talked to Mark, Mark was really psyched about this Clarendon ordinance because Clarendon is a city that was founded by a charismatic preacher in 1878, I believe, um, on the principles of Christianity and temperance. Um, alcohol was not allowed to be consumed there until 2013. Um, and he was very excited about this sort of being a place that I think feeds into this imaginary reality that like America has always been a white Christian nation, right? So there's a plaque about the founding of Clarendon that makes no mention of the native peoples that lived in the Texas Panhandle who would have had to be pushed out of the way for this 
white Christian temperance community to be founded there. Um, and I think Mark was really psyched about the resonance between the history of this place and this 17-page ordinance. Um, but what just happened is that the city of Clarendon voted against this ordinance, three to zero. The city council actually shot it down, which I think is a testament to the resistance of organizations like Nancy's um, pushing back um, against this project. So I would say that's kind of a red flag for me. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Y'all have anything to? I was just going to say Mississippi tried to pass an abortion trafficking bill this year. They wouldn't have made it illegal for to help a minor at all unless they had both their parents' permission. So it basically reinstitutes the parental notification laws that we had under Roe, but then also adds this extra layer of co-opting real language around trafficking because this is their thing. Everything's child trafficking now. Right? Everybody's a groomer, like, you know, like Professor Bridges said, it's, it's grooming or, or, or trafficking. And, um, and I think about that a lot, about how they're flipping these words and it and it's, makes some of these liberals so scared to stand up for what they know they should be standing up for, which is abortion rights and people's freedoms. But, you know, if there's one long Tom Stackian uh, relic, it would be abortion stigma. I feel like one of the best things that one of the things that he did best was leave us with this stigma of abortion being dirty, dangerous, um, non non womanly, like all of these things. Um, so yeah. Um, Nancy, this one's hard for you, but any anyone feel free to jump in. Um, you know, it's, I'm glad you brought up that the town didn't go for it, right? Um, in fact, lots of these cities don't go for this proposed ordinance or legislation, right? Even the little backwoods places like my hometown, right? Like, it's, it's sometimes you can't get three city council members on board, right? Um, so Nancy, I wonder if you could sort of talk about the power differential and the goal differential between the actors, the Ken Paxton's, the Mitchells, the Mark Lee Dixons, who are sort of organizing these very top-down, sort of shrubbing the stuff down our throats, versus our actual communities, which are not amenable to these things. They are often resistant to these things, right? And that, that sort of disparity between the perception of what it must be like from the outside versus who's actually on the ground, how we live, what we do, what we need. That's a, that's a really good question. And I, I will preface this by saying that I am not an attorney, and no offense to all of the legal folks in the room, but I sincerely believe that conversations about criminalization don't have to happen with just legal folks, yeah. and that the people who are directly impacted are experts of their own stories and they can talk about the very real effects of like how all of this goes. And I think people really underestimate communities. I think people really underestimate how communities and how resilient they are, even though of course it, it feels like we shouldn't have to be so resilient and we should absolutely be in a space where we have all of these different types of services provided. but. You know, that's not the case. That's probably not gonna be the case for a really long time and the work continues. But having really honest conversations with people about what's happening, and I think it goes back to some like very basic values. People want healthcare. People don't wanna to go to jail. People care about their loved ones. People don't wanna see them in these situations. And these are sort of the values that we keep reiterating in these communities, even when it comes to self-managed abortion, even when it comes to medication abortion. Um, I think they, it is work that also doesn't happen overnight. Um, I think when I was talking a little earlier about how community activists are pillars of information in a lot of communities across the United States is because there is no reliance on formal healthcare systems. Because of restrictions and criminalization, we have a lot of providers who leave areas and they don't come back. Um, and so it's definitely, I think, just in underestimating all of these different types of communities and 
you know, we, we have this type of ordinance pop up in the city of Edinburgh, which is in the Rio Grande Valley, and we organized hundreds of folks to show up and testify against it. Uh, I, I got booed when, during my testimony, and I felt like I was in high school again. Um, Mark was in the crowd, uh, but it was it was just really interesting because I, I think, like I said, it is this dedication and continuation of very honest conversations that we have to have with our community, and they have these like very heartfelt values in mind. Uh, and I, I think one of the things that we've seen, especially since the fall of Roe, is that folks who never wanted to engage in these conversations with us before. You know, like our community, we, we live now with black and brown folks first and foremost. That's like what we do at her. But the amount of white women who have like come out of the woodwork because they couldn't get their abortion and now they feel some kind of way. I'm saying if that's the only way you get to the movement, I mean, we'll, I take I, I, I mean, it's an easier way you can just listen. But I mean, if that's the only way that's going to get people willing to have these conversations in ways that aren't oh, well, I support Trump, so therefore I want to outlaw all abortions. That's not what I'm seeing on the ground. It's what I'm seeing on the ground is that over, what, what we know from polling and what we know from working on the ground is that overwhelmingly people don't want abortion bans and overwhelmingly people want the government to be out of their bedroom and out of their business. Um, and so I always think about how these Comstock fans think that they're going to be able to like institute this and like, keep it Keep it up. Does that mean so like how how y'all planning on holding everybody down for so long? Because you can only do it for so long before you have to see power. Well, I was thinking about that because of the um, work that y'all did getting water to folks, right? And, and still do, right? Um, and like that is true community building. Folks may come to you via needing water, but then they're gonna stay for everything else wonderful they all offer, right? Versus the Mark Lee Dixons and the Jonathan Mitchells that are just rolling through, you know, the, the interstate in West Texas or, or Eastern New Mexico, dropping their, their little Comstock bombs and scooting off, right? And for folks who don't know why I would be getting water, the people in Jackson, Mississippi, like in 2021, we had six weeks with no water. No pile of water in the whole entire, well, most of the city, it wasn't the whole entire city, but it was most of the city. Um, and that disproportionately affected the black residents of, this, of Jackson and the poor residents of Jackson. So it's all connected, right? The same people that they don't care about as far as when we were talking earlier about how they don't care about our kids, it's the same thing when it comes to water. No, I mean, I mean, I think that and this is just something that I was going to note. Like it, in Edinburgh, it, it was the same type of conversation, and I and I think that's what also made sort of our argument much stronger is that we were a part of these communities, we were born and raised in these communities, and folks who were trying to craft these ordinances were going to bounce right after the hearing, and you're never going to hear them again. Uh, the city is going to face lots of lawsuits, and these people are just going to go about doing their own thing. And so, so I think there's a lot of like striking similarities and also with immigration cases where, you know, I there's this saying that I often use in Spanish uh, whenever I'm talking to people, which is chisme saves lives. <laughs> it's like gossip saves lives. And I think these like intimate personal conversations that people have door to door with their family members in community centers and places of worship in like pulgas or flea markets, because that, that's commonly where folks like to get down uh, in the Rio Grande Valley. I think it's just like very good hubs of information and resource where we start off with one thing and understand and accept that people lived, you know, multiple lives, immigration status, needs healthcare, um, probably with, with our utilities. And we start these conversations and that's how we open up to talking about you know, many more services like self managed abortion. Um, Amy, a question for you. Um, I, I still, I continue to be struck by Jonathan Mitchell getting caught telling the New York Times that he hopes Trump never talks about Comstock. Um, because the, the dichotomy between Mark Lee Dixon, who's out there just hollering as loud as the MFR can, 
every day about this stuff, and Jonathan Mitchell is sort of like machinating behind the scenes with this little glass of bourbon, right? <laughs> it's it's this uh, you know a promotion and obfuscation. Like, how do you see this manifest, especially in you know the way it's covered in the media, and how do you sort of approach reporting on this stuff um, when you know some of it is pretty sensitive, right? Yeah, I mean, I have no doubt that if Jonathan Mitchell said that to the New York Times on the record, he did it strategically. Like, I think he's very, like, <laughs> careful about what he says to the press and very strategic in everything that he does. He told me um, that basically he had been eyeing the Comstock Act for a long time um, and that he had his fingers crossed that nobody was going to mention it before the Supreme Court took up the Dobbs case because he thought maybe if the Supreme Court and other folks noticed that there was what he sees as a de facto nationwide abortion ban lurking on the books, that they might be hesitant to overturn Roe v. Wade. And in fact, he got his wish, because when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, they mentioned all of the Victorian era abortion bans, but they did not mention Comstock. Um, and so now, of course, his goal is to get the Supreme Court to weigh in on Comstock um, before the composition of the court changes. Um, whereas, yeah, you have Mark Lee Dixon out there. You know, I, I keep trying to get Mark to say something critical about Anthony Comstock, especially because, like, Mark's main issue is suicide. And I'm like, this is an anti-vice crusader who drove at least 15 people to suicide and then bragged about it. Like, are you sure you want to lean in to like this guy? And he's like, anti-vice crusader, that kind of sounds like Batman. You know, he's just like fully going for it. And so, yeah, they are sort of like an odd couple. But I just, I think like, what I'm trying to do is like, look at their success which is a morally bankrupt success, right? But nevertheless, they've achieved something significant and try to understand what we can learn from it, right? Which is partly about like, you just need someone who's gonna be your grassroots, just like grit and determination and someone who is, you know, this legal mastermind. Um, and, and so the two of them work really effectively together as a team. I'm sure they're short on funding too, right? Like they don't have any funding. <laughs> I know that tends to be an issue on our side of the <laughs> equation. I'm sure that they're so underfunded. Well, Lori, you read my mind. Um, I would love to hear from you. What does it look like to do this work, to rebuke and repudiate these attacks with limited resources in a world where resources need not be limited? What does that look like for y'all, and how can how can folks support? Yeah, it often feels like being the abortion gatekeeper. Like nobody comes to the work that we do wanting to be the gatekeeper of other people's abortions, right? Like I don't want to be the person who has to say we're out of money, or there's no one who can help you because there's some you know aid in a bed law. I don't. I don't want to have to be the person who stands in the way of someone exercising their rights. You know, we always want to make sure we're uplifting folks to get to where they need to go. So the thing that's been interesting for us is right leading up to Dobbs, there was a ton of rage giving in case anybody has a hurt. And then at, and I, it reminded me of when Trump got elected because we got the money that I called, oh shit, Trump got elected. <laughs> right? And it was kind of the same thing. Oh shit, there's not going to be any abortion anymore in the South. We better make sure that people can get their abortions now. Okay, but now we're two years out. How are people supposed to get their abortions? Where's the money at? And I ain't saying that to y'all individual people necessarily. I'm saying from donors, donors with money, who sit on that money and hoard it. It's time to get up off. Get up off the shit. I told y'all I was one of those. <laughs> Um, yeah. Amen. Uh, Nancy, same question to you. How can folks support uh, the work you're doing in Texas? So, I mean, I, I think the work 
uh, the abortion on our own terms campaign looks a little bit different right now. So, so the question is is different. Like I, I think whenever we're having conversations about what's helpful and what's not helpful, I always like this isn't like very crafted. Uh, it's sort of the conversations that I feel are reappearing are sort of conversations around the formalization of self-managed abortion or the medicalization of self-managed abortion that um, really makes me very, very, very nervous. Um, and as also someone who didn't rely on US healthcare systems for a really, really long time and had to resort to a lot of different things, uh, it's, it's always really, really interesting to hear how people access healthcare within the United States. And I think I always like to sort of place a question on people who are doing this work, and it's, do you want to continue the way that we are building a world where a court decision completely topples people's access to healthcare? Do we want to continue organizing and building a world where a politician can tell us what we can do or what we can't do, or someone has complete control over that. And I think something that has definitely given me a lot of hope in these conversations is talking to community support networks, international groups who have been doing this work for a really long time in very restrictive settings and learning so much about that. And definitely going back to the very basic but critical value is that our organizing should happen past artificial borders and not to organize within this little box that the state often makes us use. And it's so important to be able to retain and advocate for the full spectrum of reproductive health care options and for the full spectrum of people who are getting abortions and being able to understand and accept the complexity of the different stories that we hear, whether it be people who are ecstatic after having an abortion, whether it be people who are sad after having an abortion. And all of those experiences are completely valid and okay. But I really challenge folks to ask themselves if the current framework of the work that they're doing is actually building infrastructure to where it resides within our communities and can't be toppled by a Supreme Court decision. Amen. I, that's such an incredibly powerful question to ask within the halls of Harvard Law School. I really appreciate that. Um, so I think we are coming up on time to get questions from the audience. Uh, Who's got a question? Here we go. Hi, thanks for speaking today. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering specifically, Lori and Nancy, if y'all could speak to some practical strategies you have to talking to community groups about SMA or anything. One of the big questions for me is how do we communicate these policy outcomes specifically in Texas to sort of generate more interest in activating people politically? Um, but also just information around harm reduction. Um, how do you, what have, what have you seen to be really successful for maybe groups that are less online? <laughs> I, I would say that a lot of the work we do in Mississippi is not online, right. it's offline. It's it's one-on-one, -on -one. it's making sure somebody has somebody with some ginger ale and a gray sock when they're self-managing their abortion, it is, um, all of the things that people that go on scene that I can't even talk about right now, but it's not just, I think a lot of folks have seen, let me back up, I think a lot of folks have seen these big national campaigns coming out around self-managed abortion and they think that that's how everybody's getting a self-managed abortion or that's how everyone's accessing pills, but there are these community networks that have been in community since before Roe failed, okay? We're already here doing the work. Those, those things have not changed, right? But the way you do that is just talking. It's literally each one teach one. I teach you, you teach another person. I know that sounds real simple and real trite sometimes in a way, but it's, it's true. You have to really just, maybe you will never help 200 people get a, get a self-managed abortion, but maybe you'll help your five friends in the next five years. I think back to the work at National Loving Institute for Reproductive Justice and how it's sort of a model that I really admire when the work began decades ago in the Rio Grande Valley 
and the organization and the organizers that weren't a lot at, at that time for the organization um, were going around different neighborhoods in an ice cream truck talking about sexual ed, talking about like we're gonna have like a you know a party at this park, everyone come get food and music, and I think. Um, it sounds like very, very difficult work, but it's very, it's work that produces a lot of results for a lot of different communities. And, you know, hey, at the end of the day, one metric of success for one community might look very different from another. And I think it's up to the folks who are working in these communities to be able to talk about what works best. But, you know, definitely in areas like that, it was meeting people where they are. And sometimes when I, whenever I tell people that, I, their eyes like sort of like gloss over. Um, <laughs> it's really hard work, it, it is. And especially as someone who is anti-social like I am, it's very difficult to go out there and talk to people about their options and their autonomy. But like I said, we go back to these very basic values. Do you care about the person that you love? Do you want to see them in harm's way? Do you want them to be able to access the care that they need? Do you trust them to make the decisions that they need? And this is sort of how we build into those conversations. And this work has been going on for years and years and years. So I think it's going back to very intimate conversations. And I also think it's, you know, like there's a lot of conversation around like ordering pills online and, you know, it can be very daunting for folks. And I think it's definitely going back to these like intimate personal conversations around self-managed abortion education. That's the way to go. Thank you. Um, thanks for this conversation. I think it's excellent and so needed. I have two questions. One is for Amy. Um, what is the likelihood of getting the 17 page uh, ordinance annotated by our side? Because I, this, one of the things that I think is happening is that on these local levels, people are organizing to put these things down, but they're just gonna keep reappearing in city after city after city, and we keep reinventing the wheel every single time in every context. So this leads me to my other question for everybody, which is what do we mean when we say infrastructure? What does that actually mean practically on the ground? I am so tired and so frustrated with the conversations that are being had ever since 30 years ago. Like, I've been in repro rooms for so long, and every single time we talked about, we knew Rome was going to go down. Hyde and all these other things are going, black women had to go out on our own and start our own shit because people were not listening, could not hear. And here we are again at a point where it is, there are no soft places to land for many people all around this country. So I wanna know what we mean when we say infrastructure and what people's thoughts are about what's been, and it's got to be removed from this conversation about the Supreme Court. It has to be, because I don't see any local grassroots organizers organizing around the Supreme Court, this was on purpose because it's always been stuck at the level of professionals and lawyers who only understood what the court was doing. There is no national movement that could push back on Supreme Court. And when you ask the lawyers what we ought to do about the court, they don't know. <laughs> Their response is expand the court. How the fuck are you gonna do that with no popular movement behind you? And y'all are not organizers. So you don't know how to bring the people to push for that long structural change that you say needs to happen. Expand the damn court, get rid of that fucking thing, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Apparently we're not able to do that. It can't be abolished, it's not possible. So there's not even an imagination. Oppression has put a ceiling on people's imagination. There is no way to think outside the box. We are stuck at the same old bullshit over and over again, and I do not want to be in this room again, 20 years from now, with the worst outcomes on the ground, and still no answers to basic questions. So my interest is in knowing, like, what is the infrastructure process that you all see that's needed where you are? And then, how the hell do we have the ALEC for the progressive left? That really provides us with guidelines, like, pull that shit out of the thing and says, don't go back to having to do all this work on the ground. This is already done. Here it is. 
fight on this level so that people who are not already plugged into the law, which is not real, right? Power is, but the law is not. And so we're all sitting here doing, like, we're, it's just so frustrating. It's so dispiriting. It is what I think leads to resignation and despair on the ground. It's why we can't have younger people right now. How, I talked to my niece the other day, and she's like, well, why didn't you all figure this shit out? <laughs> What's going on here, right? And I'm like, people did try to figure it out, but some, group, some voices got heard. Some voices had power and they could make agendas. And other people were not listened to. Were not listened to when we said Roe was never going to be enough. We should have been fighting for that 30 years ago, not now. So yeah, it's, it's incredibly just, I can't be here again. That's how I feel. Why is the, we're so limited. We're so constricted. There's no ability to imagine something different. Why is that? Everybody in this room has to be able to come up with something better than this shit, <laughs> right? Why are we stuck here? There's something really, that I feel like there's something wrong. And somebody has to like acknowledge that. And I do not want us to be on a fight, on a treadmill about Comstock being the main area that then everybody turns their attention to for another two years, right? but the infrastructure on the ground remains the exact same. And the people who are fighting on the Comstock part are still the elite. This is not gonna work, y'all. It's just not gonna work. Y'all have thoughts, please? <laughs> I know a lot of times when I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about funding the people who do the damn organizing. We can't organize shit if we're all hungry and tired and broke. And oh yeah, two hundred fifty k a year for, your whole for my whole organization. And ask me how much I get paid. Zero. Fifteen hundred dollars a month. That's why I live with my daughter, who gets paid a whole big seven hundred and fifty dollars a month. Okay, we're not we're not here balling out of control. Like, it was a big decision for us to, to even start paying ourselves because we felt like we're cheating the work, right? We can never make shifts if that's where our organizers are at. You know what I'm saying? Like, organizers are ready to unalive themselves over the stress and, and, and stuff. But we've got organizations out here with 35, 45 million dollars that don't fund not ban abortion, not ban back of pampers, not ban nothing, nothing in the community. So that's what I mean. When I say infrastructure, I mean we have to start building organizing infrastructure, which means funding organizers, it means training organizers, it means empowering organizers, it means holding space for those folks to empower themselves. I just that one clip. You meant, that was amazing. Um, you mentioned the Hyde Amendment, okay? And that's a crucial turning point. So in 1976, three years after abortion becomes legal nationwide. Congress takes away federal funding of abortion, takes away Medicaid funding of abortion in the majority of states. So from that moment, the most radical, badass, like determined people that I know in this movement are focused primarily on mutual aid. Because someone's gotta figure out how to raise that money how to fund that abortion, increasingly over time, how to get that person onto a bus or onto a plane, right? Like, and so I think a lot of times the work that is happening becomes, the work like what Lori and Nancy are doing is invisibilized by the fact that people just have their heads down doing the job. Um, and that's stuff that you're not gonna generally hear the press cover a lot, right? The National Network of Abortion Funds Right, collectively spent $37 million in the first year after the Dobbs decision on getting people abortions, paying for those abortions, and relocating people to the clinics where they needed to be to get those abortions. Can I? Yeah, please. The, that's from funds, by the way. That's not, that's not NMA up giving us money to give away. Right. Yeah. Okay, I want to be clear. That's individual funds that raised a lot of that money and gave it away. 
to throw that out. Yeah, totally. Thank you, Lori, for that. That's individual funds like Lori's spending that amount that totals up to that much. I spoke to one community support network that served 28,000 people last year providing medication abortion on the down low, right? So I, I totally agree with the point that the infrastructure isn't where it should be. Um, and you asked specifically about the ordinance. I have no doubt that the Texas ACLU has an annotated copy of this ordinance, right? Like I should have made it more explicit. The fact that this got voted down was not by accident. It was because of organizing by activists on the ground against it, um, including the Texas ACLU, including rant groups like Nancy's that showed up in Edinburgh and packed the room and made people cry and basically pushed the city council from being like a certain like, yes, we're gonna pass this anti-abortion ordinance to like, oh geez, it looks like the people are against us, maybe we better reconsider. Um, but yeah, the defunding and the fact that the state defaulted on its obligation to people since day one when it comes to abortion rights and then the failure of white moderates within the movement to full-throatedly fight that ban and stand up for poor people of color whose rights were taken away you know, from day one. Like, that's the systemic issue that I think we need to look at. Other questions? Rio? Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question around like the co-opting the language that we talked about, like grooming and trafficking. I just wonder, like, coming from, like, Mississippi and Texas and, like, southern states where they're really focused on using those languages, um, are they s more worried about, like, trafficking and grooming in the sense of, like, I don't know, trans bills and things like that more than the actual, you know, human trafficking and child grooming? Because I just think of, like, young girls who now need two parent permissions to even get an abortion and, you know, how do they even get pregnant in the first place? Like, are they getting... Sorry, did it happen safely? Like, are they worried about that or just more so like, oh, you just have to go to term with your pregnancy? Sure. Uh, they're not worried about actual child trafficking at all. In fact, it is currently in, in I think it's in South Carolina or North Carolina, the GOP is, is, is pushing back against the anti-child marriage bill, right? And why? Why? Because they think if you're pregnant and you're a teenager, you should get married if that person wants to marry you. I'm going to tell y'all that someone got married at 16. No, you shouldn't. No, the hell you shouldn't. Why should we push kids into marriage? That doesn't make any sense. But there is no, just like, uh, wasn't it Jaws governor that said he was going to like end rape in yeah. Texas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, he said, they, everyone was like, well, what about women who get raped? And he was like, oh, we're going to end rape in Texas. <laughs> I don't think that's happening yet. Um, you know, in fact, my state isn't even worried about feeding children. Their big post row plan is to fund CPCs, pregnancy centers, which do the least amount of good for anyone and are just recruitment stations for abortion, uh, abortion uh, adoption providers. So that's where we're at. No, they don't care. They don't care. I mean, I, I think just, just to add, like, yeah, like we, we see a lot of co-opting on, you know, we've talked about like immigration language and sanctuary and, and how that, you know, plays out. And the organizing around sanctuary for the immigration movement has been a lot of organizing around churches to house people with active deportation orders because churches are considered safe locations under immigration. It's a memo, it's not codified language, uh, but a lot of campaigns have arisen with that like terminology around sanctuary. Does the state of Texas actually care about immigrants? I don't know, what, what do y'all think? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and but they, you know, use sanctuary for a lot of the anti-abortion bills that we're seeing and a lot, a lot of language, but it's it's a constant song and dance of co-opting language, especially in restrictive states. I think something that's particularly dispiriting about that is the, the, the right wing's 
like unbridled enthusiasm for co-opting this sort of language, right? They'll use any word at any time and make it mean whatever the fuck they want it to mean, right? Whereas I feel like often on the left, even in farther left spaces, we are so afraid uh, of like of like coloring within the lines, right? Of, of of playing by the rules, right? Where we're so afraid of even saying the word abortion, right? I mean, like using basic language can be so hard for us, and and going up against opponents who will just literally like any word. They're like that one works, sure. This one, right? It's really mad. Watch what happens. But how else will they feel clever? They can't tell jokes. <laughs> <laughs> how are we doing on time, guys? One more question. Here we go. In the back? Yeah. You have two back. You can take oh, you and Mimi. I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess, like, the question that I have is really just thinking, you know, something that um, I sometimes hear from folks is that there is a limitation in terms of the imagination of conservatives and, like, these extreme right-wing folks. And honestly, I find them to be the most creative folks ever in a lot of ways. And I think that that has kind of hindered the way that we actually approach some of this work. And so the question that I have is really like, you know, to the folks on the panel, like what is the most creative thing we can do in this moment? Um, because I feel as though it has been this, like this wish of people who want to play nice with a side that has no, no, there's no consideration for the life that's on this side, right? There's no, they don't care about what happens to us. They don't, they don't care at all. So it's just like, what is, for y'all, like what is the most creative, what is the most liberatory thing that you can imagine coming out of this space in, in addition to funding so that way the work can continue to be done and also grow? What, what else can be done? I mean, I take heart in the, like, I, I think when it comes to the Comstock Act and its modern day resurgence, right, there's one enforcement mechanism that we've seen playing out so far, not that other ones couldn't come to be, and that is the chilling effect, right? So the chilling effect itself is the enforcement mechanism. Um, the designers of the strategy on the right are banking on the carceral state and white moderates to do their work for them, right? They're banking on organizations like the National Abortion Federation that when SB8 passed said, well, we're not gonna fund any abortions that, that violate the letter of this law because we don't wanna get sued, you know, even though we're not based in Texas, okay? They're banking on the fact that low-income people of color who are already most in need of abortions and have trouble accessing it to begin with are afraid of the carceral state even though there's no law in the country that actually makes it an explicit crime to self-manage an abortion, right? Except for one that only applies after 24 weeks. Um, so, so they can bank on, on those forces to do the work for them. And so I take heart in folks like Reverend Eric Ferguson, who's a pastor based in Texas, who every week gets on a flight filled with Texans who need abortions, and she flies with them to New Mexico, and she tells them about her two abortions and then holds her breath and hopes she doesn't get arrested on the way home. Um, I take part in organizations that are just putting those five pills that you need to end a pregnancy that are listed on Nancy's shirt, people's hands, regardless of what happens. Um, I think these creative solutions are actually all around us um, if we know where to look. And you know, the, the chilling effect, again, these laws can't be enforced if people you know, um, band together and take care of each other in the way that they are. Maybe, maybe not completely related, but I, I often think about how we're hearing so much about accompaniment and community support networks and self-managed abortion care when we know that people have been terminating their pregnancies since the beginning of time. And you know, we can fight all day long about what is the appropriate word to call someone who's self-managing their abortion. But at the end of the day, people are not going to fuss about what the terminology is. They just do not want to be pregnant. Um, and I think about how these systems have long existed. Um, and so many people have had questions about community support networks and how that works and all of that. And I think back to like the people who, have, who haven't had the option of relying on formal healthcare institutions know exactly where to go for help. They know exactly who to ask for. They know 
exactly where these systems exist. And the conversations that I keep having with folks about what community support networks are, what accompaniment is, or like what do people do, are people who have never had to or very rarely have to go out of the formal healthcare system to get the help that they need. And I think something that I'm trying to say is these systems have long existed. They've long existed hand by hand. Self-managed abortion is not a new concept. It's not something that happened overnight. It's not something that started happening after the Dobbs decision, but of course, because of restrictions, you know, it was a necessary conversation to have. But we have had people who have been taking care of us when it comes to healthcare for a really long time in the United States. And when we're talking about the infrastructure and funding, I mean, we need to be very honest and acknowledge the limitations of the nonprofit system when it comes to the actual help that people need on the ground. Yeah, I think for me, like the most creative thing people can do is push back on abortion stigma every day and start doing these trainings themselves. Like, it does not take much for you to learn how to use Miffy and Miso and so that you can tell someone else how they can use it and make them feel comfortable in their time of need versus waiting for someone like me to come along and tell you how to do it, or waiting for Nancy's t-shirt to tell you how to do it. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> there, we are in control of that information, whether it's we're whispering it to each other or yelling it to each other, we are in control of that information. We're also taking back abortion stigma when, they, when we do that, right? We're in, and to me, that is one of the biggest things that's a hindrance, because that's how we end up with all these liberals voting for abortion bans, that's how we, you know, like a lot of the stuff that happens is just rooted in abortion stigma and in our own closed mouths. Amen. Yeah. All right. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, our last break of the day. Um, so please uh, take a last turn on the patio, come back at 4.15, we're gonna close out with two more amazing conversations and then we'll get y'all to the reception. Um, hi everybody, um, so if you got some sun and some water, we're ready to dive back in. This is um, our next session, Beyond Row, Beyond SCOTUS, Beyond Enforceability and the Letter of the Law, which I think will pick up I hope um, content-wise, if not also energetically, from the last session. Um, I'm Jules Gil Peterson, and I'm uh, thrilled, thrilled to be um, moderating this conversation, um, which is you know part of our, our larger conversation now, moving towards sort of what to do about um, living in both a Comstock revival slash continuity, uh, moving towards some kinds of you know organizing and political, um, not that we weren't already talking about that, but really sitting in the present. Um, and I think, you know, for this conversation, sort of setting ourselves up to both connect and really complicate maybe just the, at least the relationship between legal and movement strategies for responding to this revival and continuity of Comstockery uh, that our two, our two panelists bring a wealth of expertise around reproductive and trans and LGBT organizing. Um, and that, so that includes intentionally work that's both you know, academic and very much on the ground, thinking about um, like actually existing laws. <laughs> um, so Comstock Act, Comstock Acts, or Little Comstocks, anti-trans uh, laws at the state level, you know, places like Texas, but certainly not just Texas. So I'm really excited for us to get into this discussion. Just want to introduce our panelists first. So maybe I'll, I'll sort of, you know, um, uh, give you both questions and, 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 and chat with you for about 30 minutes, and then we'll, we'll open things up um, to everyone. So um, yes, we'll be, we'll be hearing today from, um, first right beside me, Audrey Perez, who is an organizer disruptor and educator with over eight years of civic engagement, reproductive justice, LGBTQIA plus community organizing, and policy justice experience in Texas. They're currently the Generation Rising Manager for Seed the Vote, where they focus on building youth power in swing states across the country 
for the 2024 election, our favorite election. Um, prior to joining See the Vote, Audrey was the organizing director at Texas Freedom Network and LGBTQIA plus work at the ACLU of Texas where they advocated for the civil rights and dignity of transgender people, trans kids, and all those who love and support them. As a queer, transgender, non-binary, and first-generation immigrant, Audrey's intersectional experience fuels their passion for strategy building across multiple issue areas. So for example, in 2013, Audrey co-founded West Fund, first abortion fund in West Texas, and after finding a passion for redistribution wealth in 2018, they also co-founded the Frontieris Fianza Fund, a grassroots organization that raises money to free detain asylum speakers. And sitting beside Audrey is Rachel Kogushe, who is the Dean and Peter J. Leacoris Professor of Law at the Temple University Beasley School of Law. She is a faculty fellow at Temple Center for Public Health Law Research and a member of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Dean Roboucher is a leading scholar in family law, public health, and reproductive health law. She is the author or editor of seven books, the author of dozens of articles in law reviews and peer edited journals, and a frequent contributor to national publications and media outlets in her area of expertise. So I had to give different, I had to give lots of emphases because both of you are so, um, you know, have done so much already and bring so much. Um, so thank you both for for joining um, each other on stage, and thanks for, for letting me hang out in this little conversation. Um, I thought maybe to start off, I wanted to just pose a question that you know, both of you um, can speak to, however you want to come to it. Because I guess, I, I feel like actually the preceding session gave us a lot to chew on here, so you know, feel free to, to make reference to that as well. Um, but I just think one of the bigger questions that, that we're chewing on today is about strategies of like confrontation um, for laws that are antagonizing so many people in this moment. Um, you know whether that's a very old law like the Comstock Act, whose functional status at least is portrayed as uncertain, or you know very new <laughs> anti-abortion, anti-trans laws whose impacts are still being registered and kind of measured or sort of you know we're, we're sort of taking stock of them in real time. Um, and so in that sense, the political struggle here is in no way hypothetical, um, but, but, I, but I think that there's this sort of sense, at least often portrayed in the media, um, that we don't know how bad um, things could get because of the uncertainty over the status or enforcement of the law. And then there's obviously quite a bit of disagreement amongst, you know, well-funded elite institutions and organizations like legal advocacy, not, you know, well-funded law uh, nonprofits, um, you know, versus people doing work on the ground and activists about what avenues, you know, should be pursued or even who should pursue them um, in light of this sort of fundamental uncertainty, right? So should we rely on litigation of the courts? Should we aim to mobilize state legislatures or maybe, you know, even city councils in some cases? Should we build a mass movement that would make completely unavoidable demands on political and legal institutions? Um, and so, you know, I guess I think that I've seen a lot of narration, specifically around reproductive justice and trans justice, that there is kind of like a competition between those two visions, um, as if they're just like two incidental camps as opposed to maybe groups of people with like incredibly disparate, uneven access to resources and recognition in the public sphere, and even degrees of, of legality. So all of that being said, um, I just wanted to sort of open this conversation by asking you like, how, how do you come to this question, right? Um, you know, about the relationship between, yeah, like, you know, legal advocacy and on the ground organizing. Uh, what are the, I guess maybe one way to put that is like, what would you want to draw our attention to about the relationship between those two things? What feels important to you there? Um, yeah. I worked at the ACLU of Texas for four years, and I have so many thoughts about the relationship between community organizers and lawyers. Uh, but specifically at the ACLU of Texas, I think we built a really good model of what we called integrated advocacy, where the lawyers genuinely worked and listened to and took the lead from the community organizers who were on the ground and who were part of the communities that they were organizing in. For example, I'm from El Paso, 
uh, Tejas, which is on the border opposite of McAllen, very far away. There's no straight road along the Texas border that can take you from El Paso to McAllen. You actually have to drive to San Antonio and then go to El Paso to get from either point of the border. And I share that just to paint a picture with everybody because uh, no one really outside of Texas understands that. Um, but we had organizers in every city in the state of Texas who were part of their communities, who were deeply embedded in their communities, who were doing cultural organizing work that met people, as Nancy said, where they were at. Um, for example, I and I started by doing immigrant rights organizing in Impasso, not by doing reproductive rights organizing or, or LGBTQ organizing when I worked at the ACLU of Texas. It was really about informing people about their rights if I were to ever show up at their doors because that is the issue that they cared about. That is the issue that they connected to the most and I used that as an entry point, as something that I can do for people in my community to then later be like, hey, actually, I'm, I'm also an immigrant, I am part of your communities, and I'm trans, and I've had an abortion, and these are things that are important um, to the organization that I was working with, but to myself personally, and here's an access to some resources that if somebody in your life needs those things at, at any point in the future, they can also access their relationship with me or their relationship with the people that I was organizing with in my, in my program. Um, and those relationships that I started forming in the year 2018 were the relationships that later came in handy when Roe was overturned. Those are the relationships and the networks that we depended on when we needed to disseminate information around SMA or, or other resources and it, I don't want to say too much because this is being live stream and I have a tendency of putting my foot in my mouth. Um, but when Nancy was talking, these are the things that I, that I remembered and wanted to share with this group as like what it means in some ways to, to build that organizing infrastructure, to have a partnership with a legal team that takes guidance from the anecdotes and the stories that we hear from people on the ground and makes it easier for you to do that organizing work on the ground instead of constantly shutting down what imaginative possibilities come from people on the ground or from the organizers on your team. Um, and so, so often the work doesn't look like that and hasn't looked like that and has led to organizers leaving this work because it becomes so difficult to work within these structures. I, I want to let you talk if you want to <laughs> add something to this. Uh, um, well, thank you. Thank you for including me. Can you hear me okay? Just a little louder? Okay. Um, I guess I, you know, I think that one theme of our conversation today is that the people in this room understand that the either or of litigation as the end all be all, the courts are going to save us, is, a, is nothing that. It, from what I've heard today, any of us are voicing an opinion of, of that kind of very, um, the, the strategy that relies on a, a, the negative conception of rights, on a narrow conception of rights, and as court says, going to be the forums that vindicate and give meaning to those rights. And instead, I think this conversation has really brought to the fore the interest, you know, the ways in which movements and the, the interconnections and collaborations among movements have to be what we're talking about in this, in the, in, and we, what we have been talking about um, as the past and moving forward. And I, and I don't think that's divorced from law. I think it's different to see, um, you know, the, to borrow a Professor Bridges phrase, a poverty <laughs> of privacy. Uh, that's the name of her book, one of her books, one of her books. Um, and, um, and to see that courts are, uh, have blunt instruments at best in the pursuit of liberation and redistribution of resources. But that, I think, is different than saying law has no role to play in what those movements do or where they choose to focus some of their energies. And so I think about shield laws um, that 17 states have passed in the last couple of years. Now these are imperfect statutes. They have they've earned the nickname shield laws, but they are in no way a shield against liability, civil or criminal, for providers in the 17 states that have passed them um, from 
in-state uh, action against those providers, but they are meant to protect providers who are providing abortion that's legal in their state to people who are traveling to those states. And in 17 of those 17 states, sorry, in seven of those seven states, Maine being the most recent, um, they protect, they seek to protect providers who are mailing medication abortion across the country, no matter where you live. Um, and that's on the back of language in these statutes, regardless of patient location. These 11 of them, seven included that I just mentioned, also protect gender affirming care. And there has been, I bring up shield laws not to extol their virtues, but to suggest that these are laws that have a lot of language around extradition and depositions and um, the, the, the role of uh, definitions of what is protected reproductive health care and gender affirming care. But they have been enacted, and Maine's a great example, on the back of hard work from GLAD and CRR and other organizations that have, you know, have, have witnessed um, young people standing before Maine legislators talking about the gender affirming care that they need and the way in which this law has saved their lives, has been important to their communities. It's, so I, I guess I, I think of that example as the top of, you know, and, and I um, a shout out to my co-author, David Cohen, who's uh, in the audience. Um, I think of that example to suggest that um, there are movements, move, mass movements and social movements uh, mobilization um, is, it does not have to be devoid of law to be skeptical of law's reach and of its uh, emancipatory potential. Yeah, I kind of want to follow up on, on shield laws because um, I think they're an interesting development <laughs> is one way, to, one way to put it, right? Like, and exactly, they also are, um, they're a useful example because they are an example where a relationship, well, where an, a, a, another form of relationship between abortion and medical transition is being established, um, both legally and, and at least like politically, rhetorically. Um, and so I guess I'll try to frame the question this way to both of you. If it's a bad question, just let me know. Um, but I was kind of thinking like, like for you, Audrey, like if there was, um, there, I don't think there is a state order in Texas that has a shield law, but but like, say there was, or say you were organizing in what state there was, you know, in any case, what's your sense, like, does a shield law, what does a shield law offer, and what does it not offer, I mean, what are, what are some of the, what's your kind of sense of, like, practical benefits, is it really kind of like a harm reduction thing, is it pretty limited, um, I just genuinely would love to, to get your sense on that, and then, and, and, and Rachel, I was sort of thinking that in turn, right? How would you like, how would you like people, organizations, like legal advocates, scholars, and even state legislators who are working on these kinds of shield laws? Where would you like to see a pressure applied on them to to think better um, and to think bigger? Um, you know, whether that is to start to think about what comes after a shield law, um, or like, I, I'm just thinking about, right, how there can be a relationship between these two different sites of struggle, um, not in the sense that they, they may not align, right? Like the answer for both of you can be, I don't think this, I don't think it'll work, I don't think these things actually are going together, that's totally fine, um, but, but I don't want to presume that either. So yeah, I'm kind of curious, like, for you, Audrey, do you think that these shield laws What's your sense of what they, they might offer, um, but also what they, they are not doing, or ways in which you, or yeah, just sort of get your sense on them, and, and then in turn, what, what, you know, what, are, what are some ways you'd like to see a lot more um, pressure applied, maybe than the imagination or scope of a shield law in the first place? Um, I think to talk about like, the larger theme of the law and organizing how we can use it, it buys us some time to maybe be a little bit riskier and or for some people to be a little bit more visible in the work that we are doing to build some infrastructure to be clear about what we want to build and what we want to do and how we can do it. Um, and I would want to use that time and that moment to be able to do that. And, and so much of what I think I wanted to share is that when fighting back when I worked at the ACLU and I, and I 
we were trying to stop anti-trans legislation that we knew in some ways was inevitable and was going to pass anyway. The purpose was to buy us some time um, to be able to build some infrastructure in that space um, to not be as afraid about that chilling effect that, that these laws create, um, to be able to at least, you know, so much of organizing is about being able to paint a, a different picture of a world that can be for people, to be able to, to be um, inspiring and to drive and motivate people to action for the world as it could be, not the world as it is, and that's like these little moments of hope, these little wins that we can get in a world where we have lived with so much loss since 2016 and with so much harm and with so much terror and with so much fear allows me to have an entry point when talking to people about what is possible. And, I, and so I welcome it in that way, even if it is limited, even if it is not everything. I, I forget what the quote is or who said it, or actually I think it, it might be uh, Maryam Kaba, who's in this room, but like I do not yet know like what that be I rely on this so much and I feel a little embarrassed now in this moment, but like I do not yet know what that world looks like and I relish in that because I want to co-create that world with other people. But if I can use something as an organizer or, uh, to bring people, more people in, I'm going to use it and I'm going to celebrate that because we need to celebrate those wins along the way. We need to have something. <laughs> I would say um, in agreement, but the, I suppose the flip side, of like what else in this moment when there's there's, a, there's some amount of enthusiasm for for shield laws and shield language is um, you know a, another theme of our conversation is that um, none of these no law or policy should be thought about in isolation of the other ways in which. It is part of impacts and is impacted by broader policies. And so take, and this is just a quick example that comes to mind. So Washington has a SHIELD law, and it's one of the SHIELD law that defines protective care regardless of patient location. Um, so in the way that I just described, um, uh, you know, you know in a, the, some providers there have interpreted that as pr uh, protection for them. Uh, sending medication abortion into various states that ban abortion or that do not. And at the same time, Washington has a telemedicine regulation that defines the location of care as where the patient is, not where the provider is, which is in direct contradiction to the language I just talked to you about. But in passing the shield law, no one is said like, and I know this is important. So Washington legislatures, revisit your telemedicine legislation. But you know, let's take it even broader. Um, we know that telemedicine and telehealth leaves a lot of people behind. A lot, a lot, a lot of people who don't have online, who don't have the internet, who don't have smartphones, who don't have connectivity. Um, so when we talk about broader policies, we're also talking about material and social support that makes the ability to gain access to what law provides and reality. And that, I think, is the zooming out of where does this fit into a larger conversation about what people actually need um, in order to gain the services, the care, um, that is part of a larger set of questions about their lives and livelihoods. I mean, I think it's, again, the zooming out to think about the social determinants of health, questions of redistribution, rather than focusing in on just this one law which I think is daunting, right? So I think that this pairs really nicely because we were talking about moments of hope as well as keeping the bigger picture in mind because, you know, there is just, um, there's a real risk in re-inscribing the kind of abortion exceptionalism that has characterized the last 50 years. And um, there's a real danger and um, in, in not challenging and not contesting that exceptionalism um, while celebrating wins as we can celebrate that. Yeah, and you know, again, just to, to underline point connection or residence, I mean, 
medical transition is sub it's subject to, like, with the exception of abortion, he has some of the most exceptionalism <laughs> that I could think of um, historically. And actually, present-day political crisis has inflated that, um, in part because most of the defenders of medical transition lean very hard on its exceptional status. Um, and, you know, I, I guess, you know, one, one thing I also wanted to just sort of reaffirm too, because it's been said before today, but I think part of what we're talking about here is how um, a professionalized class of people who conduct research, who are medical providers, who tend to be in the field of law, and, you know, um, with hierarchies also tend to work in social services, um, you know, don't, don't tend to share the class experience of, of, of populations. Um, you know, who, who are the least servers, completely not, not served at all by discursive rights, right, or even um, state protection uh, because of just like material access question, right? Um, so I think that that's sort of part of the urgency. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask, like, there's shields. I want to, I'm kind of just going to go through a list of things that I think the title kind of was calling our attention to, things that we've been talking about today already, but I'd love to hear you both get into. Like, okay, what about repeal? <laughs> what about repealing laws, right? Uh, you know, of course, the Comstock Act could be repealed. Um, one might wonder why it never was, and that the answer to that could be very illuminating, right? Certainly, state laws can be repealed, sure. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that's been on the table all day is that obviously repeal is like, not enough. A reversion to the status quo is not even necessarily a dramatic change at all. Um, and you know, as has already been said, that is nevertheless like the primary pitch of, of, of the Biden campaign on abortion to you know, pass a statutory codification of, of Roe um, and, and this sort of idea of reverting back to a, you know, to, to a pre-2022 moment, which I think we all agree is just sort of ridiculous on its face. Um, but so, setting, so knowing that it's ridiculous on its face, what about any political value to repeal, right? Like, Audrey, I think part of what you're saying um, really prompts this question for me uh, about like slogans or like political recruit, like recruitment points, right? That there are things worth fighting for, things that are just like useful politically. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm just sort of curious on both of your thoughts on repeal um, as like, not, not as in like, pick one thing that will work or not work, um, but, but just like, does it, is there any way in which you find like repeal, appeals to repeal um, helpful? Um, and, uh, and if not, I think it's totally worth just like saying why uh, and, and thinking about that. Um, and I guess Rachel, you know, I don't want to overemphasize the contrast between the work that both of you are doing, so feel free to ignore that direction on my part. But um, yeah, like I'm curious to get your sense too. You know, in the in the litigation in the litigation arena, you know, is repeal is repealing um, like where does that fit into conversations that legal advocates and scholars are having about strategy, right? Is that sort of something that tends to be separated out as like, oh, that's political, right? That's electoral, that's legislative. Um, it's not for us to work on, or are there already conversations under underway about repeal or about things that go way beyond repealing laws that are causing all of this litigation trouble in the first place? Can you answer first? Sure. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> We both have a moment where we look at each other. <laughs> I think it would be really valuable if you answered this question. <laughs> um, so it's a great, it's 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 so interesting, and, and I think that it's it's. But um, so I think repeal is a live issue, and I think there has been a lot of disagreement about how vocal to be about calling for the repeal of Comstock and which parts of Comstock and what would that look like and. I think litigation strategy, it's fair to say, has really informed that conversation, that talking about Comstock might um, inadvertently or explicitly um, support the argument that Comstock is a valid law, that it should be enforced in the way that it's being touted, as it should be enforced uh, by the Heritage Foundation, by others. Um, I think there are really strong and persuasive reasons to believe that the Comstock Act was never um, interpreted or enforced in its heyday in the way that the Heritage Foundation and others suggest that it should be. 
Um, I think there's really strong reasons based on precedent and other histories to suggest that this kind of, quote, textualist account of Comstock is really misguided and very uh, and incorrect as a matter of history. I don't think that's going to stop anybody, not one anti-abortion advocate, from making the case that Comstock should apply right now, this segment, as written, to everything as a national abortion. So whereas I am sympathetic to the arguments about how talking about Comstock and litigating Comstock or having it come up um, can have uh, an effect that might, might impede other arguments, I think that not talking about repeal is really also a choice and a dangerous um, I think that talking about Comstock as an illegitimate law that um, never meant what the people in 2024 say it means um, is not going to dampen the spirit of Mitchell or anyone else, uh, neither Katzmerich nor the Fifth Circuit, nor Alito, nor Thomas, nor any of the people who believe that that law should be enforced right now today. So I think that when we think about silence, we have to also see that as a choice and as a set of trade-offs that we have to be willing to live with. I, myself, am not willing to live with the trade-offs. The same thing I think is true about repeal, but said in a different way, reversal of Dobbs. I think we do ourselves no favor at talking about Dobbs as a stable case, as a case on, put on solid foundation, and as a case that it ultimately will be um, from the law. Now that is, maybe that's a little optimistic, but I think that in the way we talk about it, we can't cabin ourselves to an imagination of the world ahead that plays into the world that others have imagined for us. And so, um, so I'm for it. <laughs> I was going to add to your statements, uh, you were listing out Supreme Court justices and, and Chad wife Amy, to use Renee's term. Um, you know, with a court like that, I, I don't know how we can, and with them so blatantly stating their intentions when they see themselves as Batman and, and Robin and this crusade for, in the anti-abortion movement um, for their beliefs, like when they are so openly saying that they want to use this to further restrict our political imagination and our and our yeah our political imagination really is what they're restricting. Uh, we should listen to that and also turn our attention away from the the judicial branch and towards uh, a presidential and executive branch, a uh, presidential and a legislative branch that are still not doing enough. So like we could repeal this and then what? We're still left with nothing. I think uh, repeal movements worked really well when it was about repealing Hyde, which like I uh, and I. I really believed in that work, and I really, and that's how I got brought into this work, and I, like, that is a truly, like, radical objective, right? Because if you center the people who have the most barriers in, in accessing abortion care, um, and something that I learned from my movement elders is that when you center the person who has the most barriers, the most power differentials, the greatest inability to access something, anything, whether it's housing or uh, uh, gender affirming care or abortion care, you then in turn make it accessible to everybody else because you are focusing on that power differential and that is where your attention should be. And so that is what I, I try to center in my work and in the policies that I am working. And repealing Hyde was something that was truly radical because of something in this also that I say a lot is it's inaccessible to the poor, it's neither revolutionary nor radical. And so, so much of the work that we do in, in these movement spaces is inaccessible to the poor. Um, and so, what was I saying? I think revealing things still leaves us with nothing, and we need to be able to paint a picture for people, because we're going to lose this election because we can't paint a picture to people for what the alternative looks like. And people have been forced to confront what I was told from my movement elders when I was first getting into this work that both the Democratic and the Republican Party are the same. And for years, my like little young hopeful <laughs> soul like carried me through to be like, no, but there's some differences, but some people are protected, and yes, that matters, right? It matters that we do not wish more harm for people in the process of our failures to paint the differences between the two parties more clearly, to push for more. 
Um, but like, we really need to urge our elected officials to earn our votes, to earn what they are fighting for and, and their power. Because it is us that is willingly ceding that to them while getting nothing. So like, yes, repealing these things is great, but like, tell me what you're gonna do for me. Tell me what you're gonna do for our communities. Tell me how we're gonna fix this because you are the people with all of the power, and it's certainly not on my trans, brown, queer, immigrant ass to figure that out. Well, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the other part of the question, which was this recurring call to uh, codify Roe, which... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Correct. We get a loud groan from the person in the front. Uh, because I thought that was part of your, your question, is, and it's, I think, um, That 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 is you know that is not radical. It is not reimagining. It's not moving forward. It's 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 a it's even worse than a status quo <laughs> in that sense. It's 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 transforming the potential to reimagine what comes next, and in a way that completely embraces high, completely embraces. Um, litigation like we see in the life of Hippocratic Medicine, the litigation in which Comstock rears its head um, because there's truly nothing that Roe or Casey says to stop suing, stop the lines from suing the FDA to suspend approval on that person. Truly nothing. And so even, even legislation that's been proposed like WIPA is just Roe and Casey rehashed. Like, and then don't enact these things. But it's entirely backward looking and doesn't doesn't say anything about what we're acting, what we're seeing in, in a lot of ways that's that's uh, in the that's been in, in, in the wake in the last few years. So I just wanted to put a quick plug in for it, it, don't talk about <laughs> codifying for <laughs> them. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of, there, there are all these book goodies when it comes to phrases and slogans that I find myself been, uh, endlessly enchanted with, and like ruling class would be, would be one of them. Um, but I think one thing that, that you're both touching on that feels clarifying to me is the difference between silence and um, not talking about something in like an elite institutional context, where you know, like what, it's a bunch of lawyers, or it's a, uh, you know, uh, I've been wondering my whole life how to get lawyers and people who have access to these rooms to be able to use language that is accessible to the people who need it the most. I mean, like, yeah. because like, <laughs> what are we doing? Continuously building echo chambers for ourselves and for each other. Like, there are people who need this information. And there's a way to ensure that it gets to them. Like, you're. Your work should involve the dissemination of that information in a way that is accessible. And flip side, right? Like, like another wonderful phrase that we've been gifted, um, you know, is like the leak capture, the way that institutions uh, will deliberately incorporate um, a version of language or a version of representational inclusion to, to demobilize and depoliticize movements and to um, hem them in and to take the, the wind out of their sails quite intentionally often. Um, although I think very effectively often because it, they don't even have to say that's what they're doing. So I kind of want to ask about that um, before we take questions from the audience about maybe not so much like invisibility, but like opacity, keeping things a little opaque on purpose, and the relationship between that um, on the ground and like the PR or you know propaganda work of politics. Um, I mean propaganda in a good sense. Um, because I, here's the way I'm thinking about it, right? Um, I keep noticing how news organizations whose track record on reporting on trans issues would be questionable at best have now discovered that there's this term called DIY, um, do it yourself. And yeah, they're like, these are literally memes at this point on, you know, in, in trans circles that's like, oh, here's that email from that journalist at that British outlet who's like, have you suffered terrible experiences having to go to DIY? Would you tell me about them so I can write about it? You know, like, obviously people are like, no, I've never heard of that. I can't talk to you about something I've never heard of. Um, <laughs> which, yes, 
opacity, keeping things inside, <laughs> inside the circles where, they, where they're working. But it does raise a serious political organizing question and a PR question. Um, and I think about this as a historian because I'll you know to talk with like students, for example, people from generations who don't have a lot of lived um, memory of when you couldn't get your hormones like <laughs> with the prescription, or like it would be inconceivable to imagine that a private insurer or a state Medicaid program or your your university health insurance would like cover that in the first place. But for you know that like, those are not the only people right who are being affected, but like those are people who otherwise you know, and their families, and their priests have like a lot of money relative to other trans people. They, sh they, they, they could be doing a lot in solidarity, right? But one of the things that they're often experiencing is a total sense of helplessness. Well, if I lose access to my private insurance coverage for hormone replacement therapy from my doctor, I have like, then what happens, right? As opposed, you know, as opposed to like, well, most people have never had this. Actually, like most trans people do it this way. You know, and, but you know, you don't want to blow the cover, and actually, like, right? It's like I don't really want the media to be like writing about that, um, because like the track record of that elite institution is so horrific, right? And so I guess that's just one example. But do do either of you have thoughts, just sort of about like, yeah, how to approach this this relationship here between you know wanting to keep doing really good, important, like urgent, immediate work. Um, and the question of scale, whether it will scale to a political imaginary that could activate um, you know, people who ought to be spending their money and time a lot more wisely in solidarity with poor people and people of color. Very leading question, I'm sorry. You, you just took me through like the whole journey of my life as a trans person <laughs> in the last 10 years, because when I first came out as trans, I remember trying to find a doctor in El Paso that would provide gender affirming care, and I emailed every endocrinologist because I'm nothing if not determined. And most of them uh, had not heard of transgender people or transgender healthcare. Many of them were unwilling to provide that care. Um, some of them were willing to hear me out, and I, I really appreciated that. And I'm the one that showed up with all of the research, which is such a common experience for transgender people to have to do the research for our own healthcare and to educate our doctors about how to provide that care. Um, that so many of us are, like could be qualified doctors at this point. We know so much about this healthcare. Um, I see head like head nodding and the audience, and that's the most affirming thing that could happen. Um, yeah. So my answer to that, and I, and it's something that I have done in my work as somebody that worked at one of these big organizations, right? Um, I was very public. I was very visible, and I was still very much part of community and part of people who were finding other creative alternative solutions to meet the challenges that we were faced with in that moment. Um, and so my answer to that is to build coalitions and community networks and channels of communication. Y'all need to talk to each other. We need to talk to each other. Um, and we need to get out of our phones and off of our computers to be able to do that because the increasing, uh, what is it, the increasing police state, surveillance state that we are facing um, is what endangers us the most. Um, or we can also find ways to educate ourselves and each other on what digital security means. And I, you know, it feels like that is what we have done. And we took it from offline relationships to learning about digital security, to finding ways to have these conversations in safe channels, and to communicate in ways that kept everybody safe within their own respective networks. And we each took a chunk of the work. And we each took a chunk of the work that we wanted to be working on to ensure that we were you know, well staffed and well prepared on all fronts. So my answer to that is uh, communication, coalitions, community, triple C. <laughs> love, love that. Um, I, I agree. I think that's, I mean, triple C is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, but I think that this, this tension between co-optation and community center um, Centering voices of, and experiences of the community that you're in, that's a really, it's a, I think it gets to the questions of representation and, and how do we balance both a publicity, um, you know, to, bring it, to ensure that our communities understand what's happening uh, what, and, and, and how laws, policies, other actions affect them. Um, 
without co-opting the experience under those laws and branding it in such a way that stereotypes, marginalizes, otherizes. And I think, you know, as part of figuring out uh, where you are in that, in, in, in that, in those set of questions, there's a real, I think that it's, it's worth doing the kind of, having the kind of conversation that you just described. Um, what is the lived effective law? What is the li lived experience of the people who are most affected? Uh, because I worry that just thinking in terms of protection also deprives voice and deprives um, uh, sharing of information that could reduce chill and create backlash that is fueled for political movements, for social change. And this is not a satisfying answer in any sense. It might not surprise you that I don't have an answer to the co-optation, <laughs> but I think it's something that as advocates and as thinkers and as people who care about these and other topics, um, there are a set of distributive questions that we need to keep asking ourselves. To, to be clear, I think that some extent of like a public facing PR communication strategy to be able to continue is like an important piece of the work, like on all fronts. Um, and we need to be very clear that the people who do that work are putting themselves in a position of danger. Um, and I would be remiss to not mention that as somebody who like was impacted by, by, the, by how public facing I was in the work that I did. Um, and that there is a way to be honest and real about what that risk is. There is a way to give people the autonomy to choose to be to do that. And there's a way to prepare and, and care for the people in those roles um, with digital security. Um, and as one option, I keep looking at Kate, and that's why I keep saying that. Um, in, I think we've all seen uh, an increase this year and in 2020 uh, moments that have served as reminders that the police really only exist to, to protect uh, the state and its capital interests. Um, and there are a lot of people that have been impacted by that violence and also those, those moments and those confrontations have created opportunities and openings um, for change and awareness. But like we need to understand and, and prepare for those like that kind of violence and understand that that is going to always be an ongoing threat in the work that we do. And there is a way to understand that threat and that risk and prepare a response to it and a network of support and care for the people who are most intimately affected for that as well, by that as well. And it is, I think, a necessary part of the work that is not talked about enough. I want to give some time for questions so from the audience. So uh, does anyone want to kick us off? Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much for this panel. Um, I have a question that's inspired by Mario Pablo's provocation. Um, and I wrote it out because if I didn't, I would be not efficient at my time. And so um, the question is, how do we avoid it? Her question was, how do we avoid having some variation of this conversation in 20 years. And so I fully believe that lawyers and law professors are going to dominate the conversation about the Top Stock Act and its enforceability unless something changes. Just like lawyers and law professors dominated the conversation about Roe. Um, and I think that lawyers and law professors are going to be focusing on crafting the slickest argument to the Supreme Court and other federal courts about Comstock and its enforceability, but I think we all know that slick arguments are not going to save us. Um, we are going to save us. So my instinct is that lawyers and law professors need to get out of the way, and part of that instinct is born of self-awareness, because when I'm writing my law review articles and I'm blue booking, I'm not thinking like this is a political program, right? I'm thinking about creative arguments within the law, and that is part of the reason why lawyers and law professors need to get out of the way because we are necessarily operating within the constraints of the law. We're trying to think within the law, you know, to produce different um, outcomes. 
So that, okay, so my instinct is like, we need to get out of the way. But then I think about Jonathan Mitchell. <laughs> and he's, he's a lawyer, right? And he's responsible for SBA in many ways. And he's, he will be one of the main actors um, responsible for the enforcement of Comstock if, if that happens. Um, so it makes it seem like lawyers and law professors are kind of key here. Um, and so then there's a the question, one, are we mythologizing Mitchell, <laughs> right? Are we mythologizing Christopher Rufo, you know, the main architect behind this Lauren CRT? Are we obscuring a movement that has made both Mitchell and Rufo possible? Um, and then the other thing that I think about is, someone said that these guys on the right are like incredibly creative, and they are, we have to give them that. They are creative, and they're proactive. Like they're incredibly proactive. And I think that law, lawyers and law professors often are reactive. Yeah. And so I, my question is, one, are we mythologizing these folks, right? Are we, are we even mythologizing Comstock? Um, and then the second sort of question for the brilliant panelists um, is about what, how, if lawyers and law professors are part of these conversations, how do we help them, how do we help the people on the ground be proactive? Um, I'm worried that a lot of the organizing um, is reactive. Like we're trying to survive here. We're trying to get people busy in my field. We're trying to, you know, get people access to travels for their abortions. We're sort of reactive. And so, how can we help those folks on the ground be proactive instead of simply just surviving? And that's I don't mean that dismissively, but just surviving. Thank you. That was such a big question. Everyone's looking at me. Um, <laughs> I we have a little bit of time, but I, you know, in working at the ACLU and with the lawyers that I worked with, it, my team was like the LGBTQ rights team, and it was me and and another lawyer, and we really worked like in lockstep for everything that we did, um, and it involved like as I said, and, and the repro team had the same thing where it was an organizer and a lawyer that worked in lock, lockstep. Um, with the work that we did, want to make to to filter questions from community organizers about what was permissible, what was allowable, what was maybe like um, a likely outcome or consequence for certain work without putting those direct organizers in harms or like in risk if, by having that conversation, like kind of serving as a bridge in those ways. Um, I don't. I do not think that lawyers and uh, legal professionals and people with a lot of understanding of the structures of power of this country need to move out of the way. I think they need to be able to share that information in a way that is accessible and tangible to community organizers on the ground at all levels, so that we can begin to understand like the parameters that we're working in, and then to also for lawyers and, and legal professionals to expand those parameters and listen to community members in the ways that and be responsive to the needs in ways that would expand our political reality and um, further you know, create positive change for our communities. That's a very short, succinct uh, summary. I would love to talk to you more after this. <laughs> I agree. I wouldn't say, I don't think that lawyers and law professors need to get out of the way. I think they need to reimagine their role. Yes. I think they need to rethink their engagement on, these, on an issue like Comstock or other issues because if you're sitting at, if you're a law professor sitting at your desk just writing a law review article, then maybe that's not the most radical form of engagement that you can offer um, at these moments of intense question, transition, and redefinition. But if you're asking yourself, you know, what is the information that would be useful? How might talking about something like Comstock stoke public outrage for people who did not give a shit before about anything related to Comstock or abortion or the like? How does my, like, what seemingly is an arcane knowledge of state ballot law and election law, how can I use that to advance interesting arguments? How can I use an, a, you know, weird, Thing that I know about preemption or federal land or anything else, you know, just pick some random examples. I mean, um, it, yeah. I don't know how anybody does national work. There's so much to hold in so many states yeah. to balance. It is like it is actually not feasible, in my opinion. Um, like people need to be able to focus in on, on certain areas with certain powers for it to just even be a tangible workload that then is like a well-staffed, well-infrastructured uh, movement. 
Um, but I know that when I worked statewide, so many of like these, Mark Lee Dixon and his uh, little uh, policies that we, he was trying to pass at city council, they're resolutions, because they weren't even like policies, y'all. They were literally just like symbolic resolutions that he was passing. But that work started by using like election and voter data that we have to be able to reach out to people in those communities that we know might be like at least slightly somewhat on our side and starting to have conversations with them, listening to what's important to them. And it's not always what's important to me or what I'm trying to accomplish for repro or LGBTQ rights but there could be a seed there in that conversation that allows me a way to build a, a bridge with that person, a relationship with that person, that allows me to have a presence in a community, uh, a genuine presence, right? I'm not talking about doing this transactionally because many, many people do, but like I really have a genuine interest. I loved Texas. I love Texas still, and I loved meeting people from every single corner of that state and listening to what was important to them, what they were facing, and trying to connect those problems to the statewide issues and the patterns that I was able to see when we zoomed out of that, and then connecting those people um, and their problems to a lawyer to see like what avenues for change were possible, and then turning that into uh, something that we brought back to folks, gave their approval, and like built buy, like buy-in, made edits as needed. Um, to, it should also be noted that um, some of the organizing work that, that folks were talking about in, in the previous panel, it was a product of the ACLU of Texas, and the ACLU gets a bad rap, but we had a statewide Texas abortion advocacy network organizing pro uh, project that was born in the pandemic from a conference that used to, an annual conference that used to exist where we would bring in lawyers and social workers and, and pre-med doctors, pre-lawyer law students, pre-social work students, uh, medical students, we would bring them all to this conference to learn about reproductive freedom in action um, and teach them the skills. And then the pandemic happened, so we had to go online. And when we went online, we were actually able to expand our reach. And because it was at the same time that Mark Lee Dixon was trying to pass these anti-abortion policies and resolutions across the, across the state, um, we were able to have people in those little tiny towns in the middle of nowhere, Texas, that were trained with our, with. Uh, knowledge of the Texas legislature, knowledge of state laws, knowledge of abortion procedure, knowledge of the history of, of abortion repression in the state of Texas, that were able to go there and testify from the ground. It was part of the work in McAllen and Brownsville that created such an overwhelming community response that the, the city council backtracked passing that resolution there. Um, and I think that's one of the ways that we start to build that. I'll just add, the question also, incredibly important, which is how do we how do we upend the deep hierarchies that create the incentives and disincentives for some work to be more valuable than other work, some ideas to be more forceful than other ideas? Why, you know, it would, we still live in a world that privileges law and privileges rights in a certain way, but more importantly, we still live in within professional hierarchies where arguing in front of the Supreme Court is the most important thing that you can do as a lawyer. Publishing in the Yale Law Journal is the most important thing that you can do. And so long as we don't question what incentives and disincentives exist for us to make choices about how we spend our professional time, you know, those are deep structural questions that are as important, I think, to the movement as other structural questions that should be informing our work. Um, then I was just going to say, but we won't be done with that good question, or will we be, be done with, um, with what both of you have been opining on, but we will be done with this session um, because of the schedule, and we're going to do a very graceful flow into the next session without a break, but so could you first please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you both um, so much. I have to stay on the stage, um, so I'm going to awkwardly not come with you off the stage. Jules, I can vamp while we all get set up. Okay, okay. It's helpful. Um, but yeah, so we're at our final, our final moment of the day, or almost final moment of the day, final panel of the day. Uh, which brings together two of our fantastic moderators, Jules and Andrea, to send, start just doing doing some of this reflection and continuing to build on these last set of conversations and thinking about what it does, what it means to imagine um, a constituency that 
opposes everything that, it, you know, opposes Anthony Comstock and makes up everything that he was afraid of. So I'll just turn it over to them. Welcome back to the stage. Am I on? <laughs> well, hi. Hi. <laughs> we have not rehearsed. Um, we have literally nothing planned. <laughs> Let's take a lot of audience questions. I'm down to do that. I, cool. I, I have like a few things I could say just to underline things I've been thinking about today. Do you want to? Yeah, it's rolling. Okay, okay. Wow, go for it. The, I just wanted to underline some things that I've heard. So these are things that have come from other people with some, some jewels embellishments. Um, you know, one would be taking, uh, one phrase I wanted to say out loud is, um, right, I said really class earlier. Oh, I wanted to say minority rule. Right, uh, so much of like the political stakes of this moment turn around forms of minority rule, particularly you know white minority rule. But that's not really something new, right? It seems to, it seems to me, as a historian of the United States, that, that you know the, the U.S. form of government was designed you know specifically for minority rule, and so there's sort of a longer view about the relationship between liberal democracy and, and authoritarianism or fascism that is sort of um, coming home to roost in a particular form right now, but it's hardly novel. Uh, and I think the Comstock, the long trajectory of Comstock gives us a way to think about that. So that was one thing. Um, another was, oh, about solidarity. Um, and I was just thinking about, right, like again, so many people have helped us think today about how there is no single constituency called women. There's no single constituency uh, uh, really, any, any, any one group it imagined in a sort of identitarian, let alone like ontological sense. Um, and I think that like one thing I wanted to say is that it, it seems really clear to me, at least from the work I've done in my career, that sex and gender and sexuality, like as the way they're they're lived out in the world, um, and as objects of state power, are are, are derivative or, or subordinate to projects of racism and racial governance. And if that's the case, then like gender access solutions to like gender forms of freedoms on their own, completely incapable of taking on the scale of the problem that confronts us today. Um, so that feels helpful. And the point of solidarity, right, is, is actually very different than than having a shared interest. Solidarity is, is very different. It's saying, I don't have the same interest as your interests are not inherently convergent. We don't share the exact same uh, experience, but I, you know, or you have made a decision, you know, to put, to put myself on the line for your interest because I judge that to be politically efficacious or politically important. And I just think that that's, that brings me to the last thing I wanted to underline, which is, which is about, uh, neoliberalism. Um, <laughs> All the hits. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not, though. Uh, I just, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. This is something that's very different than, you know, 1873, but it's also actually quite different than when Roe was decided, certainly. Um, it's, it's that one of the effects of neoliberalism over time would be the privatization of all social relationships. The privatization of, of the state and of the public as well. This has had a profound effect on people's relationship to the political as such. Right? I mean, and, and the COVID-19 pandemic would be an excellent example, right? Where something that is empirically, non-negotiably, involves every single person on the planet and involves something like viruses that don't give a shit about our ideas of privacy or individualism, sovereignty, legal rights, etc. that just you know cross every boundary, except for very, very good ones, um, up to 95%, right? We have, we have, the state has mobilized with overwhelming force to impose the sense that this is an individual private experience, and now it is, private relationships, primarily the family, private insurance, right? Private relationship to employers that mediate mass illness, mass disablement, mass death. That has been rationalized, that has been, that's by policy design, right? And that's under both Trump and Biden. Um, and, you know, it, it seems to me though that obviously that started many decades ago, but I've really been trying to think about what it is 
well, what are some of the things that make solidarity so incredibly difficult? Like, what ideological resistance that has formed people, you know, inside out and outside in, you know, from regardless of age or generation, right? And, and even to some extent across class, which is fascinating. Um, and it's that you, the world has been shrunk down to a private scale, which is a profoundly intolerable existence. I don't think anyone, frankly, really likes it. Some people do very well by it, but I don't think anyone enjoys having a private little body whose rights are only guaranteeable if you can pay for them if you live in the right place, if you have a certain degree of education, if you're not currently being harassed of police, etc., etc., as we've talked about today. And it just seems to me that, like, Part of what is new, if anything is new, right? So we spent a long time today talking about how this shit has been happening, not even in slow motion, for a long ass time, and just some people have finally, you know, come around to pay attention to it because a certain group of people who thought they were at the top of the social hierarchy are being affected by it. Well, it seems to be part of the thing that is new is learning how to do politics um, in this neoliberal age where anti-social kind of you know, cultural norm is also met, I think the right is very sophisticated and smart about this, right? The, the bounty hunter model of law, <laughs> private civil enforcement is like the ultimate concretization of this. It's like signaling, right? There's this open display, there's this like sort of pleasure and power being displayed by the right, the authoritarian entrenchment of anti-sociality as the way we live today. And I just think the left, I mean, the, the far left has plenty to say, but I think it's that, that, that center, that moderate center and center left that is asleep at the wheel. Um, that, and I think that's really interesting. And, and I say that in part in relationship to abortion and reproductive justice, but actually especially around trans politics. Like, I'm a historian. I've been working very hard on a book this year. And I keep going back and I keep looking for, like, that radical trans politics that people are always invoking, like just like, you know, woo, like that real vision for freedom in the body. And I gotta tell you, that shit is not out there. And like, I, there's no political movement that ever actually fought for that on a wide scale. There's small, you know, insurgent political movements that often lasted two or three years before they were policed or uh, incarcerated out of, um, out, of, out of continuing existence. And what rose actually in reality is like middle class trans assimilationist politics that frankly barely even serve the people fighting tooth and nail for it, often by getting law degrees, um, you know, things like doing just total respectability politics that created this disaster private market system of gender affirming care that we have today that is just totally immiserating even before it's illegal that almost no one ever had access to. Most people who want to transition never get to, never have gotten to. That has always been the root crime that really no one was even paying much attention to until, you know, people with private insurance um, coverage or state Medicaid coverage start having that roll back. And I just think that for me, it's this like sobering lesson in actually like how much building a collective political movement, um, like that, how much of that can be novel. I think that might actually be a significant difference between abortion and medical transition. Like they, they just are different in that way. Um, and, but I do think this sort of question about how we break out of the privatized self-limitation of political imaginary, think about um, well, what Audrey was just saying about feeling, building up your capacity to take risks, you know, and not feeling so afraid. I think fear is probably one of the dominant political aspects of this era, but specifically for the middle class, um, who are sort of the most, um, in, in my opinion, often the people really standing in the way of anything getting done. So I just wanted to suggest some of that. Um, this has been on my mind a lot lately, and it feels really germane. Um, so th those are those are some of my thoughts. Well, we are extremely on, like, we are on this wavelength oh, here that. together. Like, I have stuff, like, I've been, like, noting on my little iPad all the little words we have in common here. But, of course, the big word we have in common is solidarity. I think um, the... The concept that all of us are capable of being and acting obscene under the right or wrong circumstances, right? That any body can be, any body, and anybody, can be cast as obscene when it is convenient, money-making, politically expedient, right, to the right people. And of course, as Renee brought up, in you know, sort of in the, the first discussion today, 
we know what the models for that look like. It is anti-blackness, it's anti-indigeneity, it's anti-transness, right? But true solidarity comes from realizing that any one of us has the, has the possibility of being cast as a scene, right? Um, this was a revelation I had when I was 18 years old. I, this is, I'm, <laughs> I'm the founder and president of the Young Republicans Club at Mansfield High School in Mansfield, Texas. Um, great, super conservative Christian, anti-abortion. I was in the, the anti-abortion punk rock movement. It was the whole thing, right? <laughs> I'm a long way. Um, but I go to college. I'm in New York City. I'm meeting all these people. And I'm, they're at sea. And they're at sea. And they're doing that. And they're doing that. And I'm going to show all of these people, right? And then I had sex for the first time. <laughs> and I realized, well, shit, I could be pregnant. I don't, I don't want to be that. So I would have to do something about that, right? Um, and it just, like that moment, like it just washed all over me that there was like a possibility that my body could be the bad body that I was talking about, right? That I could be on the receiving end of the finger weapon, right? Um, and I'm not like, it's, it's still like a long journey to understanding solidarity and really being in community with people, right? But, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, we think of like an anti comstock constituency. We've been talking about the white moderate. We've been talking about the, the middle of the road Democrats, right? To my mind, the anti comstock constituency, building that population, starts with this shared understanding that in different ways and under different levels, the, the threat applies to all of us, right? It's not theoretical, it's real and it can be visited upon any one of us, right? And, and the beauty of, tr of, of a real sort of solidarity moment is that there is no, like appeasement is not possible when solidarity is, is lived and shared among people. It is a non-fucking start, right? Like, it's, there's no more negotiating with their bodily autonomy and their rights and, and their housing and their medical care, right? Because it's all of our housing and our bodies and our medical care, right? So this is sort of like that's really like the thing that's getting me is you know how do we how do we build this sort of mass constituency that understands or maybe not even understands that's willing to believe that it's possible, right? That their body could be a scene, that they could be under threat, right? That it's not just our mothers, wives, sisters, daughters, right? That it's that it's truly like, you know, we're talking about ourselves, right? Um, and I think that's where we get into the wonderful question that Miriam Kava asked. What would any of it look like? Like, like fuck everything. What would it really look like, right? And I think that can be so hard because, I don't know, if y'all are like me, I fixate on process. I mean, I can think of the outcome that I would want, right? But I think of the process and I think of all of the barriers. I think that won't work because X, Y, Z. I think that lawmaker is going to be hard to talk to. I think that that lobby is not going to get on board with that. The lawyers are going to say no, right? So, you know, if we can simply like work backwards from the outcome we want, what is the, what it like, and it can be like a super simple, like, it doesn't have to be. We're all riding on rainbow unicorns in the sky and sprinkling magic dust on each other, right? It can simply be like everybody gets an abortion when they want. That's that's a pretty fucking simple concept, right? So where how can we work backwards from that in a whole bunch of different ways, right? Because what that looks like where I live in Texas is gonna be different even from what it looks like for somebody in Bakersfield, California, right? Or upstate New York, right? Or Milwaukee, right? You know, we can start from that concept. What would it look like if, how might we get there? And if we can work backwards rather than seeing the whole, the whole line of no's in front of us, right? I think that offers some really generative possibilities. Yeah. Hell yes. Um, <laughs> no, exactly right. It's like this. I, I feel like 
there's a, that's why I love that, right? The, the who is a constituency is actually, as opposed to minority rule, it's not just the majority, it technically could be everyone. Technically. That's, that's really, that's quite a proposition. And it's been, a, you know, there aren't usually everyone politics um, in this country except like the kind that make my skin crawl, someone right. who foolishly immigrated to this country. Um, the like, Americans are this thing that actually none of them are. And so, yeah, that, that feels incredibly helpful. Yeah, no more appeasement, no more compromise kind of stuff. You know, just these sorts of like tisk tisk kind of school teacher custodial custodial concepts, right? I just think, you know, one thing that I I know I, it's sort of maybe my role in in life and work to be hard on liberalism, so I'll just keep doing it. But it's like, you know. The desire to be governed, the desire to be led, the desire to be dominated is often associated with like the grounds for fascism. But let's be real, who teaches you that it's good to be governed? Like liberalism, liberal education from like a very young age, who teaches you that law is right, that the police are good and helpful, that regulations are there for a good reason, um, always, right? And that a just world, because it's what you're actually really learning our social hierarchies, and you're being told if this education benefits you, you're being told that your place in the hierarchy is actually pretty worth it, and it's not worth risking anything for the people um, whose exploitation directly benefits you. Notwithstanding the rhetoric or the discourse or the whatever like propaganda that you're told, that I just think like these are the the questions, right? There's a critical mass. There is a if we just added up people who who would want an access to abortion. Who would want to have an abortion at some point in their life? Well, done already in the majority. But if we wanted to add like trans people, black and brown and indigenous people, and pe uh, disabled people, boom! Now we're like in super majority status. Um, to use a weird word, but like, okay, great. Okay, great, right? And so like that, that that to me has just like been lodged in my my brain this whole time. And I think that like two things that what you just said made me think of was like when earlier when Laura was talking about stigma around abortion, stigma around transition, stigma around all of these, right? Like just actually that's also why collectivizing these questions is really powerful, right? Yeah. It's not like I always say in terms of trans stuff, like I do not believe everybody's a little bit trans, don't want to hear that. Um, but it's like, do you also need things <laughs> like that relate to your body that are withheld from you on purpose by a private healthcare market? Do you also go to the doctor and get treated like shit all the time and get um, denial? For your insurance, right? Or do you know someone who doesn't have insurance and who can't get healthcare? Do you know someone who's experienced medical neglect? Do you know someone who has been harmed by a psychiatrist or has been institutionalized? Do you know someone who hasn't gotten access to things that they need because they're in jail? Yeah, like most people, the answer is yes. Do you not like the fact that your employer has incredible leverage over you in terms of your bodily autonomy because it's tied to fucking health insurance? Right? Yes! <laughs> To want to be in solidarity with trans people. Otherwise, like I think part of the, the logic that we've been treated to that I think so many people today have just given us more reason to abandon is the idea that you, not so much that you can compromise in the system to protect your what you've got. It's not really that. I think what the what it really is, this is implicit, is you could sacrifice the undesirable group. Yeah, yes. The poor people, the queer the trans people, right? And if you sacrifice them, then you your your status quo will be maintained. Right. But you just provided us, that's not even true, right? That's not even true, that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the terrorism of compliance, right? Like, compliance is a lie. Compliance tells us that if we vote right, we go to the right school, we get our graduate degree, we do da 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 da, -da right? We're gonna be fucking set. Well, we're not. We're all miserable, right? It's like, we have a terrible time every day, right? Um, and so, like, there is no, the, the, Break, it's, it's like, how do you break out of that mindset that compliance has something to offer that is more tangible, beneficial, joyful, fulfilling than solidarity ever could, right? Um, we haven't really tried solidarity yet, right? We've tried compliance, we've tried respectability politics, you know, we've tried white supremacist politics, vote, like, you know, White women famously love to vote <laughs> Republican, right? We just like it's like their second favorite thing after like live, laugh, love, church, right? <laughs> so 
you know, but, but it doesn't work here. We are, right? We have the God's decision, Rogue is gone, we're screwed still, right? And even, even we are seeing, right? Joe Biden's favorite folks still can't be getting the abortions they need, right? So, you know, the, the, like truly coming to understand the benefits of solidarity almost in a selfish way, right? To, to understand that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an empathy, right? It's a holistic, I'm thinking of like this four network on Star Trek Discovery, I don't know if this is like y'all's deal, right? But like that network lives and survives because of the total health of the network, right? And I, I think there's so much potential in, I think also, I mean, I, we haven't spent a ton of time, I mean, we did talk about Anthony Comstock and his giant bag of dildos, which is very funny. Um, but the, the joyfulness and the fulfillment in embracing the fact that like, we sort of are like dirty, weird, creepy little bodies with weird ideas and fun ideas and stuff we want to do to other people and like that's cool like I don't, that's a neat thing like that's a benefit we have as humans to like share those sorts of experiences right and so you're know, thinking about like joy in obscenity and indecency right like joy in that sort of like consensual weirdness godliness gushiness abjectness of being a person it's such an interesting opportunity. And again, to go back to, you brought up what Laurie Bertrand Roberts said about stigma, right? It's not just abortion stigma, it's sex stigma, it's gender stigma, it's you know, people feel all kinds of ways about their race and their immigration status, right? And all of that is umbrella under this like demand for compliance to white, Christian, heterofascist patriarchy, right? And like, I think outside of the umbrella, it's a lot more fun and fulfilling, right? But it's really scary when you see, like, you just say, whoa, but it's raining out there, right? What if it's great to dance in the rain? Yeah. <laughs> it's not when you have to that's, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. No, it's it's a <laughs> no, I know. I mean, it's like, I do think one of the, the, the ways, the way it is that Comstock, the way that a lot around the Supreme Court, you know, gets packaged up these days is in reference to the 60s and is in reference to like Cold War liberalism, 60s Supreme Court decisions. Hey, things got real groovy in the 60s and we don't want to go back to the 50s. And, and you know, just one of the things I think I said at the very beginning of conversations around what became this conference was like, I'm not, I'm not so sure. I think that's a bit of a, a sleight of hand. I think actually the United States is a lot more Victorian. Mm -hmm. um, than people would like to think. And one of the reasons why is, is not just law, it's also like the, the era in which the modern administrative state was created and in which a post, you know, reconstruction um, kind of sentimental white supremacist politics in which like how you feel about your relationship to the nation became so, um, you know, became, it took on a form that has just endured, I think, uninterrupted. And, you know, but, but talking about like the filthy pleasures of being, <laughs> of, of recognizing that all of us are capable of obscenity, which I think is a beautiful meditation to hold on to, you know, I'll just say like one of the pleasures for me, even as a historian, going back to the 19th century, you know, in New York City, right? I, 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 I most recently was thinking about Comstock when researching trans women in the 19th century in New York, um, you know, sex workers, just figuring out how did they become women? How did they transition in this era? And the, the, the best answer was by becoming sex workers. It was both you know, a means to acquire the clothing, the social comportment, and the social relationships um, that adhered in womanhood, but it was also the only option because choosing to become a woman, still to this day, tends to bring about just a, you know, a huge drop in someone's standard of living and, and really often, frankly, ruins most people's lives in one way or another. And so, you know, that's why trans women do sex work, um, you know, historically speaking. But, you know, going back and just, reading like in the archive that existed about some of these, you know, especially actually I would say generations of, even even actually before the Civil War, generations of free black women in New York City, free black trans women, who were like some of the, you know, living in one of the first generations, um, you know, in a post-emancipation New York State, in the full contradiction of that situation, right, capitalist freedom, right, this 
in a country still built on the relationship between you know financial capital in New York City and enslaved labor in the South. Um, you know, just like witnessing what I would call like the courageous um, kind of communal like willingness to try experimenting with forms of freedom um, that certainly didn't supply like a solution I didn't solve all the problems of the era but that that happened like right a lot right before this Comstock motherfucker shows up to town right and starts like breaking into into houses of assignation and arresting those girls I was like damn you know like Tired of hearing people talk about the wonderful progress they've made in America and the world we're, the world we're living in today and how things will only get better. I'm like, there's some real freedom going on in the 19th century, right? Even before the Victorian era, but you know, even in the Victorian era, it's like there are lessons to be learned. And I just, you know, something I always come back to personally, but that I find feeds my political persistence and energy and my desire to collectivize what I want in my own life is just that open display of being willing to say, oh yes, I am actually having the most fun under the conditions of the world that exists right now here in 1873 in New York City. I'm not saying it's an ideal life, but I'm having the best fucking time and I get paid for it, right? And I'm trying to make something of that with my sisters, right? There's a lesson there. I would rather that a million times over than any of the sober, dispassionate pleas that you know would let me, if I have the right mental health diagnosis and a doctor is nice enough, give me my you know, fucking private body back, right? And so I just think like I just ripped it up what you're saying, but I just think there's so much to clean there, and that a lot of people have already been doing, right? Yeah. In some ways, part of yeah. the trick of today is like that the Harvard Law School is like the last place to hear about that, right? It's the last place to hear the good news, right? Um, and that's okay. The question is this question about solidarity. How you know? How do those of us who are making a career to some extent off of this stuff, right? Even as we have sincere political commitments, how are we, you know, understanding our practices of solidarity to like actually do something and also just, you know, again behold the the, the marvel, the beauty, the the fleshy power yeah. of obscenity, of sex, um, and of pleasure to direct us towards, uh, not just direct us to a better world, but I actually think maybe like to teach us to do something that's very hard, which is like learn to want more than what we have and learn to want things for other people that we don't even know. I mean, that is just yeah. like, yes. wow, right? If you can want something for a stranger you've never met, <laughs> instead of passing a law to make sure that no one somewhere who you've never met might accidentally get something that they wanted, right? That, that would really be a nice shift. Right. Well, that goes along with, I, I feel like the undercurrent here is also is, is about risk aversion, risk management, risk taking, right? Spaces of solidarity are places where great, great risk is possible because you have so many folks who are ready to take on the consequences when it is necessary. We're seeing that with the pro-Palestine encampments and, you know, colleges here, we're seeing it in Palestine, right? Um, you know, where folks can share that burden, these like really brilliant, beautiful, generative ideas come, right? And you know, then it doesn't matter when the lawyer says, well, actually, I would advise you, <laughs> right? Um, you know, advise me all, all you want. I'm still gonna do X, Y, Z, right? But then when you're in a true solidarity community, you know, I think there's also the option of like really understanding truly who is at Right, because we, we can't ignore the fact that yelling on the internet about aiding and abetting abortion puts the people in your DMs at risk, right, potentially, right? Like, you may be prepared to take that risk, you don't know if the people in your DMs are, right? So, but a, a community of solidarity allows people to come to understandings and agreements together to say, we will take this risk, we might not take this risk, maybe we'll do X, maybe we'll do Y. Like maybe we'll do the whole thing, right? But you know, I think that it just like has so many generative possibilities that move us beyond this compliance, respectability, sober, like I mean, so right, it's great, but <laughs> finger wagging, right? Um, that's just no fucking fun. Yeah, we deserve to have some some fun along the yeah. way. Um, and I just think, I just want to say, I think we maybe have a bit of time here, but, but what you just said, like, it's inexhaustible. Solidarity, it's something you return to over and over and over. It's something that's grounding, right? It's something that 
can be permanent and true even if what it means shifts over time. Yeah. It's, it can't be lost. Um, and that feels pretty precious in a day where otherwise we've been very thoughtful and careful and attentive to what we can and can't know and didn't want to over hedge any bets to, you know, being very, you know, mm -hmm. the way we are. Um, but like that, right? Yeah. Like there's the beating heart that's not going to go away and that just feels like something that I know I can walk out of this room with uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to you for putting it so, so eloquently and also like for making me feel that fire. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, see everybody. That was a hard. That is a hard act to follow. So I think we are going to uh, to not try and follow it too much. If you want to hand off your mic to Melissa. Um, all right. Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? Go for it. I just cheat off the sheet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, I mean, uh, do you have thoughts for you? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, do we also did not prepare this part. I was actually thinking of trying to do my thoughts in the form of the thanks. Okay. So, All you know, right. one of the people for who, which without their work, we would not be here, um, is Cynthia Conti Cook, who actually literally shook the resources from the institutional trees <laughs> that got us into this room, that got all of you into this room, and can vouch for the fact that we were having those conversations way before the idea for feeling Comstock was a political campaign, way before the idea that the Supreme Court would be talking about Comstock was happening. And the long arc of this conference, yes, it's 18 months, but it feels very long <laughs> right now. Um, she's been with us the whole time. So thank you, Cynthia. Okay, next, and you've met them all today, our advisory board, who have steered us from the very beginning. Now I'm gonna steal your sheets, so I don't wanna forget anybody's name. Uh, we have Danielle Blunt from Hacker Hustling. Without Hacking Hustling, this conference would not exist. And the ways that we learned to work together and the ways that we saw part of our mission to be to break into institutions that otherwise were hostile to us um, is at the heart of this as well. We also have to thank Renee Gracie Sherman. Doing incredible work and, and setting the fire very early this morning. Thank you for that too. Um, also, Molly. Of the honorary uh, ghost, Anthony Comstock, I don't know where he is. Um, we have Bill Crane, who you saw a lot of today. Amazing scholar, generous with your time and your networks, and we are so thankful. And then, last but not least, Jules Bill Peterson and Andrea Grimes. In, in whose brilliant shadow we stand right now, um, and I don't think I can possibly sum up what they said, but I took a lot of notes, and some of you will be hearing from me over drinks. Yeah, so um, I get the slightly more institutional things as befitting the role, um, so I will uh, take a moment to thank the Ford Foundation for funding for this, as well as the funders for the initiative for a representative First Amendment. I'll also thank, uh, with great gratitude, for the many uh, role changes and the fact that I think they are literally making sure the tablecloths don't blow away right now. Our catering, um, AV staff, and facilities folks. Yeah. Um, we worked in conjunction with uh, Sia, Chelsea, our many other BKC staff who took time away from their normal jobs to just show up and, like, you know, herd cats today. I'm not calling you. Yeah, I'm calling you all cats. Um, as well as uh, Diane Ren Bragg, who ran mics, uh, with, and Mason Kat Lee, who provided copy editing, Maggie Delano, who provided support. Um, I would be remiss if not thanking our graphic designer, Christopher Wong, of the who did uh, Melissa wandered, when we wandered into a meeting, we were like, them displacement of Comstock's grave. <laughs> this is what we got. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, all right, so I am, uh, uh, no, okay. So, and then of course, last, but absolutely not least, is Jazz Jack Power, who I'm not gonna make come up here, because I'm learning. Um, and I'm probably serious. Um, 
but truly none of this would have been possible without them. If they, you got, if you emailed the Comstock email and you got a response within 30 seconds, even though it was 10 p.m. and they should probably have been in bed, um, it's because they, I think, have moved, sometimes moved and felt like heaven and earth to make this happen, and I am so, so grateful. So thank you. So I was really struck by, I think, I think Andrea said, called it like the quiet private fear, sort of the way in which, you know, the, the risk of the chilling effect is that it makes sort of you worry on your own about the sort of what might happen. And in some ways, I kind of think about the, the arc of this conference is taking our quiet private fear, right? You know, the, the conversations Melissa and I had, the conversations I've had with folks in this room, the conversations folks in this room I know have had with folks outside, all of our quiet private fears about, uh, about this dude and his laws and the sort of things he's come to represent to me, which is all of the things you heard about today. And, you know, not having it be quiet or private, saying, you know, naming the Katia conference after it <laughs> and saying, like, let's talk about it. Like, let's have that conversation about how we build that solidarity that you heard uh, Jules and Andrea talk about. Like, let us no longer worry about this quietly in private. Let us like call in all of the people who are like, or at least as many as them we can get in a room and on a live stream, who are the ones who will need to figure out what happens because that's how you get rid of the power of the quiet private fear is you make it public. You find the people who are gonna help you figure it out. And I feel really, really honored to sort of have been, I think on this journey with Melissa, on this journey with so many of y'all in terms of figuring out kind of how do we go from that small individual worry to actually thinking more broadly about like what our next steps are? So I'll, I'll pause. Can I boldly slip, try to sum that up in a yeah. slogan that I actually literally wrote in my notes earlier? Fact check me on that if you want. Kill the comp stuff in your head. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need that. Um, I think being really real about how we internalize this stuff has been part of this and, and how we enact that in our spaces where we're supposed to be working together working in solidarity like it this is this has been a like delightfully inspired difficult day at times difficult in all the right ways like i would feel like we had not succeeded if there weren't moments where i was like oh i have no idea where we're about to go now. Uh, so thank you all for creating that kind of space thank you for keeping it safe so all of us can be here um with that all right so that Obey the wisdom of our, our previous panelists, we get to have the fun, which is there is a reception waiting for us outside. We're so excited to get to talk to y'all more. Uh, Thank you, please stick around. Yep. Yeah.